Welcome to Cobalt Fairy YouTube channel. If you like our channel, please subscribe and make sure to click on the bell icon so that you won't miss any future audiobooks we'll upload for free each week on YouTube. An Unusual Lady for the Tormented Duke by Emma Linfield Chapter 1 The marketplace at Gower was bustling with the usual rushed crowds. Buyers were vying for the fairest price on bread and cloth alike. One could see Abigails and servants scattering about ready to stoop over the wares while their lords and ladies strolled nearby and fingered the fine linens. It was nearly impossible to distinguish the hybrid with the baseborn. From a distance, dots of colour milled about the marketplace shopping, buying and selling, like a swarm of bees scouting for pollen. Voices rose above the clamour, the vendors claiming the lowest prices, the merchants tempting them with enticing and exotic lures, the patrons exchanging views with each other, the wailing of an infant, or the crying of an excited child. It never ceased to impress Edward how dreadful one would stoop merely to save a pence. A bunch of buzzards flocking in to pick apart the last piece of flesh from a carcass. He told Benedict. His blue-gray eyes wide with amusement, he continued, without regard to their own health. Look at them. Perhaps they have a sound idea. Benedict chuckled toward his dear friend. They continued through the muddy streets, slop sticking to their boots indifferently. Our accounts might benefit from such frugality. Edward cringed at this reminder that he and Benedict shared the same feeling of direness. After all, t'was the reason for journeying from the duchy to the overcrowded market at Bristol Bay. Today is for mild amusement and perhaps a spot of tea or scotch before returning to Blessington. Tomorrow is time enough to deal with the harshness of reality. I will accept the small holidays as I find them. They are so fleeting. Edward wondered if fate would ever permit him a true holiday, perhaps to the sun-kissed beaches of Italy or the exotic shores of the Orient. Not while my debts are staggering, Edward reasoned. For the time, the best I can hope for are the buskers at Gower Marketplace. There! Benedict announced while pointing a long, crooked finger into the distance. Spices. Edward nodded and followed his adviser into the crowd but he was not there for purchases, not truly. The market was merely an inexpensive escape for the day, one he had hoped would give him a fresh thought on how to cope with the looming issues within Briar Hill. The manor house had become in the past days as if the walls were closing in on him. In those moments, they were not Edward, Duke of Blessington, and his trusted adviser and dear friend, Benedict Carter. They were simply two of hundreds trekking through the muck caused by a fresh bout of rain seeking supplies. It will rain again. Benedict commented, his cornflower blue eyes moving toward the sky as they walked. I dare say, your grace, your chosen days to attend market always prove to be the most dismal. Tis England, Carter, Edward snickered. The odds of it failing to rain in the early throes of springtime are quite slim. Benedict did not respond as they approached a tired merchant and his wife whose eyes lit up with pleasure at the approach of the newcomers. The husband stepped forward with grandiose hand gestures sweeping across his products. The merchant had undoubtedly noted the fine clothing and good breeding of his potential customers. My lord. He groveled. Welcome to my humble stand. We have much to entice you this dreary morn, ways of uplifting your day. The mere smell of my spices will fill you with pleasures greater than you have ever known. Benedict opened his mouth to correct the merchant's mistake, but Edward shook his head quickly. He was not about to put on airs in such a place, not when the intention was to remain incognito if possible. Let us see. Edward suggested and stood beneath the makeshift awning, before the meager cart while the man began to discuss the virtues of his spices to those of all others. It is not just that they are directly from India, my lord. The man explained. They are the finest spices. Just one whiff will tell you. Go, sniff, I implore you. You are a man of noble birth. You undoubtedly recognize the best when it is laid before you, but beware, tis not for the light gutted. There is a bite that may leave you breathless. Edward suppressed a smile, 
doubtful that the poor merchant could possibly afford a vessel which would grant him safe passage across the dangerous waters to Asia to procure these spices. So, he did not dampen the man's claims with skepticism. Benedict, however, would not be so easily entertained and tapped a finger thoughtfully against his chin as he studied the merchant's face. He leaned forward to scoop a small sample of yellow powder against his smallest finger. I am not so certain, he declared. I dare say, the color is off. It is not. The peddler cried, his face contorting into a mask of denial. The merchant was offended, and Edward had to turn his head away to hide the smile touching his wide mouth. It was Benedict's intention, to rile up the man and make him work diligently for his purchase. It was a game for Benedict, teasing the man, having him perform like a circus dog until finally succumbing to his sales technique. Edward knew it, but the merchant had not a clue. To the impoverished man, he was losing a sale, and he did not enjoy the idea. My lord. The aging man insisted. These are the finest. So you say. Benedict interjected. What say you, your grace? Your grace. The peddler cried, humiliated by his gaffe. You must forgive my ignorance. I am a lowly merchant, your grace. I know not the nobility of these parts as I should. I. Hail from Swansea, you see and we are only passing through. Edward stared at him, cocking his head slightly to one side, a strand of fine, blonde hair falling across his cheek. The man seems about to fall into a mass of hysterical sobs at my feet. He disliked seeing the merchant upset. Benedict may have delighted in his silly game, but Edward preferred not to see the suffering his childish joshing caused. I say there is no need for apologies and I see nothing amiss with these spices. I dare say that Mr. Carter is merely jesting with you, are you not? The Duke turned his piercing eyes toward his friend who quickly recognized the dismay he had caused and nodded in concession. It is our way and gower. Benedict offered, retrieving coins from his purse to press into the merchant's hand. We do enjoy a taunt. You should not take it to heart. I shall take three spoons of curry. The older man eyed the money in his hand, delighted and cast Edward a grateful smile before turning to his wife. Elsa, five spoons for the duke and his adviser. He announced, and his wife hurried to oblige. Three spoons will suffice. Edward said firmly. He shall not want it to go to waste. Should he need more, he will know where to find you, mister? Vanger, your grace. Basil Vanger. Edward nodded and turned away but not without first casting Benedict a warning look. He did trust Benedict with all his being, but the man sometimes pushed the limits of his own authority. God bless you, your grace, kind sir. Basil called after them. They moved away from the booth, and out of sight of the vendor, Benedict discarded his new purchase in the gutter. You must realize that his wares are subpar. Benedict said as Edward watched the spices dissolve into the mud. You should not encourage these merchants to bubble us. Edward waved his hand dismissively. Basil Vanger is hardly a bamboozler. He is merely a man nearly out of bread. You should be kinder to these peddlers. He insisted as they turned to walk away. They have not a pence to spare. A busker juggled crab apples, his pointed hat jingling with every movement, and the men stopped among the small group gathered to watch. Small children tossed coins toward him as they clapped gleefully, and Edward could not help smiling at their awed faces. How nice it must be to be young and so easily impressed, he thought, his gaze trained more on the children. Were we ever so happy and without concern? If he had been, Edward could not recall such a time. For seven years, all he had known was the life of dukedom and the struggles which accompanied his peerage. He was the third Duke of Blessington, his father succumbing to years of a bitter illness when Edward was only four and twenty. He had known since his boyhood what responsibilities awaited him as his father's poor health hung in the balance. His mother had been a vapid, cold woman who eventually disappeared one day in a mystery, which still confounded the area. 
Some were convinced she had made off with a stable boy who also vanished near the same time while others swore the second Duke of Blessington had her murdered and disposed of. She had never been seen nor heard from again although there was gossip that she had been sighted in London over the years, begging for scraps in the gutters. The new Duke had not thought of his missing mother in a long while, the stresses of his own life taking precedence over the memory of her. Edward could vaguely recall Duchess Blessington's face, but he did remember her sharp tones and harsh hand. His governess had been more maternal than the lady of the house, and sometimes Edward was sure that God had bestowed a blessing upon Briar Hill the day Isabella had vanished. Why do I think of her now? Edward asked himself as he slowly permitted the image of her to waft away and his eyes to refocus on the growing group of contented children dancing in the filthy street. Slowly he became aware that Benedict was still speaking and Edward reluctantly turned his eyes to acknowledge him. This remains your greatest tissue, your grace. Benedict offered sadly. Your bountiful kindness will eventually lead to the downfall of Blessington. Edward felt tense at the words, but he did not respond as he considered what Benedict had said. He trusted his friend greatly, and while they did not always see in precisely the same way, he knew Benedict's loyalty to him was as true. Yet Edward refused to believe that it was simply his own business dealings which had led to Blessington's ailing finances. In fact, he knew for certain that it had much more to do with his late father's creative accounting and affection for the gold houses which had started the entire spiral downward. The second Duke of Blessington had terrible issues with the mere act of breathing but not with spending the duchy's money as he saw fit. And there was nothing fit about father's endeavours. There were other factors to consider, the heavy rainfall sweeping away the crops and the untimely deaths of the elders over the past years. It seemed unfair to blame the problem solely upon Edward's square shoulders, but what other option was there? He was the duke after all. It was his burden to bear, one which his father had left along with a mountain of debt. Have I bountiful kindness? Edward mused, a mirthless smirk on his mouth. Or is that merely your way of suggesting I am foolish and inept? I would never say such a thing. Benedict insisted, and Edward reasoned he was being utterly sensitive. I am merely pointing out that there are many ways we might save the duchy before it falls into ruins in its entirety. A shiver of displeasure slithered through Edward like a snake against his backbone. He could not think of a worse scenario than losing the duchy. It would only add insult to injury when his own future had been wrenched all but completely from his own hands before he'd had a say in the matter. His father had seen to that nicely. Edward's reputation was already smeared terribly in the towns. The women regarded him as a monster, the men were secretly amused, but outwardly displaying outrage and solidarity to their wives. It was no shock that Blessington had begun to fail in the aftermath of his engagement to Sarah Borthwick. Edward could not know for certain, but his suspicions were strong, that Abraham had much to do with the downfall of the duchy. The man had the backing of many powerful allies after all. It would not be difficult to lead a silent mutiny against Edward if Abraham so desired. Bollocks! Benedict cursed. We must leave, Edward. The urgency in his friend's voice alarmed him and the duke raised his head to look where Benedict had rested his eyes. Drops of rain began to fall from a rushed onset of nimbus clouds as if cued by the dread in his adviser's eyes. Bollocks! Edward echoed, his gaze locked on the baleful stare of Abraham Borthwick from clear across the muck field. The Duke idly wondered if his own thoughts of the man had somehow summoned him to be in that very place, casting him a look which would send Satan himself back under cover of hell. Come! Benedict said and spun around. We must not have a confrontation here. I would not dream of it. Edward agreed and followed Benedict in the opposite direction, although his instinct told him to remain and hold face despite public opinion. I have done nothing wrong and yet there is no reasoning with the masses. They will not be satisfied until my life is as ruined as they claim Sarah's has been. Your Grace? Edward glanced back toward Abraham who continued to glare furious daggers in his direction. It had been six months since the engagement between him and Sarah had ended, and no one seemed any closer to practicing the art of forgiveness nor forgetting the entire sordid scandal. 
please, your grace. Benedict pleaded sensing that his friend might react poorly. There was certainly precedence for such a worry. In earlier times, Edward had been determined to clear his muddied name, at least to those who mattered most, but those days had long passed. It became clear that there was no reasoning with a man like Abraham Borthwick who was out for blood and would settle for nothing less. Only fleetingly did he see Sarah's face flash before his eyes, her clear blue eyes filled with pain and shock. Edward exhaled and lowered his head, retreating toward Benedict like a fallen soldier who had lost his platoon in the battle. I am coming, Carter. He mumbled and mounted the stagecoach where Benedict waited anxiously. There was little Edward could do but permit the fudges to circulate for the rumours to fill his ears, no matter how they hurt him and the duchy. He had made a promise to someone important, and Edward intended to keep it no matter what the cost to him. He was beginning to wonder if that price would cost him everything. Chapter 2 The sound of the fiddle filled her ears like wine for the soul, and Honora laughed merrily as a man swung her to her feet and spun her around several times. Her light brown hair fanned out around her delicate shoulders, whipping around at the nearby dancers, and more giggles filled the air as the music quickened to encourage them along. The trance of the European heavens was magical. The stars somehow were different in the south of Spain than what Honora was accustomed to in the English countryside. She was thrust into another man's arms, his black eyes gleaming mysteriously in the moonlit night his beam as wide as hers, and a gold tooth against the green of her eyes. So we meet again. He chortled, his face alight with glee. Indeed we do. With his breath against her cheek, he cooed. You must have gypsy blood. I do not believe you when you say you do not. You may be right, Vano. She agreed as he swung her near. Perhaps I should speak to my father about this at once. Vano chortled and attempted to steal a kiss, but his partner had been anticipating such a move as the boy had tried such a move many times in the past. Honora dodged her head in time and released herself into a heaping pile of arms and legs near the blazing fire. Vano scowled at his miss and plopped beside her unceremoniously. Honora pulled down the sweeping skirt of her homespun dress and turned to face him with a twinkle in her jade eyes. You have stolen my heart he decried. How can you leave me without so much as a breath to remember you by? I must not leave much of an impression if you require a kiss. I thought I was comely enough for you to recall in your dreams. Honora teased, and he pouted, clearly trying to think of something witty with which to counteract. When he thought of nothing, he leaned in again to attempt another kiss, but before Honora could thwart him, someone else intervened. Off with you, Vano. Tilly ordered while gently kicking her brother with the toe of her open sandals. Haven't you enough of our own women to defile without making waves among our friends? We were merely speaking. Off with you. Do not make me tell you again. Tilly insisted, her own dark eyes were glittering with the threat. Honora was impressed by her power over the boy. Vano's black eyes showed shame, and he scrambled away leaving Tilly to shake her head ruefully. You must forgive my brother, she said and claimed the spot her sibling had previously held. He cannot help himself in the presence of a beautiful face. He is charming, Honora assured her. I dare say, it is refreshing to be among the free people. I see so little genuine happiness in England. I feel as if everyone puts on airs, but in their hearts, they do not feel true joy. You only say this because you haven't the misfortune of living with it day after day. Tilly sighed, staring about the camp disappointed, but Honora could hear the lilt of affection in her voice. She adores her brother, no matter how she speaks of him. I wish I knew what it was to love a sibling. A twinge of envy touched Honora's heart as she stared around the camp with a small smile of nostalgia. It is true what I said. I could happily live among the free people traveling from place to place and starting anew everywhere I went. This is nothing like living in London among the pretentious fops who reside there. Are you sad, my lady? I am not a lady. Honora reminded her. She tossed her honey-brown waves over her shoulder before finishing her thought. And I am quite happy, I assure you. 
You must be a lady. Tilly insisted. You are dressed finely, and your manners are impeccable. I know you must be from fine breeding. You know perfectly well that I am merely the daughter of a merchant, Tilly. Honora chuckled. My father is just over yonder, well into the wine, I see. Tilly lifted her head to follow Honora's eyes to where William Burney sat, ape drunk and singing off key to no one specific. Honora was not disclosing new information to the gypsy girl, no matter how innocently Tilly pretended to forget. Honora and her father had met Tilly and Vano's gypsy clan several times over the year as they travelled in search of fine wares for sale. Yet they seemed to dismiss the idea that Honora was not of noble blood. The gypsy would not be the first to make that mistake and for a good reason. Tilly was not mistaken, despite her limited sense of the highborn. Honora was smartly dressed and well-mannered. She had been educated, unlike so many of her peers, but such things were the benefit of having a wealthy father. She may not have been of noble blood, but she was as finely groomed as any of the countesses she had ever known. It is surprising that your father permits you to accompany him on these journeys. Tilly commented as she turned her eyes back toward Honora. I insist. The merchant's daughter replied truthfully. I would much rather travel the world than sit alone in the country house, hosting teas and discussing unstimulating topics. Such as? Tilly asked, leaning forward with interest. Honora was surprised by her unfettered desire to know. Oh! Honora laughed. Such as the latest fashions or an impending marriage. Tilly was silent as she sat back, her olive face illuminated against the flickering light of the fire. It sounds delightful. Tilly confessed. Honora was stunned. It is dreadful. She assured the gypsy. Watercress sandwiches are soggy and tasteless, much like the conversation. I can hardly stomach but a quarter hour of such nonsense. Tilly cocked her head to the side, a strand of black hair falling across her face as she smiled sweetly. I dare say, we always yearn for what we do not have. I would think if I were in your position, I would be seeking a well-to-do husband and shopping for prams. Honora started coughing, her fair cheeks turning pale. Are you all right, my lady? Honora held her hand up as she struggled to regain her composure. Yes. She managed to gasp. Forgive me. I, I am simply stunned to hear you say such a thing. I am heir to my father's business, an empire he has managed to build with his blood and sweat. I want nothing more than to live as you do, free from the confines of rules and peerage. You may believe you would like to marry well and live in a manor house, but I assure you, Tilly, you are living the life I can only dream of. But what of stability and security? Tilly insisted. You needn't pack up and move from place to place. You will have one man to care for you, a home in which to raise children. Do you wish to have children? Honora was at a loss for words. She had had such a conversation a myriad of times over the years. Since the untimely death of her mother when she was but one and ten, it seemed that everyone had an opinion about how darling Honora was to live her life. Her grandmother, her friends and even her beloved father agreed that she would marry well and find a man to run the business when William's time came to relinquish the flame. Yet she had never imagined that a Roma girl would attempt to convince her to give up her birthright and settle down for the mere sake of seeding a garden. I have offended you. Tilly got the message, her face contorting into contrition. Forgive me, my lady. Tilly, I'm not a lady. You may call me Nora as do all my friends she sighed. And you haven't offended me in the least. You have merely given me much to consider. Tilly seemed relieved but remained confused. You have not considered marriage before? You must be consumed with offers, Nora. You have everything a young man could desire. Honora chuckled. Yes, but I have yet to meet any man whom I can say the same about. She laughed. Perhaps one day, I will find such a man. But I assure you, he will not be a nobleman. Tilly smiled but there was a wistfulness in her eyes, a touch of melancholy. 
You are fortunate to have a choice. She said softly, and Honora sensed a note of regret in her voice. Many of us do not. Shame touched Honora's stomach and she lowered her head. It is true. I am blessed with a father who loves me and wishes me only happiness. I have no cause for complaints. How ungrateful I must sound to her. It is a small wonder that she thinks I am of noble breeding. How are we faring over this way? The women looked up as William ambled toward them, now grinning drunkenly. Swimmingly, Papa. Honora assured him. And you? Oh, my sweet child. He cooed, dropping to her side. I am in the most beautiful land in the world with my true love. How can life be any more wonderful? Honora and Tilly exchanged amused looks, but Honora was touched by her father's words. She had no doubt that he adored her beyond all reason and the sentiment was easily reciprocated. Tomorrow we set sail for home. He continued, beaming at her warmly. Where you will remain permanently. Honora's beam faltered and faded as she peered at her father. I do not understand Papa. Where will you go? Off to India, my child and then to the Orient. When it dawned how long a trip he had planned, Honora was aghast and cried out. Papa, you will be gone for months. Indeed. William conceded. Which is why you must remain in London and tend to my business in my absence. Papa. Nora, you must not argue. He told her, sensing her dismay. Your grandmother is growing weary in her rapidly advancing age. She should not be alone and... William trailed off, his eyes growing heavy, the soliloquy he had spoken drained him of all his remaining gall. Honora was certain he was about to fall into an intoxicated slumber before her eyes. And? Honora urged. She turned fully to face Dilly as if the girl could provide her more clarity in the matter which her father rambled. And she should see you married before she passes. He finished with great aplomb. Honora gaped at him until he tried to smother a laugh with her hand. The gypsy cast Honora an apologetic look, but Honora didn't blame her for laughing. Her father was clearly drunk. Papa, you are inebriated. She sighed. Come along. I will put you to rest. She guided him to his feet and his chunky, bejeweled body crashed into her slight figure, knocking them in a maze-like walk through the camp. They were greeted with raised glasses. A fiddler continued to play more quietly as the camp wound down for the night. Lovers embraced and children curled into their parents beneath the endless stars of the Spanish sky. You are a good girl, Nora. William mumbled when she managed to lead him into a tent. I am very proud of the woman you have. Thank you, Papa. That is why I meant what I said. You should consider taking on a husband. These days of travelling among pirates and gypsies and I. Papa, we will discuss this in the morning when your head is clearer. William sat up quickly, his eyes boring into hers with an intensity she had not often seen. This is not something I have pulled from the sky, Nora. It pains me that you have grown up without the influence of a woman. That is untrue, Papa. She protested. Grandmama is a delightful influence and has always nurtured me. Your grandmother is a good woman. He agreed and suddenly, Honora could not read any intoxication in his face as if he was surprisingly sober. But she is not your mother. No one was or ever will be like your mother. His eyes held a distant faraway look, and Honora waited as he allowed the thought of her mother envelop him. I stand corrected. William finally said, shaking his head. You are much more like your mother than I prefer to think. Honora's head began to spin at the nonsensical tone to the conversation. Papa, if that was meant to be flattering, it somehow lost its directive. Nora, your mamma was strong, independent, virtuous but she was far too liberal for this cruel world. Her ideas were frowned upon and she was mocked for attempting to do things which only men could do. Honora felt a breath catch in her throat. He is telling me this for a reason. He has never spoken of mamma like this before. 
She married me because she was told she must marry someone and at the time, I was the only one she seemed capable of tolerating. I did not force my hand with her nor did I jest her idealism. But I confess, Nora, I wished she would conform and when she fell pregnant, I knew that her days of unruly thoughts were done. Honora was saddened by what she was hearing, but she did not speak, lest she break whatever spell seemed to have overcome her father. I saw what marriage and motherhood had stolen from her. He said, his voice heavy with regret. She loved you, Nora, have no doubt, and she loved me too in her own way, I imagine. But so often I would see her gazing out into the city streets with a terrible sense of longing upon her face as it would be if she was mourning the person she was. He closed his eyes and was silent for a long moment. Honora hoped he had not fallen asleep and she waited. I knew I had stolen something from her and I lived with that shame every day, none more than when she died. He opened his eyes, a wry smile forming on his chubby face. But God, he works in mysterious ways, does he not? He gave me you, a spitting image of Lenora in all ways. She saw it too and she made me swear that I would never do to you what her parents had done to her. By forcing her to marry, you mean? Yes. He replied. And smothering that unbridled fire inside you, despite the scrutiny you face. He sighed deeply and stared into his daughter's face. I honored my vow to her, Nora. I treated you as I would have any son I knew. I had you properly educated while permitting you to be a part of my business and accompany me on these trips. I have kept you at my side because I believe it makes you happy but I cannot do this any longer. You are a woman now. I see how the men in these camps look at you and I cannot worry what may happen. It distracts me from my business. Papa. You need not worry about me. I am well versed in swordsmanship. You cannot consent to a duel while you are asleep, Nora. He interjected softly. I am sorry but this will be your last journey. I will not insist that you marry, Nora and you may continue to assist in the business when we return to London, but I implore you to reconsider your stance on accepting a suitor. For the sake of the business at least. Honora did not know what to say. Papa, I... She inhaled. I had hoped that you would entrust me to run the business, regardless of marriage. It is not about trust, my child. He told her, and she knew what he was about to say as he reached to squeeze her hands comfortingly. If it was about trust, this conversation would be for naught. It is about what others will see when they see a woman attempting to manage my empire. You will go out of business. No one will buy from you, our competitors will be ruthless with you, harass and undermine you. There will be a target on you as a single girl with wealth. I must do everything in my power to protect you, Nora, but if I am not here. A lump of disappointment was forming in Honora's throat but she bravely forced a smile and nodded, her light brown hair falling forward to shadow her expression in the already dim light. I understand, Papa. I knew you would, my sweet Nora. You are wiser than any man I have ever known. He closed his eyes again and in seconds he was sound asleep, snoring lightly as she carefully untangled her hands from his. I may be wiser than any man he has ever known but what does that mean when I was born a woman? It means nothing at all. Chapter 3 the servants' children were at play when Edward returned from the town's end, he paused at the fence to watch while they kicked about a ball, laughing amongst themselves. As he stared at them, teasing and jesting, he tried to recall an instance when he had ever rolled about with a group of children in such a fashion, but he could remember nothing at all. Edward had an undeniable urge to join them, if only for a few moments but the sound of hoofs at his back forced him to turn around, temporarily forsaking his interest in the children. Your Grace. May I have a word? Edward's mouth parted in shock as he saw who spoke his name and he nodded eagerly. Of course. He gasped. Please, come inside. He nodded at the coachman as a lady disappeared back inside the cab and he hurried up the drive to meet the carriage. Waving off the driver, he opened the door to extend a hand toward her and she gingerly allowed herself down the steps. You should not be here. 
he told her nervously. If your father... That is why I have come. Sarah interrupted, casting her eyes about. Who is here? I have not a clue. I only just returned from the towns. She paused and stared at him with her face pale and emotionless. Sarah are you ill? He asked worriedly. To come inside. No. The word was harsh and chilled Edward to his core, but he did not insist as she continued to gaze through him. She is not the same person she was one year ago, he thought, searching her waxen face for signs of the woman he had once adored so warmly. Gone was the sweet, chirping Sarah who would regale him with silly anecdotes and petty gossip about what was happening at that time. In her place was a ghost of a being, devoid of feelings and lost forever. Her once fair beauty was replaced by what was deemed to be a wall of white. I had a hand in making her this way, he thought mournfully. Things should have been much different. I should not have done what I did. Sarah, you must come inside. He murmured. He looked about in worry. If anyone saw her, the repercussions would be devastating, to them both. No. She yelled again, her face stony and defiant. I do not wish to come inside. I do not wish to. You cannot force me. Stunned, Edward stepped back and glanced furtively at the coachman who pretended not to watch the odd outburst, but it was impossible not to hear her irrational ways. Sarah. He tried again, his voice thick with concern. Please, tell me how I can help you. What are you doing here? Where have you been? You have helped enough. She moaned. I made a mistake coming here. She turned to hurry back into the coach. No, wait. He cried, knowing he should let her go but he could not when she was clearly suffering. It had been months since he had last seen her. If I let her go now, who knows when I might see her again. Another carriage appeared as Sarah's driver urged his horses forward the two cabs passing one another as Edward stood and helplessly watched. What in God's name was that about? He thought, tormented by the fact he had allowed her to leave. Why has she come here after months of refusing to see me? He had not even laid eyes upon the dainty blonde since the day their engagement ended. For a fortnight, he had believed she had run off to have her child in secret and it was not until Abraham Borthwick appeared on his doorstep trembling with rage that Edward heard she had lost the child. The adviser dismounted his carriage, a slight frown on his face. Who was that? Benedict asked. If I did not know better, I would swear that was one of the Borthwick's coaches. T'was Sarah. Edward admitted, and Benedict's mouth formed a no of shock. She has a great deal of gall showing up here, does she not? What on God's earth did she want? The adviser growled, but Edward had no answer. I haven't a clue. I did not even realize she was still in Blessington. I have not seen her in months. Odd isn't it? She manages to ruin your life, your reputation, and disappear unscathed. She does not appear unscathed. Edward muttered. She appears terrified. We should call upon her, Carter. Benedict whooped in amusement the suggestion clearly tickling him. Have you been visiting the opium dens? He chortled. Have you forgotten what woe that woman has caused you? You cannot be sincere about calling upon her. Never mind what her father will do. No, you cannot be sincere. I am. Edward sighed, staring off into the distance where Sarah's carriage had gone. She came here for a reason but apparently lost her nerve. Bloody good. Benedict swore. She came to her senses of formiring your reputation further. It was Edward's opportunity to snicker. Can it withstand more damage? He sighed. I would wager I will never come back from what happened. Benedict made a commiserating noise. In the future, dear boy, perhaps you should heed the advice of your advisers when we explain a terrible idea. Benedict sighed. Not much we can do about it now, is there? Nay. What brings you here? Edward asked, turning his attention fully on Benedict. 
I was told you had an engagement with Miss Starling. He smiled suggestively at his friend who groaned at the reminder. That woman sticks to me like a burr. Benedict muttered. I joined her for tea one afternoon and suddenly she is selecting China for our wedding. She is not hard on the eyes. A comely article, I say. What is the issue? Her voice. Benedict replied without hesitation. She will not cease with the endless blathering. Every word she utters brings me closer to death, I swear it, Edward. What does she go on about? Edward asked, less due to curiosity and more to make conversation to keep his mind from Sarah. You, Edward. Edward was not sure why the answer surprised him. After all, he had been the talk of the duchy for months. Why would a courtship between Carter and Clara Starling be exempt from gossip? Dare I ask? The Duke sighed. Tis nothing you have not heard a dozen times. Benedict said quickly, thinking that might make it better somehow. She asks about your temper, about your sexual proclivities. Edward felt his jaw twitch. I see. He murmured but he did not see, not at all. It makes no sense that my life has imploded in the aftermath of such a pure deed. I wish you would permit me to speak the truth about the matter, Eddie. Benedict said quietly, and Edward heard the sincerity in his voice. It would help matters a great deal more with the debtors if your credibility was not so suspect. They had been friends since boyhood and oftentimes, Edward felt that Benedict was more his brother than a member of the house staff. Benedict's father had served as an advisor for Edward's father and their grandfathers had also served together. They were as close to blood relations as they could be, and some believed they looked alike with their curling blonde waves and blue eyes. It was why Edward had felt he could trust Benedict with the truth about Sarah and what had truly occurred between them. Yet, the moment Edward had disclosed the secret to Benedict, unfettering himself from the burden he had carried for months, his friend had not stopped insisting that he disclose the truth. I will not and I insist that you cease asking me to do so. I simply failed to understand how you would rather be seen as a deserter of women and a beater of the pregnant. All of Blessington believes you were the cause of her losing her baby. Benedict cried. You must. Benedict, why have you come here? Edward interjected, tired of the same argument. If it is merely to quarrel with me, I would rather not. No. Benedict sighed. I have not come to quarrel. I have come to tell you I believe I have found a solution to the debt upon the duchy. Edward stared at him in disbelief. How? He demanded. What have you in mind? Shall we move this interview inside? Benedict asked, gesturing toward the column-flanked entryway. I would prefer we discuss it in private. Indeed. Edward agreed. They moved toward the doorway and entered. Susanna waiting to take their hats. Brandy to sip. Edward instructed her. We will be in the study. At once, your grace. As the Abigail hurried away to oblige the Duke's request, the men made their way toward the vast library of dark panelling and hunting trophies. It was very much a man's room, the study, the scent of stale cigar smoke hanging in the air as a constant reminder of the business conducted within its walls. Close the door. Edward instructed and Benedict obeyed before seating himself on the leather Chesterfield. Well? the Duke demanded. What have you considered? Traffic has been poor. Benedict commenced and Edward sighed. You may dispense of the formalities, Carter. I am well aware how dire is the situation. The duchy will be absorbed by Bleakenshire if we do not act in a timely fashion. This has been ongoing for years, even when my father was alive. As you well know, your father did quite a smashing job of acquiring the debt through bookmakers, gambling the future of the duchy with long odds and digging himself and the towns into a massive debt. It is one which we could never hope to see our way out of, even without the natural disaster flooding the crops. Your words continue to dishearten me, Carter but you are doing little to give me hope. Edward told him flatly. Have you anything or is the idea to give me apoplexy? 
We must broaden our horizons. Benedict continued, sitting back as there was a timid knock on the door. Come, Susanna. Edward called, and the servant hurried inside, a silver tray laden with sifter glasses. Thank you, Susanna. Benedict said, offering the plane made a small smile. That will be all, Susanna. She hurried away and the men reached for their respective drinks. Go on. Edward encouraged. Broaden our horizons how? It is clear we will never pay our debtors at this rate and, may I speak frankly? Have you ever not spoken frankly? Edward sighed. Give me the facts, Carter. It is all we have now. Given what has happened with Sarah, you seem nothing more than a ruthless Lothario who cares nothing about his people nor his debt. Our time has expired, our credit extended. It is only a matter of time before they come to the door and claim Briar Hill and its contents. Once more, Carter, you regale me with doom but give me no solutions. The solution is William Burney. Edward eyed his adviser curiously. I know that man's name. Who is he? A banker? A merchant. The wealthiest merchant in London. They refer to him as King Midas for all he touches turns to gold. And you propose that he lays his magical hands upon us and turn us to gold? Edward quipped, and took a long sip of his brandy. The slow burn of the liquid filled his chest and he sighed as the muscles in his shoulders began to relax. In a manner of speaking, Benedict agreed. We ask him to invest in the duchy. Edward blinked, uncomprehendingly. I am afraid I do not understand. He said slowly, the wheels in his mind slowly beginning to turn. Invest how? You offer him a piece of Briar Hill in exchange for a large sum of money. Carter, I do not need to explain to you how this will never come to fruition. Edward grumbled. The manor belongs to the crown. We have no right to bid it away. We shan't. Benedict assured him. We will buy it back after we work off our debt to Bernie. No one need know about the arrangement and Bernie has no royal ties. He is independently wealthy. If that is so, why would he agree? Benedict smiled. What man would not wish a piece of noble property to pass along to his child? He insisted. It is not something he will easily refuse, I assure you. You just said that he was not going to own anything in the end. But he does not need to know that at first. E. Edward sat back, his pulse quickening slightly. It seems deceptive to do such a thing. The Duke murmured. To whom? The Crown? Yes. Edward replied slowly. And to William Burney. Benedict seemed unhappy with the Duke's lack of enthusiasm at the well-conceived plan but he said nothing as he sipped on his drink. It is a good scheme, Carter. Edward assured him, his brow furrowed as he considered what he had learned. But how would we ever get away with it? What if William Burney simply has no interest in returning the property to me once I am able to pay him back? He is a mere merchant. You are a Duke. You can force your hand. You need not worry about. Stop. Edward snapped, his face heated at what Benedict was suggesting. I could never do such a thing. Benedict had the good decency to look down, embarrassed but Edward could not fault him for what he was trying to do. They were scraping the bottom of the barrel, seeking options which they would never have considered in a different time. Yes. The duchy is in a dire situation but to escape it, we will not put another in a similar situation. We are not so far gone that we need to abolish our morality. Withholding information from the crown is one matter, defrauding a man is quite another. Have you a better idea? Benedict asked sullenly, his face puckered into the scowl of a petulant brat. In fact, I do. Edward said suddenly, leaning forward with interest. A much better one at that. Benedict raised a dark blonde brow in anticipation. Well? Let us have it? Fetch me a blotter of ink. I need to pen a note to London. Chapter 4
Returning home from Spain had filled Honora with a bitter sweetness so intense, she felt it in the depth of her soul. Perhaps it was the knowledge that she would never again see the Roma people she had bonded with, not Vano and his impish kisses or Tilly and her wistful brown eyes. She would never see Spain or India or Italy like she had, no matter what her father told her on a boat home. Of course you will return. He called heartily that her woes were nothing more than passing pangs of longing. But not like this. Honora sighed sadly. Never to live in a gypsy camp or be smuggled into the belly of pirate boats. Shame that. William chuckled. You will only be apt to enjoy the country, not fear for your life. How I feel for you, my child. So many issues you have. Honora wished he would not brush off her concerns as if she was merely an annoying nat at a summer picnic. More than the experience, she knew her father's business had been built on assimilating within the communities. If the business ever fell into her hands, she would need to start making connections again from scratch, rebuilding relationships with wary locals who would not be open to a strange woman in place of their former connection. She tried to explain this to her father who only smiled. I am not even warm in my grave yet, child. He jested. You fear for things which have yet to happen. Focus your attention on the London houses and our travels inside England. All will come together as it is meant to be. You shall see. And yet he was the one speaking of his own death only days ago, pressuring me to marry. Honora said nothing and there was little else that she could do but nod and agree. Yet when they entered the gates of their charming country home, just outside the bustle of London, it dawned on her how happy she was to be home. Darling. Her grandmother called, hobbling toward her, weight pressed against one gnarled hand as she neared. I have missed you terribly. Oh, Grandmama. Honora cried, rushing forward to meet her father's mother in a warm embrace. I feel like we have been gone a month. A fortnight is just as agonizing, my dear. Marjorie Burney sighed. Willie, must you take her every time you leave? It is insufferable in this house with only the Bettys and your blubbering fool coachman. Now mother. William interjected while glancing nervously about to see if Michael was near enough to hear her insult. It is not kind to insult those with less control of their faculties. A ringing endorsement that is. Marjorie hooted. You entrust my life in his hands well enough, do you not? If he has no control of his faculties, why in God's name would you permit him to drive the coach? Come Grandmama, Honora said quickly. Let us show what we acquired on our journey through Spain and Italy. No. Marjorie said sharply. First we eat. Those fine linens and dresses will wait until you have food in your bread basket, dear. You are becoming much too skinny. Who will marry you if you have not any hips? Mother. William warned as Marjorie clutched Honora's arm and led her from the entranceway, calling for the servants. Honora had to giggle to herself as she permitted her grandmother to lead the way through the house, prattling in her ear. Perhaps Papa is right, she thought, staring warmly at her grandmother. Grandmama is much too frail to be left alone for such long stretches and I do miss her terribly when we are gone. A short rest from travel will not do me any harm. God forbid that something should happen to her in our absence. Honora wondered if she was simply selling herself on the merits of remaining in London, knowing that she had no choice but to resign to her fate in the end. Sit down, child. Marjorie insisted and Honora sensed that she had paused mid-step as she attempted to sort her thoughts. Yes, Grandmama. She perched at her grandmother's side as her father entered close behind. When they were all seated, the servants began to serve the bowls of soup. Our timing was perfect, Nora. William said gleefully. Beef chowder. I knew you were coming home today, William. Marjorie commented dryly. I am quite old but not mad. I recall what you prefer best for supper after long days at sea. He looked up and grinned sheepishly at his mother. Thank you, Mama. He laughed. After being at sea, this is precisely what we need, is it not, Nora? What are your plans now? 
Marjorie asked as she slurped her soup noisily through a spoon, her twisted fingers were shaking over the shiny silver. Suddenly, her head whipped up and she glared at one of the maids. Where on God's green earth is the bread? How will I ever fatten up my spring calf of a granddaughter without bread? She dropped her spoon and the servant scurried off, her face pale. Grandmama! Honora chided, choking down a giggle. You must not speak to them like that. You are fearsome. Her grandmother looked at her slyly through her side vision. Like what, dear? She asked innocently, but Honora knew she was simply being devious. She has earned the right to be mischievous, Honora decided. She had to be a mother twice, once to Papa and once to me. Thank you, Delia. Honora said purposefully when the scared servant returned with her bread. Yes, Miss Burney. You did not answer my question. Marjorie growled at her son. What was it, mother, forgive me? What are your plans going forward? Actually, Mother, I am glad you asked. Honora has decided to man the business while I continue to travel abroad. She will be with you constantly from here on in. Marjorie's head turned very slowly and she peered at Honora with her wise, troubled eyes. Is that a fact? She drawled. Did you decide this? Yes, Honora quipped quickly, shifting her eyes back to the bowl before her. Hmm. She knows us too well, Honora thought, shaking her head softly. She did not enjoy fibbing to her grandmother but she did not wish to defy her father's wishes openly. Marjorie was not known for her tact and she would undoubtedly fight for her granddaughter's position. It really is for the best, she thought. How queer! Marjorie muttered. I thought Honora was more akin to Lenora than you, William. I could not fathom any child of hers wasting away in London when the opportunity to see the world presented itself. It is settled, mother. William said firmly, a slight flush tinging his cheeks, leaving Honora to wonder if he had already discussed the matter with her. And where are you off to now? Marjorie demanded, sitting back, and fixing her icy blue eyes on her son. India and the Orient. I leave in three days. You cannot. The oldest Bernie said flatly. You have a visitor coming the day after tomorrow. Honora glanced at her grandmother. Who? She asked curiously. Indeed, who? Her father echoed, staring at his mother in confusion. I know nothing of this. I received a letter when you were away. Marjorie explained. The Duke of Blessington and his adviser have a business proposition for you. The perplexity at the table was close to palpable. He wrote you to speak of business? William asked, his eyes darting toward Honora. Why would he do such a thing? He did not write me. He wrote you. Marjorie replied smoothly and took another long slurp of her soup. What do you mean he wrote me? You have gone through my posts? Honora felt the blood drain from her face. What had her grandmother been thinking? Her father would be incensed. What else would you have me hear while you keep me encased like a songbird? Marjorie snapped, unapologetic. Of course I read your posts. And I answer them also. Honora could not stop her mouth from dropping and an unexpected chuckle escaped her throat. It is not amusing, Nora. William roared and Honora quickly shook her head in contrition. No, Papa, of course not. Grandmama, you should not have. You are the child, Nora. You need not scold me. In fact, you are both children to me. Save your lectures for another. Honora desperately wished to laugh at her grandmother's brazen gall, but she knew she could not without angering her father more. As I was saying, Marjorie continued. The Duke and his adviser will be along on the day after tomorrow. Fine. William grunted. There is not much I can say regarding the matter now, is there? No. Marjorie agreed. She scooped the last of her food into her mouth and yelled for another bowl. What is the proposition? 
Honora asked as she tried to remember what she knew about the Duke of Blessington. Was he the one with the twin brother who tried to have him murdered? No, that does not seem right. I dare say, I cannot recall. Marjorie laughed and William groaned aloud. Mother, where is the letter? What letter? The letter from the Duke of Blessington? The exasperation in her father's voice was clear but Marjorie seemed oblivious to it. I haven't the foggiest notion. She replied demurely and Honora was again left to smother a burst of laughter from her mouth. It was evident that her grandmother was having a jest at her father's expense. Mother? William growled. You are trying my patience. You will overcome. She promised, her eyes lit up at the sight of the second bowl of chowder. I did when I raised you and your brothers. Grandmama, you said that Papa cannot go on his trip but you also said the Duke will not be here until Wednesday. Papa does not leave until Thursday. Indeed. Marjorie agreed. Honora stared at the old woman, waiting for her to finish her thought, but there was nothing else to add. She sighed and shrugged at her father who continued to gape at her grandmother in disbelief. Are you fools going to eat? It will get cold. Marjorie snapped and they immediately reached for their spoons. How odd Grandmama is acting. Does she truly not recall what this is about or is she being coy? It was difficult to know for certain. Once upon a time, it would never have been a question and Honora would know her grandmother was jesting but as Marjorie got older, it was difficult to tell, her memory was not as sharp as it once was. I suppose it will all make sense in two days, she reasoned but as she pressed the spoon to her lips, Honora gasped. I recall who he is now. I know about the Duke of Blessington. What is it? Too hot, my dear? Marjorie asked. No, she cried, her face turning dark red with anger. You cannot meet with that man, father. Why not? William asked. He was beginning to look dizzy with all the turmoil occurring at the dinner table. He is an awful man. Honora gasped, her appetite suddenly depleted. Simply awful. Honora, you must elaborate. We know several variations of awful men. We are in the merchant business after all. She shook her tresses wildly, feeling her fists close under the table as she recalled the sordid details of what had happened to Sarah Borthwick. He made a girl pregnant with a bastard. Honora started, gritting her teeth, the story flooding her mind with a sharp sting. Darling, it does take two for these things to happen. Marjorie chirped. And he would hardly be the first noble to do such a thing. I am not finished, Grandmama. She inhaled. He proposed marriage to her. Well, you see? William interrupted. He is not the devil after all. Permit me to finish, please. Her elders stared at her in surprise, unaccustomed to her icy tone. She lost the child and he called off the engagement. They stared at her and she could see that neither was particularly moved by the story. Alas, these things happen. The girl should have known much better than to get involved. It is a shame that she is damaged goods and that no self-respecting man will wed her. But Duke Blessington can hardly be expected to marry her if she is not with child and he chooses not to. She lost the child because he beat her. The gasp of shock filled the room. Oh that is vile. Marjorie murmured. How atrocious. Are you certain about this, Nora? A man's reputation is at stake here. Her father asked grimly. You should not listen to idle gossip. He has yet to deny but a single charge. Honora insisted. You may ask him yourself if you wish. I doubt he will deny it. Silence fell over the table. It is too late to cancel the interview. William said tersely. But you can rest assured that I will confront him with this information and if what you say is fact, Nora, I most certainly will not be doing any business with him, you have my word. Honora exhaled slowly and nodded, her dark green eyes filled with gratitude. Thank you, Papa. She breathed. That is all I can ask. 
They finished the remainder of their supper in silence but Honora could barely taste a morsel. If I must see him when he arrives, God grant me the serenity not to react violently, she thought. Chapter 5 It took four hours to reach the Bernie's country home on the outskirts of London, the coach and six working at full capacity. Both men were feeling poorly from travel when they arrived on the doorstep, but Edward was determined to put his best foot forward when the door swung inward. The smile froze on his face as he stared into the face of a comely woman. Her hair was the color of wet sand, swept up at the sides with two pearl combs, accenting the creamy skin of her neck. Her cheekbones were high and regal, her eyes an intense, dark green, akin to jade stalks and shrouded by thick, dark eyelashes. Edward could not stop his gaze from falling over the delicate skin of her bosom, across the ruffles of her bodice and down the waistline of her white and blue dress. May I help you? Her voice snapped him from his trance, his eyes darting up to her mouth which seemed pinched into a line of anger. Forgive me, Edward said. He stepped forward and bowed slightly. I am Edward, Duke of Blessington. I have an appointment to meet with Mr. William Burney today. Do I have the proper house? Without responding, she spun away, leaving them to stand in the doorway, staring after her. Shall we remain? Edward asked Benedict, but his adviser had no advice on the matter. I will follow you, your grace. He replied but neither made an effort to move. They stood uncomfortably, listening for activity inside the vast house until they heard the gentle click of a cane approaching. Eagerly, they leaned forward to peer inside the house. Dear Lord! An elderly woman barked. Were you raised in a barn? Come inside before you permit the bees inside. The men exchanged a glance and quickly obliged, by stepping over the threshold to enter as Benedict closed the door behind him. Good day, my lady. Edward tried again as the old woman peered at them scornfully. I am. I know who you are although you clearly do not know me. I wrote you in response to your ridiculous request. Confused, Edward glanced at Benedict. Is this a joke? He asked, his brow furrowing in confusion. I am here to meet with my son. William. I know. Is he here? Possibly. Edward was beginning to feel a wave of annoyance spark inside him. Madame, I do not wish to be crass but we have journeyed a fair distance today. If it was all for naught. That will depend on you, Duke Blessington. The woman interrupted again. My son will meet with you, but it will be your character which ultimately decides if this venture will exist. A tingle of alarm touched him, he knew that feeling well. I, I am afraid I do not know what to say to that, Mrs. Burney. He said slowly. I like to believe that I have a very good character but I imagine I am biased in the matter. Are you? She scoffed. Would the young lady whom you impregnated and abandoned feel the same? Edward's mouth dropped open in shock. What is the meaning of this? He demanded, his pulse racing. Have you agreed to meet with me simply to gawk at the butt of gossip? She did not respond and Edward felt his face grow hot. Thank you for your time, Mrs. Burney. He spun to leave, terrified that he might begin to hyperventilate before they could return to the carriage. Mother. What are you doing? A robust man appeared at the top of the stairs, the young woman who had opened the door, at his side. She is William Burney's daughter. There is no resemblance, thank God. Nothing, son. I was merely making conversation with the Duke. Duke Blessington, my son, William Burney. If you will excuse me. She cast him a cold smile and gestured for the girl to follow. Come along, Nora. It is time for tea. Let us leave the men to get acquainted. Edward stood, shaking slightly as he watched the women disappear, his eyes darting toward Benedict who appeared stunned. Oh dear Lord, what did she say? William asked, striding toward them. Please, come inside. I will fetch you something cool to drink. He called out to a nearby servant and led the guests into the salon. 
Forgive my mother. He insisted. She forsakes her manners as she ages. She means nothing by her ramblings, I assure you. She seems quite lucid to me. Edward replied, still unsure if they should remain. He felt they had been led into an ambush. Please. William pleaded. Do sit and rest after your journey, and we can discuss what it is you wanted to speak of. Benedict tentatively sat, and Edward grudgingly decided to do the same as the bet he entered with a tray of cold tea in a pitcher. They have heard about me, even here. There is nowhere I can go to escape the stigma of what happened with Sarah and me. There was only one thing to do, he had to face the obvious rather than dance about it, especially if he wanted this deal to occur. Firstly, Edward began. I would like to say that what happened in Blessington was quite a bit more complicated than what you may have heard. The merchant looked uncomfortable as he shifted his eyes about the room. It is truly none of my concern, Your Grace. William offered weakly but Edward waved his hand aside. Your Grace. Benedict muttered but Edward ignored him. Have you questions? Edward asked bluntly. Ask them. I will answer them openly and honestly for that is the only way a business relationship can flourish. We must not begin our negotiations with ill feelings or uncertainty, yes? True. William replied but he still seemed uncomfortable. I all right. Is it true? Is what true? Edward asked. All of it. I do not know what you have heard. Edward explained. He straightened in his chair to stare into William's nervous eyes. I am not attempting to be coy or elusive. Did you break off an engagement with a pregnant girl when she lost the baby at your hand? None of that statement is true. Edward said, matter-of-factly. I did not break off the engagement and she most certainly did not lose the child at my hand. I would sooner die than hurt a pregnant woman, particularly one I care for. Care for? Oh he caught that, did he? Yes. Edward answered honestly. I still do care very deeply for Sarah. I wish nothing but goodness for her in her life. Despite what she is claiming? I cannot speak to what she is thinking at this time. I know she has gone through a very difficult time. I do not judge her or fault her actions. William seemed more confused than he had been at the start but he could only shake his head. As I said, Your Grace, it is truly not my concern. And yet you asked. Benedict growled, apparently displeased by the transaction between the merchant and the Duke. Let us discuss the matter at hand, shall we? Edward suggested, not wanting the tension in the room to escalate further. I understand your need to know the man with whom you are entertaining a venture. What is this venture? William asked, reaching forward to take his cold tea. I must admit, I am intrigued to know why a duke from Blessington would travel such great distance to carry a favor. It is hardly carrying a favor. Benedict announced indignantly. It is as much for your benefit as it is his graces. William paled. I meant nothing. And nothing was taken by it. Edward assured him, and shot Benedict a scathing look. Forgive my adviser. Mr. Carter off takes his loyalties further than need be. He means no harm. Indeed. Benedict mumbled with resignation. As I was saying, Edward continued. My duchy is in a considerable amount of debt. Our accounts are decades old, most predating my dukedom. William's face turned stony before Redwood's eyes but he rushed on to complete his thought. Under normal circumstances, I would be apt to float the debt and pay it, cutting purse strings where need be but in light of the flooding and... He cleared his throat. The recent scandal which has touched Blessington, I fear that I am quite out of options. Your Grace, permit me to stop you there. William sighed. I am not a bank, nor a bookmaker. I fear if you have come asking for a loan. I come asking for an investment in Briar Hill, my manor home. Edward nodded at Benedict who began to remove sketches of the sprawling estate in Blessington. As you can see, Mr. Burney, the house is worthy of a pretty pence and I can assure you, 
on my honor, it is kept in immaculate condition. Naturally, you are welcome to come and explore the grounds yourself before you commit. William peered at the drawings, his eyes lit up at the size of the home but he shook his head. I have a lovely home here, he reminded the Duke. Moreover, I am not certain how acquiring more debt enables you to walk away from your problem, Your Grace. It is an investment, Mr. Burney. While you will be a part owner of Briar Hill and its surrounding properties, it is the rents collected on the tenants which will make you whole as well as. William's eyebrows raised. As well as? We would be in your debt until it is repaid. Mr. Carter and I will be employees of your merchant trading business until we can agree that you are happy with the total of your investment. Ah, so I am to hire you also. Edward inhaled sharply. It had gone worse than he had expected. There was only one way he could think of to make his case and even so, Edward was uncertain of his chances. Mr. Burney, I am a young man, not yet two and thirty. I have been Duke for nearly a decade, wallowing in the insurmountable debt that my careless father left without regard for the duchy. I take pride in Blessington and I honor my position. To me, it is not merely a peerage, a title. It is something that was bestowed upon me to protect and care for at all costs. I am here, as a duke, imploring you to consider my offer, not because it will be profitable for you perhaps, but because it will save my people and in turn, save me. Please, sir, before you refuse me, take a night to consider. It is all I ask. William sat back, his face contorted into an expression Edward could not quite read. He studied the Duke's face for a long, silent moment. Come along, your grace. Benedict mumbled. This was a terrible. I will have an answer for you on the morrow before I depart for my journey for Asia. H. He said. Have you a place to spend the night? No, Mr. Burney but we will locate accommodations, Edward assured him quickly. You will stay here this evening. He rose quickly. I will have the servants show you to your apartments. He extended a hand then, meeting Edward's wary but hopeful eyes, and the Duke accepted his outstretched palm. Thank you, Mr. Burney. You may call me William. Edward practically swooned with relief and he nodded gratefully pumping his hand with great gusto. Thank you, William. Chapter 6 Papa, you cannot entertain this. Honora was troubled, not only by her father's consideration in the matter but by the fact that she had permitted Duke Blessington and his advisor room and board for the evening. You must not fret, child. William told her firmly. I have been a merchant for many moons and I have learned to rely quite readily on my instincts. I find fault with what you have heard about the Duke. Honora's eyes narrowed and she turned her head fully toward the threshold where her father lounged. He denied it then? She asked skeptically. What has he to say about the ordeal? He has denied parts of the tale, yes. William replied. Which parts? Enough. Her father insisted albeit evasively. And you believe him? Honora, I am your father and you must have faith in my decisions. He explained. She did not respond and turned her head back toward the glass where she was brushing out her long hair in sweeping strokes. It was plain to see the concern in her expressive green eyes, but she knew that her father was not about to be convinced at that moment. The damage had already been done, after all the men in their respective chambers, preparing for supper in the dining room. Perhaps Grandmama can speak sense to him, she thought. She pulled the silver brush through her tresses one final time before drawing a ribbon around her free-flowing strands. You look lovely, Nora. Her father told her, his voice laced with admiration and pride. I am blessed to call you my child. Unexpectedly, the words caused a shiver of alarm through her body. I would not want the Duke to believe I have dressed for him, she thought worriedly, debating a change of attire for supper. Come along now. William continued. Our guests await. She sighed quietly, knowing there was no time to alter her dress and rose to join her father on his arm. Mind your manners. William said in a low voice as they moved into the corridor. 
he is still a nobleman, no matter your opinion of his character. You needn't be decent to be noble. Honora muttered and her father's hand tightened around her arm. You need not fawn over him. William said firmly. But I insist you act like a lady in his presence. Honora felt hurt by the insinuation that she would not be on her best behavior, but she did not protest as they descended the staircase. She inhaled to muster her internal strength when they rounded the corner into the grand dining hall. In truth, Honora had been taken aback by the handsomeness of the Duke when she had first laid eyes upon him. She had not been expecting such a magnetic man and her reaction to his elegance had both stunned and embarrassed her. She had met many beauteous people in her travels, and admittedly her heart had fluttered on many occasions, but there was something virtually spiritual about Duke Blessington, as though he exuded a goodness she had not expected. A good man does not do what he did, Honora reminded herself curtly. He may be handsome on the outside but his core is rotten. Again, William squeezed her arm as they stood in the doorway. Instantly, the men rose while her grandmother sat, a small, cold smile on her lips. Honora was relieved seeing that Marjorie had not been won over as easily as her father appeared to be. Duke Blessington, Mr. Carter, may I present my daughter, Honora? Miss Burney, the Duke smiled, his white teeth seeming to blaze against the candlelight. Charmed. Honora said shortly as her father guided her to her chair and she sat. She loathed that she was inadvertently taken by his attractiveness, just as she had been from the first moment she had seen him. You must not lose sight of who he is and have faith that Papa will see it too. I must extend our gratitude to you and your grandmother, Miss Burney. The nobleman offered before he sat. It is not me who requires your gratitude. Honora piped before she could stop herself. She caught her father's reproving look and she lowered her eyes before she could offer any more of her thoughts. Our home is always open to the weary traveller. She continued, the pleasantries were sticking in her throat as she deigned to spit out accusations and demand answers for the forsaken girl in Blessington. And for that, we are thankful. The Duke finalised, while he raised his glass to make a toast. To new friends and business arrangements. Honora's back stiffened as she glanced at her father. Has he already consented to whatever the Duke has in mind? She wondered but her father did not meet her eyes. Here, here. Mr. Carter agreed, while he raised his own glass and the Burnies followed suit, albeit reluctantly. I confess, your grace. Marjorie began and Honora felt a surge of hope as she waited for her no-nonsense grandmother to lay the truth upon the table. I am perplexed by your proposal. Mother, you know nothing about the proposal. William interjected, casting the visitors an apologetic look. I have ears, William. I used them while you were congregated in the parlour. Ah, this is where she snuck away to, Honora worked out, smiling to herself. How could I have underestimated her? Mother, you listen to a private business deal? Is it a deal? Marjorie asked. I had thought you would have your answer on the morrow but I see you have already decided. Honoro sank back against the back of her chair and sighed deeply. Mother, this is not... Women's business? Marjorie offered and Honora put the napkin to her mouth knowing her father was only making matters worse by fueling her grandmother's fire. Papa says I am like Mama but who can deny that Grandmama is a cannonball? I am happy to explain my position, the Duke said, and Honora's head rose in shock. He was the last person she had expected to hear speak. The servants began to enter the dining room with supper servings, while Marjorie turned her bird-like eyes upon the Duke. Would you? She asked sweetly. How kind. Mother, I insist you cease making our guests uncomfortable this instant. This is the supper table, not a place for negotiations. The anger in William's voice was evident and to her grandmother's credit, she seemed to sense she was trying her son's patience. Indeed, Marjorie murmured, shifting her gaze away but not before her eyes caught her granddaughter's. I am old and forget myself. What did she hear? I must know, Honora thought, and vowed to learn the truth from her grandmother. 
I do not mind. Edward said, and again, Honora was surprised by his willingness to speak freely. But as the master of the house has said, this may not be the time nor place for such talks. I imagine you and I will have much time to know one another, your grace. Marjorie quipped lightly. That is my hope. The duke replied but Honora could not help noticing his eyes were fixed on her face when he spoke. I hope you enjoy lamb. William boomed with more force than need be. Our cook is quite adept with a mint sauce you will not soon forget. I do. The duke agreed. I appreciate the refreshing nature of mint. Honora could not help feeling that he was speaking to her directly when he said the words. Perhaps he is accustomed to wooing other, silly women with his mannerisms but I will not be fooled I will not. She chose to ignore his words and turned her attention back toward the food. Her mind was swimming with confusion at the emotions she was experiencing. I imagine this is how he won that girl back home but I am not unsuspecting and naive. No matter what happens with him and father, I will keep my distance. I need not be a party to whatever scheme the Duke has planned. Yet as she began to eat, still feeling the intense stare of the man on her, she wondered if her words were aligned in any truth. After all, her father was leaving for Asia, and she would be responsible for the business in his absence. If the business suddenly included the Duke, she would have little choice in whether or not she had dealings with him. Honoro snuck a sidelong look at her father who had skillfully managed to turn the conversation away from anything of consequence. You must make the proper choice, Papa, she willed him silently but as the supper progressed, Honora was less sure of what that might be. Birds chirped happily outside the windows of the breakfast nook and Honora took her tea near the window seat, staring out into the slowly filling street below. The men had not yet descended from their apartments and she relished the few moments of silence while she watched the handsome crowds begin their day. Whatever the day brought, she intended to be ready, although she was certain she knew her father had already decided to work with the fallen duke, despite her reservations. Papa is right, it is not for us to say with whom he does business, she agreed silently. I must concede whatever he decides. Good morrow, Miss Burney. She gasped, startled, with the teacup rattling in her fingers as she turned to address the Duke. Your Grace, she replied, regaining her composure. She had been so lost in her own thoughts, she had not noticed his arrival. May I join you? She wished to deny him but her father's words echoed in her head, and she knew it was not her place to refuse. Of course, Your Grace. Permit me to guide you to the dining room for breakfast. I will alert the servants. Here is fine. He replied, gesturing toward the intricate wood table. As you wish, your grace. She rose from her spot among the window seat and he pulled a chair for her to sit before claiming one of his own. Tea? She reached for the china pot and poured him a cup as he nodded. Thank you, Miss Burney. She did not speak while placing the saucer before him and sat again. Honora felt inexplicably tongue-tied as she thought of something to say. You assist your father in his business? How are you finding London? They spoke in unison and laughed uneasily as their eyes met. Forgive me, your grace. She said quickly. Yes, I help my father and oft travel with him, or I should say, I did oft travel with him. You will not any longer? She shook her head, a pang of regret touching her heart. My grandmother is aging. She replied as if the answer was the standard. I will remain in England going forward. You are kind for accepting such a burden. The Duke said and she looked up quickly. My grandmother is not a burden. She replied sharply. She has raised me in the absence of my mother. Forgive me. Edward said. He was decidedly embarrassed. I did not mean anything insulting by stating so. I only meant to point out your generosity of heart. Many would not do the same. Honora studied his face, unsure of what to make of his words. He is attempting to be polite and I am being rude. She is difficult at times. Honora heard herself say before she could measure her own words. But she is strong and well-loved, 
I assure you. I can see that both are true. The Duke said softly as he stared into her eyes. Honora's heart fluttered and seemed to skip a beat and she dropped her chin toward her tea. He is only attempting to win favor with Papa. This is why he is here. You must not fall victim to his charms. Think of the broken-hearted girl whose reputation has been ruined by this man. But Honora could not deny that her reservations were much less that day than they had been the previous evening although she could not say why exactly. Perhaps it is the warmth in his eyes. Men with such warm, gentle eyes are not capable of such cruelty, are they? Honora would not know. She had never entertained the idea of romance, not when her days were consumed with trading and travels. The idea of courtship seemed tedious. Yet for some reason, she could not help wondering what kind of husband Duke Blessington would make. Good morrow. Why have we congregated here when breakfast awaits in the dining room? William asked. He crossed his arms and stood in the doorway. He cast on Nora a look that questioned her intentions and her cheeks exploded into a scarlet blush. She was thankful her father could not read her innermost thoughts. I was merely basking in the wit of your daughter, Mr. Burney, the Duke replied. He rose and stood behind Honora's chair and she reluctantly stood also. To her shock, he extended his arm for her to take. Would you be so kind as to accompany me to the dining room? He asked. Honora glanced at her father who shrugged subtly and turned away, leaving her to accept his arm. I know you are unsure about me being here. He murmured softly, ensuring that her father was out of earshot. I am too unsure that coming here was the proper thing to do. Honora stopped mid-step and looked at him. How do you mean? She asked, tilting her head slightly. I am only here as a last resort. He confessed. Honora was still not sure she understood but she nodded slowly. I am not asking you to accept me entirely. He continued. I only ask that you keep your mind open to the possibility that I am not as wicked as you might believe. What difference does it make to you what I believe? She asked, the words escaping her lips without thought. I am not the one whose approval you require. A small smile touched his generous mouth. Perhaps you cannot see it as you are much too close. The Duke offered. But it is abundantly clear to me that your father cares very highly of your opinion. Honora scoffed lightly. Papa indulges me because of a misguided promise he made to my mother many years ago. She was shocked at herself for disclosing such a personal thought to a perfect stranger, one whom she was not certain she even liked but it was too late. The words could not be retrieved. You are misguided if you believe your father does not value you. And I cannot say I blame him. Honora's lips parted slightly, her brow raising but he had already resumed his gait and she was pulled along beside him, her arm still entwined in his. Ah, you made it. William chuckled, rising with Mr. Carter when they arrived. I was about to send out the hounds. It is quite easy to grow lost in such a sprawling home. Edward agreed. Fortunately, I had a proper guide to lead me. Once more, he pulled out her chair and Honora sank into the chair as the men followed suit. I was telling Mr. Carter that I have reached a decision as promised. William said without ado. I will invest in your manor home, Briar Hill. Honora exhaled slowly. Is this good news or bad? She wondered, sneaking a look at the Duke's relieved face. My word, Mr. Burney, that is wonderful. You will not regret your decision and I can assure you, we will work to double your profits tirelessly. I think we both know that this is not bound to be a lucrative investment in the long term. William sighed and Honora's eyes narrowed. If it is not for profit, what is the point? She wondered but she wisely did not ask the question aloud. She learned much better with her ears opened and mouth shut. There are conditions. William continued and Honora reached for a piece of toast, chewing it softly. As I expected there would be. The Duke replied. My daughter and mother will accompany you back to the duchy while I am in Asia. He explained. Pardon me? 
Honora choked but William held up his hand. Permit me to finish, Nora. He cleared his throat and stared at the men. She will be granted access to your accompts without hindrance or hassle. Of course. The Duke agreed. Honora could see the spark of interest in his eyes as he glanced at her but she was shaking inside. When I return, we will discuss ways to better your investments and broaden your ventures but for that to happen, we must know what damage has been done. I understand. Papa. Nora and my mother will stay at Briar Hill until I return. You will be responsible for housing and feeding them. William continued and Honora gasped. Papa, this is unnecessary and disruptive. How am I to man the business if not from London? You, my child, will broaden our interests and expand our business toward Bristol Bay. Papa. All the while. William continued, without taking a breath to permit his daughter's argument in. You will educate the Duke and his adviser in the ways of our business. You cannot be serious, Papa. Is this a joke? A punishment? She cried indignantly, casting furious eyes about the table. I will not abide by this. William turned and fixed his eyes upon his daughter. This is my decision, Honora, and you are still bound to obey my word. Honora felt light-headed and she gaped at her father's incomprehension but he had already turned his attention back to the duke who seemed pleased with the news. Your grace, do you agree to these terms? William asked and the duke nodded eagerly. Yes, yes, sir. Honora watched as he leaned forward to shake her father's hand, her stomach bubbling with resentment. William purposely avoided her gaze, and Honora suddenly understood everything with blinding clarity. Instead, he reached beneath the table and pulled forth a sack which Honora knew contained a substantial amount of coin. With a smile of content, he slid it toward the Duke. Papa does not care that there is no profit in this. In horror she saw the light. He has found a nursemaid for Grandmama and a governess for me. His mind will be at ease when he leaves us behind. Papa. She tried to say again, but the words stuck in her throat as she stared at her father not recognizing the man for a moment. Honora had never felt so betrayed in her life. Chapter 7 Benedict did not say a great deal during their journey back to the duchy, and Edward knew he was still processing what they had gained in London. It is a victory for Blessington, the Duke told himself with conviction. We have coin to placate our debtors and start anew as we needed. We accomplished all we came to do. He could not resist looking out the back window of the coach at the carriage following, his pulse quickening at the thought of what else he had gained from their journey. It was clear that William Burney had always intended to use the proposition as means to protect his daughter and mother, but Edward wondered if the merchant had not foreseen something between the Duke and his daughter. Something like marriage perhaps? The unbidden thought filled Edward with both apprehension and excitement. He would be a fool to deny that Honora Burney was comely and bright, her lovely eyes wise beyond her years. She had business sense and a quiet wit which he had never known in another woman, and it did not hurt her case that her father was one of the wealthiest merchants in London. What are you beaming about? Benedict asked abruptly, arousing Edward from his daydream. You cannot think that having the Burney women at Briar Hill is a sound decision. Why not? There is room for them and we knew there would be conditions attached to such a dealing. Conditions such as William Burney coming to look over the accounts, Eddie, not his tart daughter acting as banker. What could she possibly know about accounting? Edward became suddenly defensive. Apparently she knows enough for her father to entrust her to such a chore. He retorted. And I dare say, she is hardly a dart. You will find her beguiling nature tiresome after three months, Benedict promised. Three months? How are you going to endure it in Bernie's absence? Edward allowed himself a wry smile. I will find a way, he said, making this shallow promise. Benedict's face twisted into a look of disbelief as he caught the lilting tone of the Duke's voice. Do you fancy her? He asked, his voice etched in disgust. She despises you. 
she and her grandmother both. She has heard the fudge going around. Edward replied. I cannot fault her for being concerned. If the roles were reversed, I might be suspicious also. You would not. Benedict scoffed. You believed every rumor you ever heard about your father. That is because they were sound and true. The men chuckled, but Edward could not dismiss the slight sadness in his gut, he longed for the relationship the Burnies seemed to share amongst themselves. I have never known such a closeness with my family. Perhaps having them nearby will teach me about such a bond. Are you considering marriage? Benedict asked, his brow knitting in concern. I am not dismissing the idea. Edward replied. If she can overcome her preconceived notions of me. If you would tell the truth about what transpired between you and Sarah Borthwick, you would not need to concern yourself with strangers despising you. Benedict reminded him and Edward snorted. But as they lapsed back into silence, his mind returned to Sarah's gaunt face the day she had appeared at Briar Hill. What had she wanted to tell me? He decided he would find a way to reach out to her when they returned home. Edward and Benedict stepped from the coach. Susanna, please find accommodations for Mrs. and Miss Burney in the West Wing. Edward announced. They will be our guests for several months. The Betty's face showed no emotion although her eyes widened in surprise. She had no advanced notice of the arrivals, and she did not know what to make of the information. Yes, your grace. She replied, pausing to see the second carriage arrive. Edward could see her curiosity was overwhelming the orders he had given and he permitted her to wait and meet the newcomers. Benedict sighed heavily as the coachman escorted the women from the cab, and they stood before the house, studying it speculatively. This certainly is not London, is it? Marjorie chirped, wrinkling her nose in disdain. My word, this house is falling to pieces. How are we to sleep here? It is charming, Grandmama. Honora replied, lacing her arm through the older woman's as her eyes scanned the entranceway. Edward wondered what they truly saw when they looked at Briar Hill. To him, it had always been home, despite the coldness it had represented to him in his youth. Is it crumbling or is Marjorie Burney merely beginning her reign of difficulty already? He only saw the ivy lacing up the front of the stone walls, gracefully spilling across the window panes that embraced the structure. There were no obvious cracks in the structure, at least not from where he stood. Mrs. Marjorie Burney, Miss Honora Burney, meet Susanna. Edward offered. She will tend to your needs personally. One servant? Marjorie scoffed, scowling at Susanna whose smile faded when the old woman's words met her ears. We should have brought our own, Nora. I have a full staff under my employ. Edward promised, waving Susanna off. The maid turned away quickly as the coachman approached with the trunks. Where shall I leave these? He asked. You may leave them here, Michael. We will have it sorted. Honora replied. Return to London now. He cannot leave us here. Marjorie snapped. How will we get around? Or are we to be held as prisoners? Grandmama, Michael is needed at home. Honora sighed, and Edward could see that her grandmother's words were beginning to grate on her nerves. She has undoubtedly been listening to Marjorie's griping since we left. I assure you, Mrs. Burney, you will have all the comforts of home at your disposal. You certainly are not prisoners in any way. Marjorie grunted and hobbled across the dirt pathway toward the front door, shoving past Edward angrily as she moved. May I have some water? I am parched and weary from the journey and you leave me in the hot sun. This will be charming, Benedict muttered. A true taste of heaven above. Edward ignored him and moved forward to escort Marjorie inside the house, Honora followed close behind. I will take her to rest. Honora suggested, and Marjorie shook off Edward's offer to assist. Where would I find our chambers? Susanna is preparing them now. Edward explained. Shall we retire to the salon? Have we a choice? Marjorie grumbled. Grandmama. Honora had had enough. Please. 
To Edward's surprise, the old woman ceased her grumbling as Honora took her arm and they shuffled toward the back of the manor house. Through his peripheral vision, he could see Honora carefully studying the artwork lining the panelled walls, her gaze slipping upward to the chandeliers of crystal and gold. Wait until she sees the way the light twinkles against the prisms when the candles are lit. I imagine candlelight flatters her fairness well. As they continued to move, Edward suddenly noticed that Marjorie would never be able to manage the stairs in her brittle condition. She would need an apartment on the main floor. Goodness gracious! Marjorie barked. How much longer until I am able to rest? We have been on this constitution for ages. This way, Mrs. Burney, Edward said, as he led them to a back room where she nearly collapsed onto a settee, breathing somewhat laboriously. Honora peered at her with concern. Are you well, Grandmama? How many times must I ask for water? E. She croaked. Edward hurried to oblige her request as Honora perched at her side. Edward handed her a glass and watched as the woman drank it with trembling hands. Doubt began to cloud his vision. Have I committed to having an infirm woman in my care? He wondered, casting Benedict a nervous look. Benedict's expression matched his fears. Your Grace, may I have a word? His adviser rasped flatly, spinning toward the hallway. I will be back in a moment. Susanna will show you to your chambers shortly. Neither woman responded, but Honora glanced up at him with worry. She did not know her grandmother was so frail either. You must send them back to London. Benedict announced, his words flooding forth in a torrent. If anything should happen to her while she is in your care, how do you propose I do that? Edward snapped, annoyed that Benedict had made such a suggestion. Have you forgotten how they have come to be here? Your grace, if the old woman should perish, she will not perish. Honora's voice was like a flash of fire, causing them both to whirl and stare at her. Forgive us, Miss Burney, Edward said quickly. We are merely discussing your grandmother's condition. You are planning her wake. Honora retorted. I assure you, my grandmother will outlive us all. Shame on you for speaking in such a way. Of course, you are right. Edward tried to reassure her. We are all fatigued from our journey. I will see what is keeping Susanna. Will you accompany me, Mr. Carter? Of course, your grace. Benedict was grateful for any excuse to escape the withering look upon Honora's face. The men hurried out of view, pausing only when they were certain Honora no longer glared after them. Eddie, you must think about what this will cost you if you take the risk of keeping them here. You have just come through one scandal with your reputation tarnished. A corpse will not benefit your position in the duchy. You will be displaced. The crown will not stand for more nonsense, you must know that. And if that happens, the crown will know that I illegally took on a silent partner in the duchy, an outsider with no noble standing. William Burney may be wealthy but he is not royal. I will be hanged for defrauding my country or be sent to rot in jail for eternity. Yet, Edward also knew if he sent the women home, it would need to be with the money, coin he desperately needed to alleviate the duchy's debt. Eddie, please, be reasonable. Send them on their way on the morrow. Benedict pleaded. Edward shook his head. No, he replied slowly. No, the Burneys stay. All will be well. From my lips to God's ears, he prayed silently. Chapter 8 Honora was sitting on the wooden floor when a gentle knock on the door diverted her attention upward. Come. She called, and Susanna entered, carrying a tray. I have nibbles for you, Miss Burney. The maid said while setting the tray down on the desk. I did not ask for that, Susanna. You may take it before the mice smell the cheese and come running. Honora replied, turning her attention back to the mound of papers littering the floor around her. Her long skirts fanned across the wooden floor in an umbrella of yellow as she studied the numbers with consternation and confusion. Never had she seen such terrible books in all her experience. 
I have seen neater records in the jungles of India. She thought. Surely an exaggeration, but the British were known for their meticulous records. All but Duke Blessington, she thought, sighing tiredly. For days she had been trying to unravel the accounting chaos, but instead of it growing easier, each ledger made things somehow more convoluted. You must. Susanna politely insisted. I must finish what I have come here to do. She retorted. I haven't time for rest. The sooner I finish with this, the sooner I can collect Grandmama and return to London. From the first day, Honora had been filled with a lingering dread that her grandmother was sick and hiding the truth from her. There was nothing specific that Honora could see, no outward signs of distress, but the feeling remained that something was not right. She vowed that she would complete the accounting task by sorting out the financial mayhem of the Duchy's records, but after that, she would return to London. The doctors are finer in the city, she reasoned. It is a small wonder she will not permit me to call one here. Once we are home and she is comfortable, she will feel differently about it. Honora desperately wished she had a way to contact her father, but he was on a ship and without any fixed address for two months and a fortnight longer. Miss Burney, his grace is quite concerned about you. She murmured, her voice barely above a whisper. Confused, Honora peered at her. Concerned about me? She echoed. Whatever for? Susanna shifted her eyes downward as she feared she had said too much and shook her head. Pardon me, madam, but I have very explicit orders to ensure that you eat. From his grace? Yes, Miss Burney. Honora gritted her teeth and took a deep breath, determined not to take her annoyance out on the hapless maid. Take the tray, Susanna and should his grace take issue with that, you may have him come and speak to me directly. Please, Miss Burney. Thank you, Susanna. She did not have time to argue with the servant, and while she did not wish for the woman to get into trouble, Susanna's orders were not her problem. My only concern is Grandmama and leaving Briar Hill. She barely noticed when the maid left, but a few moments later, she did hear the door open again. Susanna, I really would prefer not to be disturbed, she sighed, then looked up. She jolted in surprise when she saw Duke Blessington. Forgive me, your grace. I thought you were. Yes, Susanna. He interjected dryly. She told me you sent her away again. I would much rather focus on the task at hand she explained, and rose to address him properly. Albeit, I do appreciate the gesture. She was fibbing. Honora was annoyed at the Duke's attempts to have her eat, as if she were a petulant child, refusing her supper. Miss Burney, when this arrangement was made, I swore to your father that I would feed and shelter you. Thus far, you are making me a liar in regard to one half of those matters. With a tight-lit smile, she nodded curtly. I do understand your predicament. She replied. But as you recall, I also swore to my father that I would ready your accounts for his return. I fear I did not realize just how much effort it would require. And you find taking meals with the household is distracting you from accomplishing this? Your grace, with all due respect, I am a fully grown woman, capable of deciding when to eat. I do not need you to govern me. He was not going to let Honora see the hurt in his eyes. I have no intention of governing you, Miss Burney. He said gruffly. But you are my responsibility. I take that responsibility quite seriously, and I will not have you wither away before my eyes. Honora could not resist chuckling. I assure you, Your Grace, I will not perish from malnutrition. I suggest you direct your energies elsewhere, somewhere more worthwhile. Have you any recommendations? Honora's mouth parted and her eyes narrowed at his cutting tone. Perhaps you should worry about my grandmother. She snapped before she could stop herself. You were so concerned she would die on your watch, and you have yet to bring in a physician to examine her. Or maybe you should worry about Abraham Borthwick who has taken up arms about having you displaced as Duke. She clamped her mouth shut quickly realizing she had gone too far as the duke's face turned ashen. Where did you hear that? He choked. 
Honora shook her head quickly and dropped her eyes, and racked with guilt, she stared at her pale hands. Forgive me, your grace. It is merely idle gossip. I should not have said anything. Idle gossip from whose mouth? It matters not, she insisted. It shall not happen, not when your debts are settled. There is no cause for such an action. It matters. He growled. It matters. He whirled on his heel, and Honora stared after him as he slumped and bowed his head. Please, your grace, I am contrary. Forget what I said. The duke peered over his shoulders and shook his head. I cannot, he sighed and she saw the tiredness in his eyes. It has been months and it remains, rearing its ugly head just when I think it is over. Honora twisted her fingers against the loops of her skirt. Since being in Blessington, she had continued to hear gossip about the Duke and his violent temper, his cruel nature, and what he had done to Sarah Borthwick. In the towns, Honora did not mention that she was a guest at Briar Hill, knowing that she would be tired with the same brush as her host, but the more she heard about the Duke, the stronger her doubts grew. Despite her determination to dislike him, she had not seen one indication of an abusive man, nor had he raised his voice to the servants. Or to me although I have given him several opportunities to do so. She reasoned that he could be hiding his dark side because he worried her father would learn about it. Yet, as the weeks passed, Honora could not reconcile that what the villagers seemed to believe had transpired between the duke and the fallen girl was not the truth. Still, he did make her pregnant and they are not married. Even if he is not violent, he is still not a man of virtue. They are merely words. Honora told him gently, stepping over the papers to close the short distance between them. Miss Borthwick's father is just as humiliated as she, to be sure. He is seeking justice anywhere but at home. The Duke studied her face closely, his eyes were less shadowed than they had seemed before. Perhaps. He replied softly. Perhaps. Their gaze is locked and Honora felt a slight flutter in her chest, but it was gone as he turned away again. Eat something. He called back to her before disappearing through the corridor. You have months to make sense of the mess my father left behind. Honora blinked. His father? She turned and slid back into the spot she had been sitting earlier, picked up the receipts and gasped when she put them down and read the dates. Stets are decades old. They were not solely accumulated by Duke Blessington himself. They were inherited. She was learning so much about the Duke, things which were overshadowing her earlier notions of who he was and of what he was capable. Suddenly a clearer picture of the man was emerging, one which she had not expected. I have been wrong about so much regarding the Duke. What else will I learn about him? She thought of him encouraging her to eat and her childish response to his concern. There was genuine sadness in his eyes when he heard about his former father-in-law to be. He is not some savage, some barbarian who enjoys asserting his power and was growing rich at the expense of others. There is a sensitive man inside that noble heart of his. Feeling ashamed, she lifted her head and stared toward the window. Dust motes were floating in the fading sun's rays, and she noticed it was late in the afternoon. I have been here all day again, she thought, sighing. Half an hour more and I will see to Grandmama's condition. She lowered her eyes back to the pile but found it difficult to concentrate on the work. Her mind was on Edward, the Duke of Blessington. As darkness threatened to spill into the study, Honora stood, her legs tingled slightly by the movement. She had extended her cut-off time by another half-hour. As she moved toward the foyer, she saw Susanna and Eliza lighting the candles placed throughout the halls. The younger maid eyed her warily but not Susanna, who continued on task ignoring Honora being there she figured her presence at Briar Hill unnerved Eliza, and perhaps she did not know what to make of her and Marjorie's arrival. Susanna seemed less concerned with them, however. Good evening, Miss Burney. The maids murmured in unison. Good evening. Honora brushed by them, paused and spun back around. Eliza? Yes, miss. I heard you speak of Abraham Borthwick yesterday. Honora said without preamble. 
The servant's face turned ashen and she tried to shake her kerchiefed head. You are in no trouble, Eliza, Honora assured her. I only wish to know the source of what you had heard. Is it true he is attempting to have the Duke displaced? Eliza panicked and looked at Susanna. I assure you, Eliza, this is between us, Honora promised. I will never mention this again. It is what I heard, Miss Burney, Eliza choked. I cannot say if it is gospel, but there is word that he is assembling a mob to present their case to the Crown. Honora nodded slowly. I see. He has no cause. They will be laughed out of court if they should ever make it that far. The Duke has no matter to concern himself. Thank you, Eliza. Good evening. She turned and stole up the stairs, her mind turning as she climbed. Something was nagging the edges of her heart, something she did not want to think about. If Abraham Borthwick was still seething in his anger strong enough to bring such a thing to the king, what would happen when Abraham was tossed from the palace walls? What would he do then? His rage would surely be inextinguishable. Unhand me, you brute. Marjorie's voice echoed through the halls. Grandmama? Honora cried while rushing toward her grandmother's apartment. Get your bloody hands off of me. You must stop struggling. A breathless voice shouted back and Honora's flesh exploded into a rash of goosebumps. Grandmama. Honora screamed throwing herself against the door. She fell breathlessly against the floor and stared up at the men inside her grandmother's chambers. Instantly, she jumped to her feet and rushed toward Marjorie's bedside. What is happening? she cried, looking from the duke to the stranger inside the room. What are you doing to her? All is well, Miss Burney. The duke assured her, gesturing toward the man. This is Dr. Morgan. Who asked him to come? Marjorie howled. The doctor tried to check her chest again, but she fought him off. I do not care for strangers poking and prodding at me. Honora looked at the Duke in shock, realizing that he had called for the doctor just after leaving her in the study. Stop it at once. Marjorie yelled. No, Grandmama, you must stop. Honora said, grabbing her hands. You must let the physician look at you. For what purpose? Marjorie howled. There is nothing amiss with me. That one is attempting to murder me. She pointed at the Duke and Honora sighed. No, Grandmama, he is not. He is trying his best for us and we must allow him. Marjorie eyed her suspiciously. Please, Grandmama, you must proceed with this exam. I asked the Duke to call the doctor. Why, child? She asked. I am well. I wish to ensure that. Honora replied softly, squeezing her crooked fingers gently. Please. For me? Begrudgingly, Marjorie nodded but shot a menacing glance at the doctor. Do be quick about it. She snapped and the physician nodded. Will you step back, my lady? The doctor asked and Honora did as requested, not bothering to correct him about the title. She and the Duke stepped from the apartment, leaving Marjorie to grumble. Thank you, your grace. Honora said, her eyes welling with gratitude as she looked up at him. I, I am very grateful for this. You are my responsibility. He answered simply, but Honora could see there was much more behind his actions. She nodded, meeting his eyes warmly. I have been concerned about her since the day we arrived. She admitted. She felt free of the weight on her chest now that she shared her burden aloud with him. She is willful, stubborn. I had not noticed. The Duke replied dryly, and Honora chuckled. We have not given you an easy time since our arrival. She murmured. And for that, I wish to apologize. You need not apologize, Miss Burney. You and your grandmother have been thrust into another home in another place. You are among strangers. It is still no excuse for petulance she demurred. I want to assure you that going forth, I will make an attempt to be more accommodating. I accept your attempts. They shared a smile and Honora's heart gladdened. Will you join us for supper tonight? 
he asked, Honora blushed as if he had asked her a more indecent question. Yes. I would enjoy that. His blue eyes lit up as if they had reached a truce after years at battle. Your grace, my lady. The physician appeared. When Honora noticed just how closely she was standing to the duke, she immediately stepped away. She was certain her cheeks were as red as the Queen Anne roses in the garden. What say you, Dr. Morgan? The duke asked. Honora was alarmed when she saw that the man shook his head slowly and hesitated before speaking. I fear it is not good news. He replied gravely. Mrs. Burney suffers from dropsy. Honora stared at him, aghast. That cannot be. She is walking about, eating, drinking. Her heart is weak. He sighed. And I fear her health will deteriorate quickly if she does not limit herself to bed rest. Honora stared at him. But she is well. For now. The doctor agreed. That may change at the drop of a hat. Thank you, doctor. The duke sighed. I will show you out. Honora watched the mamble toward the servant's stairwell, her heart thudding dangerously in her chest as she tried to make sense of what she had been told. Nora? Yes, Grandmama. She rushed inside the chambers and sat with her grandmother, willing her tears away. You must not fret, child. Marjorie told her, seizing her hands. You will not be rid of me for a long while, regardless of what that empiric says. Of course I know that, Grandmama. You are a good girl, Nora and it has always been my pleasure and pride to call you mine. Shh, Grandmama. Jay. Must rest now. You need not speak in such a manner. I will continue to be yours. Honora promised, stifling the sob catching in her voice. He is a good man the duke. I am beginning to believe so. Honora agreed. But no man is without flaws, child. She warned. You must approach this with caution. Honora's brow furrowed in confusion. Approach what? Marjorie laughed and closed her eyes. If you choose to be willfully blind, child, I cannot help you. Off you go. This old woman needs her rest. Honora rose, and studied her grandmother's face from the doorway. Approach the duke with caution? What does that mean? I do believe I asked for peace. Marjorie yelled without opening her eyes and Honora giggled. Yes, Grandmama. Chapter 9 It was well after midnight when Edward returned to Briar Hill. His last recollection of the hour was hearing the church bells chiming in Bristol to announce his departure from the final interviews. That had been an hour and a quarter earlier, but it seemed much later in the night somehow. The meetings had depleted him of all his energy and he felt he had been awake for days. I dare say, these gatherings are becoming less useful and more tedious than I ever recall. Benedict commented. The coach and six passed through the archway of the manor house and stopped before the entranceway. The statement mimicked Edward's thoughts precisely. For his part, Edward was in no great rush to see the inside of the house, his body limp with exhaustion. He had made himself quite comfortable against the high seats and was reluctant to move from his spot. The trot of the horses was lulling him into a sense of calm. He wholeheartedly agreed with his advisor's assessment of the evening. It seemed that they accomplished little more than watching the neighbouring dukes fall deeply into their cups, discussing lewd topics and were no better than the lower classes of whom they claimed higher standing. It made for uncomfortable conversation, ones which Edward had nothing of his own to contribute, but the monthly interviews were scheduled by the Crown and attendance was mandatory. His absence would be noted and commented upon. Edward did not need to be the subject of more rumours. It was his duty to meet with the neighbouring duchies despite the trivial nature of the convergences. Perhaps. Edward replied in response to Benedict's observation. We should be grateful that we are no longer the brunt of their idle chatter, however. Not blatantly. Benedict agreed. But who can say what is said in the privacy of their own homes? I could not care less what they fudge about in my absence. 
Edward replied firmly as the coachman opened the door for them to exit the cab. I have more than enough to concern myself with at Briar Hill than the gossip of nobility. Our debtors are paid, our duchy saved. Tis what we have aspired toward for years. Let them blather until they are fatigued from speaking. I hope their throats grow chaffed, he added silently but kept his personal misgivings to himself. Speaking ill of his peers would not better his situation after all. Edward was unsure if he was convinced by his own strong words, but he knew he could not continue to trouble himself with what may or may not be said beyond his ear's reach. It was fresh in his mind that he had come too close to losing everything and that his newfound breaths of ease might be premature, but he intended to enjoy at least this fleeting sense of comfort he felt. That is a very sound manner of seeing things. Benedict commented dryly. If only it was so simple. It is. Edward retorted, determined not to allow his friend's words of caution create any more doubt in his mind. He had been shadowed with unrest for far too long. A moment's reprieve from matters was not asking for much. Edward. The men stood in the dimly lit foyer as the coachman led the carriage toward the stable houses. The Duke turned to his friend curiously, detecting the note of concern in his voice. Break time equals 1,000 milliseconds the Duke asked reluctantly. He sensed the seriousness in the mere way Benedict said his name. I have a rather delicate matter to discuss with you. Edward groaned inwardly. It must wait, Carter. I cannot deal with another matter this evening. I long for nothing but a cup of warm milk and honey at my bedside. Tis of great importance. Edward eyed him, weighing his decision, but before he could respond, the movement of a body caught his attention in the long hallway through his peripheral vision. Honora appeared from the shadows. Her dark green eyes were nearly black in the dim lighting, and they widened in shock as they fell upon the men. Oh! Honora gasped, equally surprised to see the men as they were to see her. Forgive the intrusion, Your Grace, Mr. Carter. The hour is quite late, Miss Burney. Are you well? Is there an issue with Mrs. Burney? Edward asked, instantly worried. Ever since drive. Morgan's visit, he had kept a close eye on the headstrong elder who seemed determined to undermine the physician's orders of bed rest and would sneak about the manor like a mischievous child and not a grandmother of two and sixty. To his relief, Honora shook her head quickly. No, all is well, your grace. She assured him quickly. I was merely unable to sleep. I did not realize you were due home this evening. Edward chuckled dryly. I oft suffer from insomnia myself. He replied. Albeit this night, I do not believe I will be met with any problems finding slumber. She wrapped her arms about her small frame nervously, and for the first time, the Duke caught on she donned nothing more than her night clothes. He shifted his eyes toward Benedict who had already averted his gaze respectfully away from her. Good night, Your Grace, Mr. Carter. Good night. They chorused uncomfortably, pretending not to watch the comely merchant's daughter as she stole quickly up the stairwell toward her chambers. Edward knew he should not stare, but he could not keep his eyes from travelling toward the top landing, even though he knew she had disappeared into the darkness and away from his view. I can see why you fancy her. Benedict remarked. She is quite an article, is she not? Edward glanced at his adviser warily. He detected something more to his statement than was directly said. Indeed. He agreed, a certain flatness to his response. He felt oddly disloyal discussing Honora Burney, even with his closest companion although he could not say why. She is much more than a fine article. She is unlike any woman I have known. Edward did not bother to explain his sentiments to his companion. Whether due to exhaustion or simple protectiveness, he could not be sure. Yet, Benedict was not done with the matter. Perhaps she would make you a good match, Eddie. 
He turned to look at Benedict suspiciously. Is that so? He asked slowly. What makes you say so? Benedict exhaled and gestured for the Duke to follow him further into the house. Reluctantly, Edward followed, his eyes gritty. He did not wish to delve much into Benedict's thoughts that night, but he could see he had little choice. If I do not hear what he has to say, I will be up all night wondering regardless. It is best I deal with this now. Inside the library, Benedict lit the candles and gestured for the Duke to sit. Sighing deeply, Edward sank into a winged back chair, watching Benedict's face expectantly. He realized that even the servants had not been roused by their arrival. The entire world is asleep at this moment, all but Carter and myself. He yawned rudely, hoping to move matters along. I have received disturbing news, Eddie. Benedict told him, a grave expression upon his face. I feel that you should hear of it before you are blindsided. Edward tensed, his fine jaw locking at the words. Why am I not surprised? There is nothing ever but bad tidings which surround me. What is it now? Abraham Borthwick has been scheming an uprising. He wants you displaced as Duke of Blessington. Edward scoffed slightly. Tis hardly news, Carter. It has been his position for months now or have you forgotten? I have not forgotten. Benedict sighed. I fear you have underestimated his fury. He seeks vengeance for Sarah and he will not rest until he is satisfied. Carter, tis been a long day. Is there a purpose to you stating the perfectly obvious? The adviser seemed annoyed by Edward's short reply, but he masked his irritation well. Bothwick has arranged to be heard tomorrow at court. He has men among him who support his cause. The cause to have me displaced? Edward choked. Which men? It does not matter. Benedict explained quickly. He will be dismissed from court without being heard, now that you have paid your debts, but I fear that it will not be the end of it. Of course it will not be. Edward spat, rising to pace about the wood floors. The weight of his body caused the floorboards to creak. He will not give up. Benedict continued, if his meaning was not clear already. Moreover, he has acquired a small army of men who deem you unfit to rule the duchy. There must be a reason for you bringing this to me in the dead of night when I would have already enjoyed a perfectly pleasant sleep without such a tale. Edward grumbled. I believe you must take countermeasures. Benedict explained and Edward paused to stare at him inquisitively. Countermeasures? You speak as if we are sincerely at war. This is nothing more than the futile attempts of a misguided father to restore his daughter's honor. The moment he recruited more men to his cause, this became a war. Benedict offered quietly. It has been six months and he is unrelenting, Edward. If Sarah does not do her part and call him away from the havoc he is attempting, you will continue to suffer. Edward was immediately reminded of the image of Sarah's gaunt and terrified face. Sarah is not up for debate. The Duke said gruffly. She has entrusted me with something personal and I will not betray her confidence. What do you propose in regards to Abraham? I propose you tell him the truth about his daughter. Benedict growled, but before Edward could contest, the adviser continued. However, I would say you have made your position on the matter quite clear. So I have another solution. Edward waited, his metallic eyes shining with interest. You should marry at once. Benedict explained. Without a long engagement, without preamble or showmanship. Simply find a woman and extend her jointure to yours. A beam of true amusement exploded over Edward's lips and he reclaimed his spot in the velvet chair, sitting back. Oh, is that your recommendation? He asked, snickering. Pray tell, Carter, how did you come up with such a stunningly ridiculous idea? 
Benedict scowled while folding his arms defiantly over his chest. Eddie, you do not seem to be heeding my warnings. Abraham Borthwick is determined to ruin you at any cost. You must secure your position within the duchy. No longer entertained by the conversation, Edward snapped, My position is secure. Our debts are at bay and I am the third Duke of Blessington. No man is going to simply take that from me. Edward. Benedict sighed, keeping his tone in check with great difficulty. You are being naive if you believe you are infallible. The crown will do what best keeps the peace. If the king senses unrest in Blessington, he will do what it takes to ensure order. And you believe a marriage will put his majesty's mind at ease? Yes. Benedict replied. It shows stability and commitment to the duchy in the wake of a terrible scandal. Should you marry a woman of high standing with good familial ties, all will be forgotten. The men who have joined with Borthwick will think twice if it means more wealth in the towns. Surely you can see that. Edward studied him pensively for a long moment, his pulse quickened when he registered Benedict may have a valid point of argument. Then he chuckled. What amuses you so? The adviser asked curtly, and Edward shook his head. I admit that you may have a perfectly viable thought. He conceded. But you appear to have forsaken one crucial element. Benedict's dark blonde eyebrow raised uncertain of the reason. What would that be? Who in God's name will be willing to marry me? Even speaking the question aloud gave Edward sharp pangs in his chest. His reputation had been so badly sullied that he could not imagine anyone but a commoner would be willing to marry him, even in his position as a duke. No father would send his daughter into the arms of a man they believed to be abusive and cruel, especially not one who had already deflowered a woman and left her dishonored and unwed. Marrying a commoner would not help sway the favor of the district. He would need to marry well to keep the crown contented. You truly do not give me enough credit. Benedict grumbled, and Edward's eyes widened with interest. Have you already someone in mind? He asked, and Benedict nodded. But of course. Tis why you employ me, is it not? Sometimes I am unsure why I keep you. Edward chuckled. Carry on then, Carter. What have you in mind? Benedict averted his eyes and offered, I am thinking someone wealthy who will be accepted among the commoners as well as the noble classes. I dare say I would like very much to meet such a woman. Next you will be telling me this fabled woman is comely and full of wit. Edward chortled. Indeed, she is. Oh come now, Carter. Out with it. Who would you have me marry? No more jesting about. Benedict looked at him finally. Honora Burney? He replied, and Edward's heart skipped a bit as he gaped in shock. Why did I not realize that was who he was speaking of? I truly must be tired. Her father is one of the most powerful merchants in all of London. Benedict explained quickly. His wealth and influence is renowned all over the continent and beyond. A match like this would be fruitful for the duchy. It will alleviate the vitriol spread among the villagers regarding your character, and she will be well received by all the people. Edward nodded. That familiar flutter sensation was forming in his stomach. And at this very moment he suddenly understood that he would be a fool to deny that his attraction to Honora was mounting daily. As for William Burney, Benedict continued. He has already consented to leaving Honora in your care. He will undoubtedly be thrilled to marry his daughter into a noble family. Perhaps that was even what he had in mind when he sent her here. Yes. He whispered. I believe you are right. Moreover. Benedict added quietly. Should the crown ever learn of the deal you enacted with Bernie, it will not seem so untoward given the familial ties. The business venture had not occurred to Edward, but he had to admit that Benedict was correct. There were myriad benefits to such a union, 
none more so than the idea of waking next to the lovely Honora every morning. He widened his eyes and slowly grinned from ear to ear just envisioning the possibilities. I believe you have outdone yourself with this, Carter. Edward said jovially. You continue to earn your keep. Benedict appeared placated by the Duke's response. His face visibly relaxing against the dim light and a smile appeared. Excellent. I will see to the arrangements then. Edward sat, staring blankly at his friend as he began to prattle on about the impending wedding bans and ceremony to follow but the Duke barely heard a word. He was going to marry Honora Burney. Edward could not recall a time when he had felt more elated. Chapter 10 Honora sat in the courtyard, watching the deer that came to feed on the outskirts of the tree line. It was something she had made a ritual of doing every morning since arriving at Briar Hill, almost six weeks earlier. More or less every day, the family of deer would appear, nibbling delicately on the grass, watching her from a cautious distance, and she would feel her heart swell. This is not a sight I would oft see in London, even in the country home. Too much has been raised away for the woodland creatures to approach, she thought wistfully, and when she returned home, she would miss this morning ritual. She had finally completed the task of sorting through the endless piles of paperwork for her father and made notes of what she believed needed to be done. There were so many discrepancies, so much bad business within the walls of that study, and Honora could hardly believe that the Duke had managed to sustain the Duchy as long as he had. What kind of father leaves such chaos for his child to withstand? And the second Duke of Blessington was ill. He knew he was going to leave his accompts in such a state for his son. What a cruel thing to do. Honora was both sickened by the late Duke's actions and simultaneously relieved to know her father would never do anything so careless or harrowing. She acknowledged that her findings helped make her regard Edward quite differently. After combing through the receipts and ledgers, she deduced that he was not to blame for what had happened to the Duchy's finances. Laboriously, Honora was lowering her guard toward the Duke, and frequently wondered if all she had heard was not simple conjecture or hearsay. Of course, she had never spoken directly to the Duke about what she had heard, reasoning that it was none of her business, not truly. She was merely a guest at Briar Hill until her father returned and then she would return to London, rarely, if ever, to see the Duke again. She wondered why the thought saddened her. As if summoned by her notions, his voice filled her ears, but not loudly enough to scare away the nervous herd on the lee. It is quite lovely out here in the daylight, is it not? She turned to see the Duke had slipped from the back doors to join her beneath the wisteria. At the beginning of her stay at Briar Hill, the Duke had come on occasion to take his tea or breakfast in the misty light of dawn with her, but Honora oft excused herself from his company until he eventually stopped. That had been before he had sent for the doctor to diagnose Marjorie, or before they had begun having meals together when Edward was at the manor house and not in the towns on business. On this morning, she did not move to leave him alone on the lawn. She was pleasantly surprised to see him there. It truly is. She agreed, tilting her head upward to smile at him. I was thinking how I will long for the sight of this when I return to London. He met her eyes and smiled, simply savouring the memory. May I sit, Miss Burney? Please, Your Grace. He joined her at the white-painted garden table and set his saucer upon the surface. You will be returning to London then? He asked. I will wait for my father to return from his journey as requested. She sighed. I fear the travel will be too much for my grandmother given her frail state, although by the volume of her complaining, no one would ever know she was ill. She did not add that she was rather enjoying the peace of Briar Hill. With the Duchy's accompts fulfilled, she could concentrate on the business from the remote area of the countryside as per her father's instructions. Honora had little opportunity to visit the towns and she had hoped to gain momentum among the duchy for chances to explore before William's return. She wanted her father to know she would continue to grow the business, despite his refusal to permit her to travel any longer. If I do well enough, 
He may change his mind and allow me to journey with him again but first I must prove myself. I am happy to have you here. The Duke offered unexpectedly. She raised her head to peer at him through the lip of her simple, white bonnet. A warm flush tinged her cheeks when his sparkling eyes met hers. Your hospitality has been most kind, Your Grace. My grandmother and I appreciate all you have done to make Briar Hill feel like a home for us. I am certain your grandmother prefers her own bed, but I hope your stay has been at least satisfactory. He thought about Marjorie's endless complaints, and chuckled. You must forgive my grandmother. Honora sighed. She means not what she says, I assure you. We are both grateful for your graciousness. Honora had apologized for her grandmother more times than she could possibly count. The oldest Bernie was endlessly bickering and attempting to flee the sanctuary of her room. Honora had resorted to having Eliza sit with Marjorie lest she injure herself on one of her many escapades to be defiant. It was exhausting. I cannot imagine how women do this with bantlings all the day, she thought with exasperation, knowing Marjorie was acting no better than a spoiled child. You need not apologize for Mrs. Bernie. The Duke smiled. I quite admire her tenacity. She refuses to succumb to her frailties. Tis because she disputes having any. Honora muttered. She will not admit to the dropsy. Edward leaned forward and nodded in agreement. I imagine it is difficult to have someone tell us that we cannot do something which we have been doing our whole lives. Honora thought of what her father had told her in Spain, ending her exotic life of traveling the high seas and exploring the world. She remembered how deeply it had affected her and her immediate reaction to being told such a thing. She paused, gazed upon his pained expression, and felt his. Of course. It is no different than what I experienced. How did I not see it before? She nodded slowly and acknowledged the connection. She wondered what Edward knew about such loss. Perhaps the dukedom itself was something he had and was then abruptly taken from him, if not figuratively speaking. He was bequeathed a failing duchy when he was barely old enough to man such a task. He likely lived his entire boyhood with great ideas regarding his future but his father stole it away from under him. She felt a pang of sympathy, but she maintained the stoic expression on her face, lest he pick it up. She was still uncertain what to make of him. The stories of what had happened to Sarah Borthwick still weighed heavily on her. Indeed, Your Grace. She murmured. You are quite right. His smile broadened, apparently not sensing her pity toward him. Regardless. The Duke continued. I am pleased you have decided to stay, despite Mrs. Bernie's health issues. It does make Briar Hill a brighter place and I hope to learn much from you. Honora looked away so he would not see the blush on her face, and how she was uncharacteristically lost for words. Shame on you, she chided herself, then willed herself to pick up her teacup and place the liquid to her lips, thus filling the silence awkwardly. May I ask a rather bold question, Miss Bernie? Of course, Your Grace. She replied, almost too quickly, as she replaced the cup upon its saucer. She was thankful he adopted to speak first. Even an uncomfortable inquiry was better than a charged quiet. How have you not married? Oh. She gasped. It was indeed a bold question and one which was none of his business. Instantly, she was on guard of the man and she wished he had not asked. Forgive the bluntness but I find it difficult to understand that a woman of your status and charms is without a husband. Surely you have had suitors? Honora's body stiffened and she was smote with a sense that the question was not one of idleness. What does he want? She wondered warily and faked a serene expression upon her face. Is he attempting to gauge that I am of easy virtue or none at all? She felt prickles up and down her backbone but she willed herself not to speak out of turn. 
The man was our host and a nobleman. She was forced to watch her tongue. I cannot say, Your Grace. My father's business has taken me abroad with such frequency, I dare say any husband would find such a commitment difficult to say the least. She wondered if he could hear the slight bitterness in her tone. But I understand your days of travel are finished now. You are to remain in England and oversee the business, are you not? There was a definitive pointedness in his asking and Honora struggled to keep her composure, although she felt the heat of anger flushing through her. The business is still quite a commitment, your grace, whether here or abroad. It was difficult for her to keep the ice from her tone, but he did not seem to pick up on it, not yet. You have not entertained the idea of marriage then? He seemed shocked at the notion of an attractive, wealthy girl not throwing herself into marriage at first offer. Honora cast him a defiant look, her squinted eyes and her mouth pulled into a fine line. I have no use for marriage. She answered before she could stop herself. I am wealthy in my own right. I need not a husband to care for me. He seemed stunned by the response, he realized he had upset her. Forgive me, Miss Burney. He said, his face visibly paling. I have pried into your reasonings enough. He stood abruptly, his legs touching the edge of the wrought iron table and causing their cups to spill. This reaction only fueled Honora's annoyance, but she said nothing as he disappeared back into the house, leaving her staring at her hands now clenched against the soft white of her cotton gown. The gall of him, she thought furiously. Because he is noble and in business with my father, he believes he can act as matchmaker for me. When Papa returns, I will mention this trespass. No sooner did she have the thought did she dismiss it. Her father's own intentions were not shielded either. He had plainly said that he wished Honora to find a suitor although he did not force the issue. Perhaps William had even asked the Duke for suggestions of eligible bachelors for her to wed. The idea that the two men might be working together without her knowledge enraged her fearsomely. I was beginning to like the Duke, she thought miserably. But he is just like all the other men I have known. He was shocked to think I might live my life without a husband. Lord forbid. A spinster. Is there a fouler word in all the English language? Steadying her nerves with deep breaths, Honora too, rose from the garden table and saw the deer had fled, no doubt upset by the clattering of the teacups. As she moved back toward the house to pay mine to her grandmother, Honora could not help wondering who the Duke had in mind for her to marry. Perhaps I will ask him, she thought with some contempt, but she knew she would not. The matter had been dealt with for the time and she doubted Edward would revisit the issue, at least not until her father returned. Then I will return to London and forget about the Duke and his antediluvian ways. Chapter 11 Your Grace, this has come for you by messenger. Susanna announced. Edward glanced up from his desk and reached for the sealed envelope in her hand. His gut lurched when he recognized the king's press. Thank you, Susanna. He sighed and sank back against the chair to stare at the creamy packaging. Sent for Mr. Carter. At once, your grace. She left him alone in the study to ponder the significance of the message in his hand. Inherently, he knew it had something to do with Abraham Borthwick's visit to Parliament the previous day. Benedict had already confirmed that the King did not hear Borthwick's complaint and that he had been escorted from the building without being heard. But that did not mean Edward would not deal with the repercussions of unrest within his district. He was reluctant to open the letter before his adviser arrived, but the curiosity was getting the better of him. He reached for a letter opener to see what lay ahead for him. Inhaling sharply, he read the words and then cast the page aside as if it burned him. It was a reprimand from the Viceroy, ordering him to get his affairs in order before a direct visit was arranged. It was hardly a veiled threat, but rather a foreshadow of what was to come if Abraham Borthwick continued on his path of vengeance. 
Benedict appeared at the ajar door of the study, his blue eyes unblinking. You wished to see me? The viceroy has scolded me like a bantling. Edward grumbled and nodded toward the discarded letter. I must do something about Borthwick before he does more damage. Ah, well, twas to be expected. He replied. He picked up the message and scanned it quickly with a frown on his pale face. Yes, but that does not make me rest with more ease in the night. Edward replied. He must be stopped, that man. My patience has expired on his grieving period. You are well aware of my take on the situation, Eddie. You must dash. As you say. Edward interjected, not wishing to hear Benedict's opinion once more. I am quite well aware of your take. You must see this marriage through. Benedict urged. It will afford you sympathy, even likability among the people. There is little I can do until William Burney returns from the Orient, Carter. You must be patient. Benedict snickered as if Edward spoke in absurdities. Patience is not something we have the benefit of at this point. He reminded Edward. You must do something before Abraham pursues this madness. Edward looked at his friend, knowing that Benedict said the truth. What has Miss Burney said of the impending nuptials? Benedict asked, and the Duke grimaced. He had tried not to think of the conversation he had shared with Honora the previous morning. It seemed she had deliberately avoided him, holing herself up in her chambers or her grandmother's and refusing to take meals with him again as she had when she arrived. It had never occurred to him that Honora would be steadfastly against the idea of marriage, but she did have a sound justification. Indeed, for what did she need a husband? She was the heir to her father's merchant business, a trade which was certainly more forgiving of her sex than others. She had all she required at the tips of her fingers without the benefit of marriage. Still, Edward had never known a woman of any class who did not wish to marry and serve her husband. He grudgingly admitted that the information only fueled his interest in Honora. It made him want for her more, but he dared not push the issue lest he upset her again. He needed time to understand how to change her mind on the matter of marriage. That is another problem. Edward explained, and Benedict sucked in a mouthful of air. What sort of problem? The sort where she has no interest in marriage. Benedict laughed heartily. You mean she is leery of your reputation? He offered, but Edward shook his head. Nay, I mean she has no desire to wed anyone. Benedict seemed just as perplexed as Edward had been. With all respect due to you, Eddie, she must have simply said such foolishness as a manner of dissuading you from pursuing her because she is wary of your history. Every woman wishes to marry. I would wager my life upon it. Edward shrugged and sat back again, leaning heavily against the chair. Perhaps, albeit she did not know I have planned to ask her father for her hand. Benedict's mouth parted slightly but nothing emitted from his lips, he was digesting the words carefully. Finally, he merely shook his blonde head. It matters not. He assured Edward. Truly, it will be the decision of her father, and William Burney already seems to like you, despite what he has heard. I dare say he sent his daughter here with a courtship in his mind. I had thought the same. Edward admitted. He did not say it aloud, but he had a terrible sense of foreboding asking William Burney about wedding his daughter when Honora had made her feelings quite clear. If he asked William Burney and the man agreed, which Edward was quite certain he would, the Duke would be dishonouring his daughter's wishes by going through with the marriage. However, if Burney said no, and he managed to sway Honora into the favour of a union, they would need to persuade the merchant. There was no easy solution to the issue. The only way it could work would be if Edward convinced Honora that they should marry before Burney returned in six weeks. If the man saw his daughter was willing to entertain the idea of a suitor, 
he would be softer to the notion of permitting them both to wed. Yes, that was the only way without forcing Honora into a union and ensure that William Burney would approve. I must win her over and show her that marriage is in her best interest. Edward, I do loathe when you get that gleam in your eyes, dear boy. Benedict sighed. What have you? Not a thing. Edward assured him quickly and pushed the thought of his impending troubles aside. We will go through with this wedding, God willing. God willing. Benedict murmured. Why do I sense we are venturing into a storm? Possibly because we are endlessly battling storms. Benedict snorted in his usual fashion, but there was an underlying amusement in the noise. Perhaps for once the heavens will open up and smile upon us. Perhaps they already have. Edward diverted his attention to the ajar door of the study where Honora had slid past in his peripheral view. It was the first time he had caught a glimpse of her since their awkward discussion the day before. Oddly, he felt relieved simply seeing her long skirts sweep by. Her presence in the manor house had changed the ambience of the usually gloomy walls. Her mere aura had lifted the low-hanging shadows which had existed for as long as he could recall. As long as she remains in Briar Hill, she is not lost, he assured himself, but as he thought it, he wondered, perhaps he was the one who was lost without her nearby. The afternoon light had faded before Honora retreated from her grandmother's room. She did not immediately see him standing in the dimness, lounged casually against the panels beneath a floral print. The painting added the proper splash of color to the walls on what would otherwise be a rather morose hallway. Good evening, Miss Burney. Honora yelped in surprise and spun to gape at him. Her hand flew over her mouth to stifle the silliness of her response, a blush tickling her cheeks. Your Grace. She choked. W. What are you doing in the shadows? Waiting for you to join me for supper. He replied smoothly. I feel that we have not seen one another since our unfortunate conversation yesterday. She paused and eyed him warily, an action which bothered him somehow. She acts as if I am a wolf attempting to eat her for supper. As you wish, your grace. She replied dutifully, then turned in the opposing direction than she was headed. I do not wish to impose upon you, Miss Burney. He told her, suddenly feeling foolish for his unexpected appearance. It was a clumsy attempt at chivalry, but he was much out of practice. Not at all, your grace. She replied politely, but Edward could hear the strain in her voice. It would be my honor to join you. Has Mrs. Burney eaten? He asked. Perhaps if she is feeling well enough, she could join us also. Grandmama has only just fallen asleep. I read to her until she finally forsakes the struggle and gives into slumber. Edward could not help chuckling at the thought of Marjorie Burney fighting off sleep as a colicky infant might. Birth and near death are not unalike, he amused a twinge of sadness touching his heart as he connected the similarities between the very old and the painfully young. Are you coming, your grace? Edward looked up and saw that Honora had continued to the top landing and waited for him to rejoin her. Indeed. Together, they descended the steps in silence with Honora's delicate hand tracing the intricate wood of the banister. Edward was entranced with the long, slender fingers dancing just over the wood. He marveled that someone who seemed so frail on some levels could simultaneously be strong and determined. He thought of the elderly woman asleep above their heads, and he smiled. I imagine the bloodline is strong along the Burney women. Is something amusing, your grace? Edward was unaware he was smiling so broadly but his beam did not falter as a butler shuffled forward to pull Honora's chair. Edward diplomatically waved him away and did it himself. I was wondering what your mother was like, Miss Burney. He replied. 
She seemed perplexed by his question while she allowed him to set her toward the table. My mother? She echoed, her brow furrowing as if the query was queer. How do you mean, your grace? Was she much like you or was she dot less confident in herself? He took his spot at the head of the table and watched as her jade eyes narrowed, just trying to judge if he was asking to be crass. He hoped she did not think of him in such a way. I barely recall. Honora answered, and there was a heavy truth in her voice. I was merely a girl when she passed. It seems like quite a lifetime ago now. Edward's smile wavered when he saw the topic caused her great pain. It was not what he had intended when he roused the subject. His aim was to bond with her, not alienate her further. I haven't the foggiest notion of how to deal with such a woman. She is nothing like the vapid, silly noble women I have known nor is she hard and skeptical like the commoners. She is simply different than anyone I have ever encountered. Forgive me, Miss Burney. He said softly. I genuinely wish to know from where you gathered your seemingly endless courage. I admire you in many ways. Admire me? She scoffed. Why do I feel as if you think I should mind my place in society? Instantly, her face colored crimson and she lowered her eyes in shame. Forgive me, your grace. She murmured. I, forgive me. He studied her silently as the servants hovered nearby waiting for instruction. Leave us. He ordered and without ado, the staff dispersed. Honora remained staring at the plates before her, cheeks stained with humiliation and he could see she was stifling the urge to speak freely. I could not begin to guess where your place in society might be. He offered her quietly. For truly, I have never met another quite like you. She raised her head slowly, but she did not speak. My family is of a regal line. He continued, his stomach twisting as he spoke, the words forming faster than he could utter them forth. Yet, there is nothing noble about their actions. My father, as you have already learned, was selfish at best, incorrigible at worst. He did not care what became of me any more than he did my mother before. He trailed off unsure if he could speak the words aloud. It had been many years since he had spoken about his mother. As Honora had said of her own mother, it felt that he knew her a lifetime ago. The cold, unloving woman had become a thespian he had once seen in a theatrical production. He thought whatever connection he had shared with her had been buried along with her memory, but a wave of bile rose into his throat. Your Grace? Honora's voice was a whisper as she waited for him to carry on. My mother vanished one day without a word nor a trace. He explained. There were rumors of her untimely demise by my father's hand, but I believe she disappeared with a stable hand who also failed to report for his duties. Her face spoke volumes, the sick and woe flowing toward him in palpable waves. He regretted having disclosed something so personal to her, but he wanted her to understand that what she saw and what she had heard were not the same as the reality. Their eyes met. Edward wanted to tear his gaze away but could not. He willed her to speak, to say something which would depress the pressure in his chest. The silence between them grew awkward, and Edward felt his hands close into fists. He planted the soles of his shoes against the floor, preparing to spring from the table and flee from her pitying yet horrified eyes. Honora sensed the shift in conversation and spoke quickly. My mother? She breathed. Her name was Lenora. His heart stood still as she slowly lowered her lashes to partially block the green of her irises without fully averting her gaze. From what I remember, she was strong. Sensing his propensity to explode, she rushed on. But she was not strong enough. His curiosity overrode his rising regret and diminished his impulse to walk away from the dining room. How do you mean? Honora smiled mirthlessly. She is not here, is she? How strong could she be? Once more, their eyes locked and Edward was consumed with a newfound understanding of the woman facing him. She hurt as deeply as he did. 
Her desire to remain strong stemmed from a deep-rooted pain, a fear of being abandoned. It was one he comprehended all too well for he fought against that demon every day of his life. Well. He sighed, unfurling his fists and placing his palms on the surface of the table. It appears that we have more in common than I initially believed, Miss Burney. Indeed, your grace. She murmured, and while Edward did not see her face, he could hear the timbre of her voice. She was equally as uncertain about what just transpired between them as he was. Shall we eat? He offered brightly. Yes, please. She replied, relief tinting her words. Chapter 12 They did not speak of their lost mothers again after that night, but both Honora and Edward had to admit something had changed in the way they looked at one another. Honora was sure that she had misjudged the Duke. She was embarrassed she had heeded the word of gossips. While she had never come forth and asked for an explanation regarding the situation with Sarah Borthwick, she knew enough about this man to see he was not as cruel a person as he had been depicted. She could not envision him raising his voice, let alone his fist to a woman. Moreover, I should not be questioning his history when it is none of my concern. We all have secrets which we would rather not like brought to the surface. If he chooses to bury his past, that is his choice. However, she was ashamed for even wondering why she had permitted herself to think so poorly of a man she had never met. It was unlike Honora to react in such a way. Perhaps it was my experience with noblemen in the past which made me so quick to judge. I have only encountered the terribly foppish. Edward is anything but such a man. He is kind and seemingly without the prejudices and ego of others in his position. Her ears warmed as it dawned on her she was thinking of him as Edward. She pushed the silent slip aside and entered her grandmother's apartment quietly. Why are you blushing? Marjorie asked sharply. Honora paused mid-step, her mouth fell open at the observation. I am not. She denied. She turned her head slightly hoping her sandy strands of hair would cover her face. Of course. The long braid slung over her shoulder did nothing to stop Marjorie's piercing eyes from examining her with careful scrutiny. You are. She cackled softly. Your cheeks are as pink as a summer rose, child. Come hither. Reluctantly, Honora drew closer and perched on the edge of her grandmother's soft mattress as Marjorie struggled to sit up. Have you been spending time with the Duke? The question was far too direct for Honora's liking, but she dared not lie to her grandmother. Even if she was of a mind to do such a thing, Marjorie would not accept a fib. She was far too seasoned a woman and knew her granddaughter much too well. We have been spending time together, yes. Honora explained, quickly adding, as is natural when we reside in such close quarters. Marjorie howled with laughter, her face turning red with the effort close quarters. She chuckled. I dare say I go an entire day without seeing one of you. That is due to your bedridden status, Grandmama. Honora reminded her, feeling the heat grow hotter in her complexion. Tis much more difficult to avoid one another when there is business to be conducted. Ah, yes. Marjorie said, settling back to study Honora with inquisitive eyes. How is the business faring in Blessington? Honora sensed that her grandmother had a very good idea how it fared, despite her inquiry. How can she possibly know the comings and goings of this household when she is confined to her chambers? She wondered, but she dared not ask. Honora suspected her grandmother had been sneaking through the halls of Briar Hill at night, nosing about without shame. I have made contact with the local merchants. Honora replied although she suspected her grandmother already knew what she had been doing. I did not wish to approach without forewarning them of our intentions here. And how was that received? Honora frowned at the memory. As well as can be expected. She replied while thinking of the leers and smirks she had been given. Perhaps Honora had expected that the Bernie reputation precedes itself in the duchy but she had been greeted with contempt and outward dismissal when she explained her intentions to sell within the district. No one thought much of a woman, even one who was clearly wealthy, attempting to do business among them. 
You must not let the foolish dissuade you. Marjorie told her sternly. You have grown spoiled working in London. You forget that not all men have the liberal ideas that Londoners have adopted. I have not grown spoiled. Do not become defensive, Nora. I am on the same side as you. Your father may have left us here like some orphans at a nunnery, but I am still your grandmother. Tis my duty to protect you. A fusion of contrition and concern touched on Nora's heart, and she instantly softened. Papa did not leave us here, Grandmama. She said softly. He will be returning in only a few weeks. In the meanwhile, tis your duty to rest and be well, and not fret about me. You speak a good deal, child, just as Willie does. Honora tried to stifle a smile but was unsuccessful. You may find this amusing now, Nora, but I assure you, when you are met with the woes the men in this duchy will bestow upon you, tears will abound. Grandmama, you need not worry about me. She offered gently. I have dealt with many men who would sooner have me made into a wife than a business associate. Be sure that does not occur, Nora, for once you lose your sense of self with a property label upon your finger, there will be no recovery from that. Your mother learned that with much difficulty. Honoro stared at her father's mother for a long while, attempting to make sense of the warning she was uttering. Is she telling me to beware of the Duke or men as a whole? Or is she merely disillusioned in her fragile state? Perhaps I should call upon Drive. Morgan again. As if reading her thoughts, Marjorie spoke again. I was under the impression that the Duke was to be learning the business from you. Honora blinked uncomprehendingly at the shift in conversation. I, well, yes. What of it? Have you brought him into the towns with you while you make your presence known? No. Why would I? It has nothing to do with sales. When I have established a rapport among the vendors and townsfolk, I will permit him to accompany me. Marjorie's pale lips became a faint smile. Possibly at the wording Honora used, but the girl had no way of knowing how the wheels of her grandmother's mind worked. For credibility, child. No one will take your arrival seriously without the backing of important figures. Despite his somewhat tarnished reputation, the Duke is still a Duke. I do not need to hide behind the name of the Duke to ensure our business thrives in Blessington. Honoro snapped with much more ire than she had intended but Marjorie seemed unperturbed by her outburst. The Bernie name holds its own water, Grandmama. I will not use the Duke to bring us business. In fact, Honora had purposely left Edward behind so that people would not make the mistake of believing he was the proprietor. She wanted to make her position abundantly clear to anyone who looked. You say that now? Marjorie murmured. But when you are dismissed as insignificant, remember what I proposed. Honora rose from the bed, annoyed that she had let her grandmother affect her in such a way. She is without entertainment and seeking a way to cause mischief, she thought, leaning forward to kiss the old woman's hand. I will send Eliza in to sit with you. She said. And I shall come to see you when I return from the towns. Indeed. Marjorie murmured, closing her eyes as if their brief conversation had already exhausted her. It was not yet eight o'clock in the morning. Good day, Grandmama. Marjorie muttered something incoherent, and Honora turned away, her heart galloping. Her grandmother's words had bothered her a great deal. Grandmama is wrong, she thought flatly. I do not need anyone to accompany me to the towns. I will make my mark here just as father did in London. Yet as she slipped through the halls toward the main floor, she again recalled the contemptuous looks of the men in the market when she explained who she was. It was nothing she had not seen before. No one wished to be outsold by a woman, after all. I have nothing to worry about, she assured herself. I will succeed on my own merit. Susanna rounded the corner, casting on Aura a nervous smile as she moved. Good morrow, Miss Burney. Good morrow, Susanna. Please send Eliza to see to my grandmother. At once, Miss Burney. Susanna. The servant turned. 
Yes, Miss Burney? Honora bit on her lower lip, studying the servant's face as she weighed her decision carefully. Miss Burney? Where is His Grace this morning? He has left for the towns on duchy business. She replied. Was he expecting you? No, no. She answered quickly, relieved. That will be all. Thank you. Susanna disappeared, and Honora drew in a deep breath. It was good that Edward was not nearby. The temptation to have him accompany her to town was effectively removed. Honora had no choice but to head to the market alone, just as she intended all along. Grandmama is wrong. I do not need credibility through the Duke. I will gain a reputation in Blessington all on my own. The marketplace at Gower was bustling when she arrived. Her coach was stopping near the crowds, so she could survey the area for the best location to sell her wares. Admittedly, she was nervous, realizing that she did not know anyone in the throng of people. Perhaps Grandmama was right, after all, she thought anxiously. As she surveyed the crowd, a suffocating feeling of dread swelling inside her. Have I come here blind? The coachman opened the door and extended his hand to permit her to dismount easily and slowly onto the field. She was fighting the urge to return to the carriage and retreat to Briar Hill. Nonsense. You are a grown woman who has nothing to fear. Papa has entrusted you to grow the business while you are here and that you will do. Miss Burney, where shall I bring your wares? The coachman was a dashing boy of ten and six named John Henry with awful brown eyes. His youthful idealism did nothing to ease Honora's mounting distress. If anything, his inexperience made matters much worse for her. She wished she had sought a proper carpenter to bring along. I will return again tomorrow, she thought. The internal battle between wishing to stay and go was endless in her mind. Miss Burney are you well? John Henry asked. She sensed the concern filling his voice to a squeak, his tone still not quite even in his young age. Every aspect of John Henry was a painful reminder of her plight as if he were a mirror reflecting her green arrival in Blessington. With a wave of dismissive impatience, she replied, Yes, yes, of course, I am. She removed the white gloves from her fingers and gestured toward an empty spot on the edge of the market. It was as good a place as any to set up for the day, not conspicuous yet still in the middle of the marketplace. The shrubbery will make for a good hiding spot should it come to that, she chuckled to herself dryly. There. She gestured. Near that thick of bushes. Very well, miss. She watched as he began to unload the wood from beneath the carriage, pieces of lumber meant to construct a booth from which she could advertise the fine clothes and linens that had travelled with her from London. She remained near the carriage, still scanning the horde of people. Servants and nobility intermingled as small children darted through, engaged in games as their parents shopped. Honora tried to remind herself that it was truly no different in the countryside than it was in the city, despite what her nerves told her. They are all people here, looking to sell or trade. No matter what town or what their status, they are all merely people who need and want. Good morrow. Honora was startled at the unexpected voice at her side. She turned with the hoops of her skirt swirling slightly as she moved and cocked her head to the side to regard the stranger before her. He was unusually tall, wiry with a full beard and no moustache. His eyes bore a strange combination of burnt amber and brown with glints of green in their depth and against the dark whiskers on his face, they appeared to glow. Good morrow. She replied hesitantly as she gazed up at the older man, wondering from where he had come. Are you a merchant's wife? Honora felt her spine stiffen, but her eyes told her nothing that should arouse her suspicions in such a manner, except for the fact he was standing directly before her. Why would he approach a lone woman at the market if he believed me to be a merchant's wife? It is improper at best. Is he looking to purchase silks? I highly doubt it. She was a stranger in Gower. Perhaps he was seeking companionship in a much younger woman. After all, she wore no wedding ring. He might think her available for courtship. Yet that also did not seem so as he was clearly below her class. Only a very brazen man or a man within his cups would make such a bold move. She answered his question, despite the insult it delivered her. 
I am not the wife of anyone. She replied with as much haughtiness she could muster. I am a merchant. Is that so? He replied softly, nodding his head. I dare say, I have never seen a woman merchant in the marketplace. You must not be from the duchy. I am from London. Honora heard herself say although she was not certain why she was explaining herself to this strange man. I am staying in the duchy for a time, however. She stared at him more closely, examining his thinning head of hair and clothing. He was not wealthy, that much was clear, but he was also not a farmer. Perhaps he held a position as a clerk or teller? Perhaps he was the secretary of a noble house? It was difficult to gauge his position, especially with his eyes burning into hers, perhaps attempting to predict her answers before she spoke. John Henry arrived for more timber and eyed the newcomer with wariness. Are you well, Miss Burney? Honora looked at the boy, wondering if he recognized the man before them, but John Henry made no formal indication that he did. Yes. Honora replied slowly, giving the man an opportunity to introduce himself. This gentleman was merely welcoming me to Gower, I believe. Indeed, I am. The lanky stranger agreed, and John Henry seemed to accept the response before hurrying off to complete his task. I appreciate the kind gesture, mister. A cold smile appeared among the unruly hairs of his face, and crooked, yellowing teeth emerged. It was a ghastly smile, and she desperately attempted to return it with one of her own. Forgive my rudeness, Miss Burney. He reached for her hand, and pressed chapped lips to her skin. Entirely repulsed, she shuddered but managed not to jerk her palm back in disgust. You are a guest of Duke Blessington, are you not? He asked, as his lips slipped off the top of her hand. Honora's back was so tense, she was concerned she might snap. Indeed, I am. She replied, wondering if she should deny it. She felt confessing her current residency to this man would only solidify his suspicions about her, although what those suspicions were, she could not say. Inexplicably, he made her feel guilty as if she had done something wrong when she knew she had not. You should be very cautious, Miss Burney. He told her and finally released her hand. Your host has a way of ruining all which he touches. Honora's face flushed with indignation and she lowered her arm to her side. She glared at him, her lips pressed. How dare this man make assumptions about me? I resent your implication, sir. Duke Blessington has business with my father, that is all, I assure you. He shrugged, the icy smile still touching his crusted lips. You seem charming and full of wits, Miss Burney, but when the Duke sets his sights upon something he wants, I fear your senses will not protect you. She was now angry. Worried that he might reach for her, she stepped back a pace. Who are you? She demanded, her question escaping in a breathless rush. Oh, do forgive me. He said again and leaned his skinny body forward into a mocking bow. Did I not introduce myself? She perceived it was his intention to be mysterious. You did not. She retorted hotly. I am Abraham Borthwick, miss. At your service. Honora gasped, recognizing the name at once. Sarah Borthwick's father. Ah. He chuckled. So you do know who I am? I. Honora did not know how to respond. She certainly knew of the man but what did she really know? Tis all right, Miss Burney. You need not answer. Tis my aim to ensure everyone in this duchy knows my name. Please, Mr. Borthwick, this is highly inappropriate. She mumbled, and immediately cast her eyes toward John Henry who was dutifully putting the stand together at a distance. He was not paying them any mind. Honora was furious that the boy had not forewarned her. Perhaps. He agreed. And I will be on my way, but I would be honored if you told your host about our visit today. What would be the purpose of that? She demanded, sensing that the only reason for such a discussion would be to arouse the Duke's passions. Abraham Borthwick had done more than enough of that already. 
Honora had no intention of fueling his vendetta. Abraham leered, his face leaning toward hers and she suddenly recognized the emotion in his glittering hazel eyes. There was no mistaking what she saw, his face oozed of sheer malice. I wish for him to know that for every life he has ruined of mine, I will ruin one of his too. With her mouth agape, Honora watched Abraham flee into the crowds without another word. Shocked, she felt a rush of goose flesh prickle through her body. The meaning of his words was unmistakable. Abraham Borthwick had just threatened her. Chapter 13 Edward could not help feeling proud of himself when he and Benedict retired from the interviews and headed toward Briar Hill. I do believe that breath of scandal is beginning to be overlooked. Benedict offered with cautious optimism. The men seemed more amiable today, would you not say? Edward had noticed the same thing, and while some had remained aloof, it seemed his absent win in court against Abraham Borthwick had gained him some grudging respect. Coupled with the fact that his debts were stabilized, the Duke could see a glimmer of hope for the future of Blessington. Twas why Honora Burney's worried face was so surprised when she rushed to meet the carriage upon their arrival. I must speak with you. She told him urgently. What has happened? Is it your grandmother? She shook her head impatiently, and he hurried from the cab, Benedict in tow. No. She replied, casting Benedict a furtive look. May we speak in private, your grace? I hardly think that is appropriate. Benedict began to say, but Edward noted the desperation in her face and nodded. Yes, of course. He interrupted. He turned his head and gave Benedict a menacing look. Come to my study. Your Grace. Benedict growled. If it is a matter for the household. It is not. Honora assured him, her eyes wide. Please, Mr. Carter. Permit me a moment with his grace. I shan't be long, but it must be done privately. Benedict did not appear pleased, but he nodded curtly and watched as they hurried into the manor with Honora leading the way. What is the matter? Edward demanded. Why are you so frightfully pale? He hoped she was not also ill. He would hardly know what to do with two sickly women under the same roof. Abraham Borthwick found me at the market today. She told him, the words spilling from her lips in a rush. He wished me to deliver you a message. What? Edward choked. How do you mean he found you? What did he do? Are you injured? No, no. She assured him. He did not touch me. Dot, at least not physically. I do not understand, Miss Burney. Please, sit down and explain what has happened. A web of terrible thoughts spun through his mind as he imagined what a nearly mad and vicious Abraham Borthwick might be capable of. To approach his guest, a woman he had promised to protect and ideally hoped to wed. The man had clearly lost his wits. If he should continue in this fashion, he will find himself banished from society and committed to the asylum. Honora balanced herself on the edge of a wingback chair, her full skirts falling gracefully to the ground in a wave of lace and silk. Even in her state of unease, she was the picture of raw elegance, not a hair out of place, secured by an intricate netted hairpiece of pearls. She is a vision in green. She should wear nothing else but green, and I would be a happy man to stare upon her beauty. Embarrassment slapped him back into reality. It was hardly the time nor place to be thinking such thoughts, not when a genuine danger could be lurking nearby. He, I went to market today. It was my first day. She explained quickly. You should not have gone alone. Edward interjected, his blue-gray eyes flashing. Surely you do not venture to market alone in London. In fact I do. She shot back, her expression no longer concerned but indignant. I have since I was a girl. Instantly, Edward clamped his mouth shut, ruining his words. How could I have forgotten to whom I was speaking? if even for a few moments, he thought wryly. I will not make that mistake again. Do go on. He insisted, hoping that she would not cling to his outburst. 
John Henry was setting up my stand, and a man approached me. She continued, her eyes shaded in wariness. At first, he pretended he was merely a passerby, but it soon became clear he knew who I was. How? Why? What did he say? He asked if I were your house guest and he warned me that you, he warned me about you. She corrected herself quickly, saying what Borthwick truly said was humiliating. What did he say, Nora? She did not acknowledge he spoke to her so informally, her eyes lowered to her wringing hands. She started fingering the ornate pearl choker at her neck. He claims he will ruin someone in your life for every life you have ruined in his. The words were shocking, and air wished from his lungs as their meaning met his ears. He is mad. He muttered. Truly mad and without a conscience. Yet, even as he spoke, Edward knew that was not the case. Many times he had empathized with his would-be father-in-law. How would he feel if the roles were reversed? Abraham had no reason to know what had truly transpired, that his beloved daughter had become pregnant by a man who had left her. It was something which only Sarah could tell him after swearing Edward to secrecy. Abraham had no other option than to unleash his wrath upon Edward. There was no one else. He does not understand that I was only attempting to help Sarah when I proposed marriage to her. The last thing I wished for was for her to be shamed. Instead, I was the one shamed for doing what I believed would help her. Your Grace, what will we do about this? Honora whispered, bringing his focus back into the study where she rose and paced about the room. If he wishes to bring harm upon us. Edward noted the use of the word us, but he made no comment. Honora was already beside herself with worry. She did not need his teasing in those moments. He was not entirely certain why he had noticed her use of the word either. His mind should have been solely on the matter at hand. No one will bring harm upon this household. He promised. I will see that we have guards brought to Briar Hill, and I will see to Abraham once and for all. Guards? Honora echoed. We will not live like prisoners. Of course not. Edward soothed. It will only be a temporary solution until Abraham Borthwick is dealt with. How will you deal with him, Your Grace? He is driven, clearly. What can you possibly do which will cause him to stray from the path he has chosen? You must not fret, Nora. I am a man of my word, despite what you may have heard. You need not worry about Abraham Borthwick. She caught his informality, her eyes widened. Your Grace. She mumbled, pink touching her face and lowered her head. Sensing a tender moment between them, he offered, Perhaps you will call me Edward when we are in private. Her lips parted, but before she could respond, there was a hard knock at the study door. Your Grace, a word. Benedict called, his voice curt. One moment, Mr. Carter. Tis urgent, Your Grace. Someone has set fire to the barn. Honora gasped. She covered her mouth with her hand, and he rushed to the door. What? He cried as Benedict gestured for him to follow. They rushed from the house and toward the back of the property. Flames licked the doors, but Edward noticed that the house staff had already managed to extinguish most of the fire with buckets of water from the nearby pond, preventing greater damage. How can you be certain it was not an accident? Edward asked, watching Honora's face turn opaque against the evening light. Perhaps a lamp was knocked aside and caught the straw. John Henry saw a man running from the barn just as smoke began to pour through the doors. Benedict insisted. It was arson. Edward tried to swallow the lump in his throat, not wanting to acknowledge that someone could do something so devious. Where is John Henry? He demanded and Benedict pointed to where the boy stood, soaked and sooty from having helped with the rescue of the horses within. Are you injured? Edward asked. The boy shook his head, breathing heavily as he struggled to catch his breath. No, Your Grace. What did you see? The voice was on Aura's. Edward had not realized that she had followed him to question the coachman. He did not send her away, 
despite wishing to protect her from any more strife. She has seen more than enough to give her night terrors. I should not allow her to be here for this. Yet Edward knew that asking her to leave would not prove wise. She would learn the truth at some moment regardless. A man, Miss Burney, running away. I called out to him, but he disappeared beyond the break and into the woods before I could catch him. What can you tell us about him? I fear very little, Miss Burney. It was too far a distance between us, but I can say for certain that he was quite tall, and I dare say he had a beard, but I could be incorrect. John Henry eyed the Duke, he worried he had said too much, but Edward only patted him on the back. You did well, my boy. Edward assured him. If not for your keen eyes, matters might have been much worse. Were any of the horses lost? No, your grace. Praise the Lord for that. Honora sighed. Come along, John Henry. Let us get you cleaned up and watered. She gestured for him to move toward the house, lingering behind to look meaningfully at Edward who was already quite sure he knew what she was about to say. A tall man with face whiskers? I would wager it was Abraham Borthwick, your grace. She hissed, deliberately keeping her voice low. You must have him detained lest he manages to kill someone next time. Edward knew she was right, but he could not very well march into the Borthwick house and have Abraham collected, not without proof. As I assured you, I will have this dealt with. You must not fret Dash. Must not fret? She exploded, her hand on the narrow waist of her skirts. A man attempted to burn the barn with the animals within. This is clearly a warning to you, your grace. I understand your concern, Miss Burney. He told her, resisting the urge to pull her into his embrace. Beneath her dismay was unmistakable fear. He wanted to dispel her uneasiness, but there was little he could do or say in those moments, not while the house staff ran about still, calming the animals and putting out the last of the fire. Your grace, a word? Benedict called, and Edward turned. One moment, Mr. Carter. He growled, but as he pivoted back to speak with Honora again, she had already darted across the lawn toward the back entrance of the house, presumably to deal with the sooty staff. Hesitatingly, Edward turned back to his friend and adviser, knowing that there was only one certainty, matters were only about to become increasingly worse. Chapter 14 Delicately lowering her frail form along the servant's stairs, Marjorie demanded, My word, what is the commotion outside? Grandmama, you must return to your apartment at once. Honora cried in panic. Please. Nonsense, child. If you wished me to stay upstairs, you would not be making such a fuss, oh. Marjorie's gaunt face registered the chaos in the kitchen and paused on the final step as the staff rushed about in a din of voices. What has happened? The old woman demanded. What is this? Grandmama, there was a fire. She explained haltingly. Thankfully, the staff was quick to react and tended to it before much damage occurred. Indeed? Honora hurriedly poured water to give the others to sip. Where was the fire? Please, Grandmama, you must return to your bed. Tis not good for your health to be about, especially not in such confusion. Marjorie did not respond but maintained a fixed look upon her grandchild which Honora could feel without raising her head. The younger Bernie's mind was racing with horrific thoughts as she wondered what Abraham Borthwick might try next. He will not stop until Edward is ruined. He has said as much. What are you hiding from me, Nora? Grandmama, please, I implore you to leave well enough alone for the moment. I vow to visit with you when all has settled. Why have I the impression that all will never be settled at Briar Hill? The insightful old woman pressed. Why do I feel as though your father has led us into a house of chaos? Honora sighed deeply and moved toward her grandmother, urging her to keep her tones low. It matters not what is happening. She whispered to her grandmother. We are here now, and we must do what we must to endure. Nay. 
Marjorie contradicted. We might send for Michael, and he will whisk us home to the sanctuary of London where fires do not spontaneously happen in the light of day while people watch. Honora stared at her. How could she know it was an arson already? Had she heard one of the servants? Suddenly, she connected that her grandmother's quarters overlooked the barn. Grandmama, did you see something? She hissed, her eyes as wide as tea saucers. Perhaps. Marjorie replied in a casual tone. What did you see? Marjorie's face puckered into a scowl. I saw chaos, just as I said. What in God's name is occurring in these parts? Honora smothered a sigh. The Duke will tend to whatever is happening among us but Grandmama, you must tell me what you saw. I will tell you. Marjorie agreed. If you swear to return to London. Grandmama, we will return home when Papa dash. I wish to leave sooner than that. Marjorie interrupted, holding up an old hand while her other rested firmly about her walking stick. I will even see to the arrangements. Honora gritted her teeth together, unwilling to dismiss her grandmother so quickly, but it was not feasible. Her father would be incensed to learn they had returned home against his wishes, and Honora said so to her grandmother. Truly child. Marjorie chuckled. Is that why you are reluctant to leave? Of course. Marjorie snickered. You are a terrible thespian, Nora. Speaking mistruths is hardly a strong trait of yours. Honora's brow furrowed. Grandmama, I do not understand. She insisted. Moreover, you cannot travel in your weakened state. Marjorie's raucous laughter hid the rest of her sentence, and Honora found herself growing upset. Grandmama. She snapped. You are behaving childishly. What are you implying? I imply nothing, child. I am much too old to be making implications. I will speak frankly when I say that you wish to stay here now, in Briar Hill, despite all its shortcomings. T. That simply is not true. Honora protested. I am just as eager as you to return home. Fine. I will make the arrangements. Marjorie replied, turning to climb back up the steps. No. Honora yelled before she could stop herself, and Marjorie's smirk was visible even without the woman turning her head. I thought not. She replied, but there was a tinge of amusement in her voice. She shuffled back up the steps, leaving Honora to stare after her, her heart thumping wildly. Her grandmother was right, after all. There was no good reason for them to stay. In fact, there were many good reasons for them to leave. William would not fault them for returning home after being endangered, and London was only four hours away. There is only one reason I wish to stay, and that is for the Duke. Now that she figured it out, a wave of dizziness was washing through her. It was a surreal understanding, one which she could not easily reconcile with reality. Never in her one and twenty years had she considered changing her plans on the whims of a man. They are not Edward's whims, they are yours. A strange feeling swept around her as if she was drunk on the idea. She wondered what Edward would say if she told him she was leaving. Honora reasoned that he might be relieved if she and her grandmother returned to London. It would be one less responsibility upon him when he already had so much with which to contend. There you are. Edward appeared, a look of relief on his face as he saw her. Where else would I be? She asked lightly. He guided her from the galley, into the back corridor. I only wish to reiterate what I told you earlier. He said softly. You need not worry about Abraham Borthwick. There is a reason he did this so openly and in the light of day. Yes. Honora agreed. He only wished to send a message and show what he is capable of. You may not believe this, Nora, but he is not a terrible man. He is deeply wounded and knows no better way of displaying his emotions. Honora practically scoffed, but she saw that he was being sincere. When I was a young man, Abraham Borthwick was kind to me. Edward rushed on. He is the house secretary for Lord Cloverfield's manor, 
and I spent a great deal of time there with my father when I was a boy. Honora appeared expectantly at him, slowly understanding that perhaps she was about to learn the true story behind what had happened with Sarah Borthwick. As you are aware, my father was not the most pleasant man and often his harshness or blows would send me scurrying from the room to compose myself while the others laughed at my misfortune. It was there where I began to know Abraham and his daughter, Sarah. He paused, momentarily lost in the memory of his boyhood. Honora was nearly afraid to breathe, lest she trampled upon the thoughts, and she yearned to know the truth he was hiding. Sarah and I became as close as siblings in some ways, her having only eight years and me, eleven. Both of us without mothers and lonely. Her only company before me was her uncle Walter who also worked for the Cloverfields as a butler and lived in the same small cottage, a young man only ten years her senior but still too old to play with such a spirited girl. Perhaps Sarah was smitten with me, or possibly with the very idea of my nobility. I was a young lord, after all, and she was but a secretary's daughter, but I only ever saw her as a sister, and as the years passed, I watched her grow into a comely lass, blonde and fair. The young men were lined to the gates to court her, but Sarah was inordinately shy. She did not take to the idea of courtship as her peers did. Edward sighed, shifting his eyes downward uncomfortably. I cannot say how I knew that something was amiss with Sarah for a long while. Perhaps it was simply because I had known her since childhood and was closer to her than any other soul until that point. Suddenly, she no longer wished to meet with me, to go on hikes with me through the flats. When I called upon her, she dismissed me even when I was certain she was home. Eventually, I simply gave up calling upon her, and as the years passed, we went our separate ways. In truth, I always believed that she fancied me, and knowing that we would never be together, finally sent her into a pit of despair. He shifted his weight slightly, permitting himself to fall against the wall as he stared at Honora, judging her reaction but there was no reaction to be had albeit somewhat of a sad tale, was nothing the Duke had said which was worthy of Abraham's wrath. It was not until he spoke again that Honoran understood. I did not speak to Sarah for three years, and while I did see her about the duchy, she made a deliberate effort not to see me. I admit, I missed my friend, and when she arrived at Briar Hill very late one night, tears of misery streaking her pale cheeks, I let her in immediately. What had happened? Honora asked, her heart pumping quickly. Well, I am sure you must have heard, Sarah was pregnant. Honora could hear the shame in his voice, he shared her shame intrinsically. By whom? Honora demanded, her eyebrows almost to her hairline as she leaned forward closer, afraid to miss a word of the lurid story. She did not give me a name but she did tell me he had promised to marry her but abruptly disappeared, leaving her alone and with child. She was devastated. I can imagine. Honora breathed. What happened then? Of course I brought her inside to sit by the fire. It was a freezing night, icicles dangling from the eaves. I remember how she shivered and no matter how many shawls I wrapped about her shoulders or sherry I gave her to soothe her taut nerves, she could not stop shaking. Oh, what will my father say? She moaned. I shall be shunned by the church, banished from the duchy. Many terrible thoughts filled her mind, and she spoke them all aloud. Indeed, her father. Honora murmured, her chest wrought with sympathy for the poor girl. For hours we sat, talking into the night until dawn finally rose in the sky. Perhaps I had too much sherry of my own or perhaps my protectiveness of her overtook my common sense, but I offered to marry her and cover her shame. In some way, I saw it as my sworn duty. After all, twas her family who protected and sheltered me against my father. Surely it was my turn to do the same. A sigh of exhaustion slipped from Honora's lips as if she had been holding her breath for a long while. Although she had known that part of the story, it was good to hear it confirmed by Edward. She remained at her home with her father until the wedding was to take place and all was well. Honora watched as his face twisted into a look of sheer despair and in the shadowy light, she thought she saw tears glistening in his eyes, but it may have only been a trick of the light. I had not heard from her in days. She refused my summons to Briar Hill, 
and I was perplexed. Edward stopped speaking and straightened himself up as if forced upright. Forgive me. I have no right to tell you this. Honora was stunned by his abrupt change of demeanor. Of course you do. She argued. Tis an ordeal which still haunts you. It is not my story with which to regale you. He said firmly, stalking away from the wall. Forget we have ever spoken of this. Your Grace. Honora called out after him, flabbergasted, but he vanished before she could plead with him to return. Honora felt the wind had been knocked out of her and she fell back against the wall which previously had been holding the Duke. Grandmama is correct. We must return to London before we fall deeper into this web of madness. Chapter 15 A faint line of sweat broke along the edge of his light blonde hair, his pulse thundering wildly in his chest. Your Grace, do you require the coach? John Henry asked, but Edward waved him aside, not trusting his own voice. Your Grace are you well? The boy challenged while following the Duke through the stables. Edward still did not respond, his mind brimming with too many thoughts. The smell of charring still lingered in the air, but the fire had not caused an insurmountable amount of damage. The animals had been unharmed, but Edward suspected that Abraham had initiated the fire without intent to harm. Regardless of his intent, he is reckless, dangerous. One of the servants could have been in the barn. Even with this understanding, he could not stop himself from feeling sorry for the man. He was furious with Abraham's misguided need for vengeance, but there was little he could do about it, not when Sarah refused to disclose the truth. He brought his snorting stallion from the stall, the horse still seemingly uncomfortable following the commotion. There, boy. He told the beast. All is well. The horse allowed himself to be led from the barn as John Henry hovered nearby. Please, your grace. The boy pleaded. Permit me to take you wherever it is you need be. Again, Edward ignored him and mounted Thorn without a saddle, kicking the animal into action and leaving Briar Hill. As he steered them up the road, the sky seemed to darken above his head, attempting to warn him of the impending danger which he faced approaching Abraham Borthwick alone. It was not a good scheme, nor well conceived, but Edward was beginning to feel helpless once more. He was in fear of losing everything again and why God has forbidden me from forging forward. He rode desolately, leaning into Thorn's soft mane. Every time I am graced with good fortune, I am struck with a downpouring of bad. He knew how close he had come to telling Honora the truth about what had transpired with Sarah, and a mass of guilt flowed through him. It was not his place to tell anyone about what had happened, no matter how he suffered for his silence. Edward the call carried through the slight wind, and he turned to look as Benedict gained upon him, also on a lone, unsaddled horse. You must stop at once. He had reached the outskirts of Lord Cloverfield's property, and he eyed his gaining friend, debating whether to outrun him. He had the better horse, and he was so close to the Borthwick cottage. If Benedict had only been a moment or two behind, you must stop. Benedict yelled again. Drawing up to the Duke, he shook his head in unadulterated disgust. Have you taken leave of your senses? I am quite close to doing precisely that. Edward replied between clenched teeth. I am at my wit's end. Indeed. Benedict replied, sighing in resignation. However, you cannot confront a madman, and alone. Eddie, you must use rational thinking. How can you be certain you are not walking into an ambush? Surely he must anticipate your arrival. You know he has men on his side, albeit not as many since he was discounted from court. What else am I to do? This cannot continue, Carter. We have guests staying in Briar Hill. I am aware what is at stake. Benedict assured him. Your life included. He clearly would not mind seeing you perish. His actions today have shown that. It was not meant to be a death threat, Carter. Edward sighed with exasperation. It was only meant to frighten the household. How can you justify what that man has done, Eddie? He is a menace, 
and someone needs stop him before tis too late. Then allow me to pass and speak with him. The duke insisted. Benedict scoffed loudly, a rumble of thunder accentuating his words. Because we know Abraham Borthwick to be such a reasonable man, do we? You have attempted to speak with him. You have had me speak with him. Lord knows I have even protected the woman's secret that she was not with your child. I told you that in confidence, Carter. You will say nothing on the matter to anyone, least of all to Abraham. The sound of hooves approaching on the road caused both men to turn. Edward suddenly regretted his impulsive actions, realizing that he was unequipped to deal with a confrontation with Abraham. To his relief, he saw it was merely the servants returning from the towns in a work wagon. The tired horse stopped, and a familiar face appeared. Your Grace, Mr. Carter. The man called, his eyes wide with confusion. Lord Cloverfield is in London for the week. Come along, Your Grace. Benedict growled, ignoring the man. The rain will fall soon. Where is your brother, Walter? Edward asked, ignoring his friend's words. Walter Borthwick turned to his companions. Go ahead without me. He told them. I will be along in a moment. The carriage moved ahead after Walter Borthwick disembarked. What has he done now? The butler demanded, his face twisted in concern. It is no concern of yours, Walter. Edward said quickly, but Benedict snorted contemptuously. Arson, for one. The adviser snapped. Arson, no. Walter was genuinely aghast by the words, and he gazed nervously toward the Cloverfields house, expecting his older sibling to materialize in a fog of madness. There were witnesses. Edward conceded. A man matching his description was seen fleeing Briar Hill after a conflagration began. Oh! Walter muttered. Forgive him, your grace. He knows not what he does in his grief. He feels that all has been lost in these past months. His job hangs in the balance with Lord Cloverfield. Edward was startled to hear the information, but he was not entirely shocked by the news. Abraham's descent into madness was bound to be his undoing. Your Grace, come along. Benedict insisted as drops of water began to fall upon them. This is an exercise in futility. Please, Your Grace. Walter pleaded. You must show him mercy. You know he is not a bad man, despite his recent actions. The naked plaintiveness in Walter's voice touched Edward's soul but he could not dismiss the facts at play. Abraham was unpredictable, no matter his reasoning, and whatever affections Edward had for the man were all but diminished in light of what had happened. Your Grace. Benedict Stone left no room for further protest and Edward nodded, turning Thorn toward him. Do not tell him we have come seeking him. Edward instructed. As you wish, Your Grace. Walter was relieved. You should not give in to his pleas. Benedict warned as they left the butler standing in the rain. He is tied with the same brush. For all you know, he could very well be complicit in what happened today. I know nothing of that. Edward growled. And I will not tarnish Walter Borthwick based on his brother's actions. They rode in silence, and Edward realized he had not asked about the whereabouts of Sarah. If Lord Cloverfield is considering removing Abraham as house secretary because of Sarah, he may have sent her away. Perhaps to a nunnery? I would like you to find Sarah. Edward said suddenly, and Benedict grunted. For what purpose? I need not discuss every thought in my head with you, Carter. Edward snapped. Find her. Benedict's mouth pursed into a line of disapproval but he wisely said nothing to contradict his employer's orders. It was clear that Edward was determined to speak with the fallen girl. They were soaked to the core as they approached Briar Hill, and it seemed that every servant was on the lawn anxiously anticipating their arrival. Susanna rushed forward to help him from his horse. Good Lord, Your Grace! Susanna muttered. 
Edward waved her off, his eyes searching for Honora. He finally saw her near the doorway, watching him pensively. I owe her an apology. I should not have left so abruptly and given her the impression she was in the wrong for my unsolicited chatter. She deserves better than that. He dismounted Thorn and moved through the servants toward her. Did you find what you were seeking, your grace? No. He admitted. That is because I am afraid I am unsure of what that is. A shadow of sympathy passed over her face, and Edward was taken aback by how lovely she seemed, even if slightly unkempt in the rain. There was nary a situation which made her less comely. She is a woman who can be taken from a ballroom to a stable without so much as a wrinkle in her nose. She is at ease in every scenario, and she truly does take my breath away. Someone placed a blanket about his shoulders and Edward became aware that they still remained in the rain. May we speak privately? He asked her. I, I wish to apologize for leaving so hastily before. There is no need to apologize, your grace. You certainly do not need to disclose your private thoughts to me of all people. Edward caught the edge in her voice, his brow raising in surprise. If I were to disclose my private thoughts, I would think it would be with you of all people. He replied slowly. Her face expressed surprise. You barely know me, your grace. She murmured. You have advisers and dash. On the contrary, Miss Burney. I feel I know you very well. From the moment I saw you, I knew you were rarer than any jewel in the world. Her eyes widened, and he could see she had not been expecting such a heartfelt declaration. Are your grace? She sputtered, apparently unsure of how to react to such words. You flatter me, but I assure you, I am hardly a rare jewel. Edward managed to smile and shrugged nonchalantly. I fear that rare jewels are incapable of seeing their own worth. There was an unexpected expression of concern on her face, and Edward wondered if he had gone too far with his words. Honora Burney was not one who was apt to be wooed with charming words, but Edward felt hopelessly inept in other ways of showing his growing feelings toward her. What is it you want from me, your grace? He was stunned by the pointedness of her question, but Edward was learning that Honora was not one to mince words. Your friendship? He replied simply, but he could plainly see that she was not convinced by his words. I thought you already had that, your grace. Their eyes locked as though no one else existed around them, oblivious to the fact they were getting soaked just standing in the rain. Tis easy to lose myself in her eyes. I hope so. He told her honestly. I have learned to value our time together. The feeling is mutual, your grace, but I fear I have some news. Edward's eyes narrowed as he studied her face. He could not cope with any foul news that day. What is it? He asked, hoping the resignation was not heard in his voice. What was the worst she could say? He already knew Marjorie was well or else Honora would surely be more agitated. Whatever it is cannot be as bad as all that has occurred, he reasoned. He had no idea how long he was until Honora shifted her eyes away and spoke again, splitting his nerves into a thousand jagged edges. My grandmother and I have made arrangements to return to London next week. Chapter 16 We need not wait for Michael. Marjorie grumbled. Why can we not simply travel with the Duke's coach? What is your grand hurry, Grandmama? Honora asked. We have weeks before Papa's return. More curiously, why have you a change of heart, Nora? Has the Duke offended you in some way? Honora turned back from the writing desk where she was crafting a letter to summon the coachman from their home in London. Of course not. She replied defensively. But you have made your case quite clear on the matter and dash. Bollocks. Her grandmother stated crassly, and Honora gasped. Grandmama. You need not pretend that this decision has anything to do with my desire to return home. You are upset with the Duke. Admit it. I will not because it is not so. However. Honora inhaled deeply and met her grandmother's wise eyes. 
I do not believe we are safe remaining here. The fire was a terrible sign of what is to come. We need not be party to whatever dark umbra falls upon Briar Hill. Marjorie turned her body slightly to peer at her grandchild. I find it difficult to believe you are running in the face of danger, Nora. Exasperated, Honora threw up her hands, blotting ink against the cream of the page before her. Grandmama, I failed to understand you at times. You say one thing, and in an instant, you say precisely the opposite. Do you not wish to return home? I wish to return home, yes. Marjorie replied. However, I am questioning your reasons. You have not given me a sound argument for your desire to defy your father. Honoro stared at her silently for a long moment, her mind a jumble of confused thoughts. She is correct again. I have been a mass of contradictions, just as she has. Perhaps it is this house. Perhaps it was the feelings she was developing for the Duke that worried her more than she cared to admit. If you are running from your emotions, Nora, I assure you, they will follow you back to London. I run from nothing. Honora said firmly, pivoting her body toward the desk and reaching for a fresh page on which to write. I must think of our safety first. The Duke agrees with our decision to leave. It had been devastating to realize he was willing to let them go, but as Honora thought about it, what choice did he have? They were not his prisoners after all, and with the darkness that enshrouded Briar Hill, he was likely relieved not to have them in his charge. Still, Honora had expected some protest, some pleading for her to stay. Instead, her announcement had been met with a blank expression, followed by a curt nod. As you wish, Miss Burney. He said stoically, the light extinguishing from his eyes. He was the first to look away. I will ensure you are returned to your home at your leisure. That is not necessary. She told him quickly. I have arranged for our coachman to come from London. His face tightened into a frown. You have been thinking of this for some time then. He growled with some bitterness. It was not simply due to the fire. I dare say, Your Grace, that Abraham Borthwick did not give me a good sense of what is to come. That was only this morning. Edward pointed out. Did you run home and immediately pen a letter? Honora did not answer, but simply drew in a long breath and hung her head. She had not yet sent word for Michael to come but she would on the morrow. You must know that my grandmother and I appreciate all you have done for us. She rushed on, but it seemed that he was no longer listening, choosing to disappear into the house and retreat into the salon where a drink awaited him behind closed doors. Even as you sit there now, I see the hesitation in you. Marjorie quipped and Honora realized that she had drifted off into thoughts from the previous evening. I am not hesitating. She replied. I am merely thinking. Thinking of the Duke, no doubt. Grandmama, your teasing falls upon deaf ears, I am afraid. She reclaimed the pen and continued to scrawl the letter to the household in London. If you say so, child. Marjorie chuckled. The rain prevented her from travelling to market that morning. She did not want the fine silks and laces exposed to the driving water pouring from the heavens. Instead, she retreated to the conservatory with a book and a cup of tea. The sound of the rain against the glass soothed her, and as she sat in the garden chair, her lap covered in a thick quilt of intricate patchwork, her eyes grew heavy. She had all but nodded off when movement caught her eye through her peripheral vision. Who is there? She called, leaping to her feet instantly alert. Show yourself at once. It is only I, Miss Burney. Benedict chuckled nervously, appearing from behind a row of greenery. I did not intend to startle you. Of course, Mr. Carter. She breathed, placing a hand against her chest. Forgive my silliness. Given the circumstances of the past days, you have every right to be nervous. She took a deep slow breath and forced a smile. I assure you, I am unconcerned. She fibbed. I am certain you and the Duke have the issue under complete control. 
May I join you, Miss Burney? Benedict asked. Honora noticed he avoided her statement. Please, Mr. Carter. She gestured for him to sit and he perched on the edge of the white cast iron table and surveyed the sodden yard beyond. The Duke informs me that you are returning to London next week. We are, yes. Honora wondered if Edward had sent the adviser to speak with her about leaving. She hoped not. It would make her think much less of him. If Edward wishes for me to stay, he should say so himself, not send Benedict Carter to do his bidding. We will be sorry to see you go, Miss Burney. Benedict offered. It speaks nothing to your impeccable hospitality, I assure you. Honora explained quickly. My grandmother is in poor health as you know and with the excitement which seems to follow the Duke. You need not state your case, Miss Burney. If I were in your position, I would do the same. The Duke agrees that you are wise to leave. I am certain your father will agree with your choice upon his return. When she realized Benedict Carter was not there to plead with her to stay, she was disheartened. You are no different than Grandmama. You are upset if Benedict is here on Edward's behalf and disappointed if he is not. Shame on you for acting so childishly. I hope His Grace is able to resolve this feud with Mr. Borthwick. She replied honestly. That is why I have come to see you, Miss Burney. I wish to enlist your help with the matter before you leave for London. It may help to alleviate the tensions between Mr. Borthwick and His Grace. Now she was more curious than desolate. What have you in mind, Mr. Carter? Again, Benedict glanced toward the house assuring they were not being overheard, but of course, no one ventured into the soggy fields on such a damp day. They were alone. What I tell you must remain between us, Miss Burney. You must not tell His Grace until we are certain this will work. A spark of alarm pierced her heart, and she began to shake her head. I am afraid I cannot consent to any such thing. She told him firmly. Benedict shook his head and sighed. You misunderstand, Miss Burney. This is to benefit the Duke, not harm him. However, if he learns of this plan beforehand, he will undoubtedly attempt to get involved and make matters worse between him and Abraham Borthwick. Do you understand? I am afraid I do not. She replied, genuinely confused. Benedict sighed heavily, again. I am afraid I cannot explain it better until you agree to keep it quiet. They stared at one another, unflinching as Honora weighed his request in her mind. It was treasonous to keep secrets from the Duke, but she did not doubt Benedict's loyalty to him, not for a moment. If I can help end the war brewing between Abraham Borthwick and Edward, I should play my part. I am certain that Benedict is not plotting ill against Edward. She made her decision. You may speak freely. She told him. But I cannot assure that I will agree to whatever you have planned. I will accept that for now. Benedict replied, appearing relieved. Honoro sat back and waited for the details to unfold. Yesterday, Edward left here, intending to confront Abraham for what he had done. She remembered how he had hurried from the hall and returned soaked on his horse, bareback and without an explanation to anyone. I managed to stop him from that encounter, but I fear that is only temporary. Honora knew he was likely right. He also asked me to find the whereabouts of Sarah Borthwick. He continued. She has scarcely been seen since the engagement was called off. Honora tensed slightly. She remains in the Borthwick cottage, but she rarely leaves from what I am told. How can you be certain she is there? Honora asked. If she rarely leaves? The servants of the manor have assured me she is. What would you have me do? Honora asked although she had a strong sense she knew what he was requesting. Sarah holds the key to setting her father off the Duke's trail. Benedict explained delicately, and Honora could see he, too, knew the truth about what had happened. She wondered if he knew the entire tale or only what she had learned. 
I cannot approach her, not without being met with scrutiny and that is assuming I can get through her father. You wish for me to speak sense to her. Honora finished for him, a tingle of excitement touching her. Benedict had a sound plan. Sarah would not speak freely with a man. She had more than likely not shared the company of a woman in many months. Yes. Benedict agreed. I would like you to explain to her what her father has been doing in the wake of the scandal. I have not the foggiest notion if she is aware of the havoc Abraham is wreaking upon the duchy, but I know she is a kind-hearted girl, one who once cared quite deeply for his grace. I cannot imagine that she would be party to such chaos, so I must assume she knows nothing about what is happening. Honora nodded slowly. It cannot hurt to speak with her. She said slowly, her mind already on how she might approach the Borthwick home without casting attention on herself. You must ensure that his grace does not catch a breath of this. Benedict reiterated. He will be apt to stop us, despite it being in his best interest. Why does he continue to shield her? Honora whispered aloud, although the question was much more a private thought than one shared with the adviser. To his own detriment, no less. Benedict stared at her in surprise. Do you truly ask? I, I have such a difficult time reconciling why he would insist on protecting her when he risks so much. Honora confessed. Miss Burney, I know you have not been with us a long while, but I was under the impression you have spent some time with the Duke. I have. A wry smile touched Benedict's lips, and he tilted his head to the side. Then I should not have to tell you that in the face of adversity, his grace will not back down. He made a promise to Sarah, and no matter what happens, he will not break his oath. A flutter touched her heart, and she nodded slowly. He is a man of great honor. She murmured, now cognizant of the entire truth behind her words. You will never find a more honorable man. Benedict confirmed. Honora swallowed the lump forming in her throat as she thought of all the terrible ideas she had had about Edward. I will help him in this before I go back to London, she decided. Tis the least I can do. Chapter 17 Edward welcomed the accompts placed before him, a distraction from the more personal matters which had been plaguing him for the past two days. He felt his life had stood still as he waited for word on Sarah, her whereabouts still unknown according to Benedict. Yet simultaneously, he noted that the clock appeared to be racing as the days toward the arrival of the Burney coachman approached. He was losing control of the duchy again for different reasons, but he was at a loss of what to do. Benedict had been very clear on how to counter the attack Abraham had brought to his house, and Edward was beginning to see the virtue in his words. I must find Sarah and have her speak the truth before this goes any further. Then perhaps I can hope to keep Honora here until her father returns, and we might consider a future together as man and wife. It seemed like a far-fetched dream now, the idea of marrying Honora, despite the clear connection they shared. It was simply too complicated a matter to entertain. As much as he wanted to beg her to stay at Briar Hill, he could not dispute that her safety was paramount to his desires. If anything should happen to Honora or her grandmother while in his care, he would never be forgiven by his new business partner. London is the safest place for them now, even if they are there without a male chaperone. He idly considered going with them, but he knew he could never leave the duchy, tempting as the idea was to him. When this matter is dealt with, I will send for Honora again, he decided, but in his gut, he wondered if they would be able to reclaim what they had if she was to leave. A gentle rap on the study door brought Susanna to his sight and she placed a glass of port before him. Something to ease your constitution before supper, your grace. He smiled at her gratefully. Thank you, Susanna. He replied, reaching for the goblet and taking a long sip. Have you seen Benedict this afternoon? I have not, your grace. Should I send word that you are seeking him? No. Edward sighed. Tis not a pressing matter. I was hoping he had received word on the whereabouts of Sarah Borthwick. Your Grace? Susanna seemed perplexed. Nothing, tis nothing. 
he muttered, wondering why he had spoken aloud. Your grace, if I may. He lifted his eyes toward her puzzled face. What is it? You are seeking Sarah Borthwick? Edward sat straight up in his chair, his brow furrowing. Have you word on where she might be? Yes, your grace. She is home with her father and uncle at Shady Knoll. Edward's mouth gaped open. Since when? He demanded. Susanna paled slightly. I have not known her to be anywhere else, your grace. I know she rarely leaves the property, but last I heard, she does stay there. An uneasy feeling of betrayal was building inside Edward, but he willed himself not to leap to conclusions. How certain are you of this, Susanna? From where do you glean your information? He could read the regret for having spoken on her face, but she dared not clam up under examination. Your Grace, my cousin Violet is employed by Lord Cloverfield as a maid. She oft glimpses Miss Borthwick tending the garden about their cottage. Tis not a secret, Your Grace. Susanna's words implied what Edward was thinking, if anyone were truly looking for Sarah, she would not have been difficult to locate. Send a messenger for her at once. Edward roared. His servant flinched at his tone, but the Duke was far too incensed to utilize tact. And send for Benedict. At once, Your Grace. Edward sat fuming at his desk before pushing himself up and pacing the room. Why did Benedict lie about knowing where she was? He knew I wanted to speak with her, to clear up the understanding between her father and me. He willed himself to be calm, reasoning there must be an explanation for the man's blatant disregard of his instructions. You summoned, Eddie? You have known where Sarah is all along and hid it from me. Edward growled, forgetting his resolve to remain impassive. How could you? Benedict's face tightened, and he stared angrily at his friend. She told you? He choked. I should have known not to trust a merchant's daughter. Edward froze at the words. What say you? He demanded. Honora knew of this too? You both schemed to hide it from me? Benedict hesitated with a response and shook his head. If she did not tell you, who did? It is I who will ask the questions. Edward snarled. What is the meaning of this? He rang the bell on his desk, summoning Susanna back to the study. Please, Eddie, you must understand that we are working within your best interest. Your Grace? Susanna reappeared in the doorway. Have you sent a messenger for Sarah? I was to do that now, Your Grace. No. Your Grace, you must not. Benedict pleaded. Just wait a moment and hear me before you do dash. Send for Miss Burney also. Edward instructed the maid, ignoring his longtime friend. At once. Yes, Your Grace. Before Susanna could leave, Benedict yelled out to stop her. You will not find her in Briar Hill. Susanna paused, casting Edward an uncertain look. She did not attend market today. Susanna offered. She is not at the market either. Benedict sighed. She has gone to visit Sarah Borthwick. Come again? Edward choked. You sent Honora to see Sarah? Have you taken leave of your senses? Shall I send for her at Shady Knoll? Susanna asked weakly seeming diminished by the brewing tension in the room. Yes. Edward called. No. Benedict insisted in unison. The men stared at one another for a long moment, their eyes clashing silently. A moment, Your Grace, please. Benedict said quietly. Before you decide. Leave us. Edward told Susanna, and she gratefully hurried from the study. What in God's name were you thinking? Of all the foolish, dangerous things to do, Carter. What if she encounters Abraham? He has already threatened her once. Lord only knows what he will do if he catches her in his house. He is out of his wits. You know that. I have it on good authority that Abraham is away from Shady Knoll today. 
Tis why we selected today for her to go. But why, Carter? I do not understand why. Sarah needs a female voice to reason with her. Benedict offered, and began to pace the room where Edward had stopped. She is being hidden away from the world, surrounded only by family. I believe that Honora can provide her with some comfort. Bollocks. Edward snapped, not believing a second of his friend's justifications. You do not have Sarah's best interests in your heart. Nay. Benedict shouted back. I have yours and the Duchy's, even if you are too stubborn to accept that. Someone must do something to end this ridiculousness, and you have done nothing. Edward's face flushed scarlet. I am the Duke of Blessington. He hissed. You are an adviser, Mr. Carter. Tis not your duty to scheme and set forth perilous plans which could endanger our charges. You put Honora in the middle of a battlefield armed with nothing but a piece of white cloth. I thought you wished for us to marry. I think you would make a fine pair. Benedict agreed. But not when she is leaving for London in a few days' time. Not when she is dead either. Edward yelled. I would rather have her in London than in the hands of a madman. The chances of getting her back from London are far greater. If this works, there will be no decision. She will remain, and you will not have to worry about Abraham Borthwick again. Edward could not believe the naivete of his friend's plan, but he also could not deny there was an element of hope growing inside him. You know I am right. Benedict insisted, nodding lightly. All you must do is wait. No. Edward said firmly, reaching for the bell again. I must do nothing of the sort. I am sending someone for her at once. If this does not work, and Sarah tells her father that Honora came to the house, then what? If Abraham was angry before, he will be murderous to learn of it. This ends now. Even if you send for her now, Eddie, the damage is already done. She has been gone for hours. Surely she has already spoken to Sarah. The plan is already underway, no matter what you do. Do not bother with the messenger. She will be returning soon. Edward started to argue, but before he could utter a word, the door handle turned again. Your Grace. The door flew open with such force, it banged against the wall and Edward whirled to stare at Eliza in shock. This is a private interview, Eliza, what dash? Please, forgive me, Your Grace, but you must come quickly. What is the meaning of this, Eliza? Benedict demanded, looking at the frenzied maid who spun to rush from the room. In the foyer, Susanna was already rushing up the stairwell in a breath of excitement. What is happening? Edward called to them. Where are you headed? It is Mrs. Bernie, your grace. Eliza cried from the top landing. Something is amiss. Blood rushed to Edward's ears as he sprinted after the house staff. What do you mean amiss? He demanded, but as he pushed his way through the half-dozen servants and stared down at the bed, it became very clear what was the issue. Marjorie Burney lay lifeless and cold against the linens, her gaunt face taking on a bluish tinge. What happened? Edward moaned, falling to his knees in distress. Who was with her when it happened? There was silence among the staff, and Edward looked up. Horrified at Benedict once he realized that Marjorie had died alone. Sent for Miss Burney at once. He whispered before placing his face back into his arms and praying for the old woman's eternal soul and his own. If you like our channel, please subscribe and make sure to click on the bell icon, so that you won't miss any future audiobooks we'll upload for free each week on YouTube. Chapter 18 there was a trace of nervousness she had never known as she approached Lord Cloverfield's land. It seemed to have commenced from the moment the carriage had left Briar Hill with John Henry at the reins. With each step of the horse's hooves, the knot in her stomach tightened until she was suddenly finding it difficult to breathe. Honora waved aside the impending feeling of doom, deeming herself silly for the mere thought of peril. You have narrowly missed being boarded by pirates in the past on journeys with Papa, 
she reminded herself. A simple interview is no cause for alarm. You will meet with Sarah Borthwick and be on your way before anyone is the wiser. If Abraham is to appear, he will not do you harm, not on his employer's property and not in the presence of his daughter. Honora hoped her assessment was accurate for she had no real knowledge of how Mr. Borthwick was apt to respond to an uninvited visitor at his cottage. Particularly one whom he had openly condemned for being a guest of the Duke of Blessington. She was relieved to note that the cottage seemed quiet as they neared, but she called out to John Henry, urging him to stop the carriage. I will walk the remainder of the way. She instructed him. The boy's eyes reflected concern, but Honora had come to understand that it was a perpetual look for the coachman. I would prefer to see you to the entrance. He insisted although he did stop. Honora was already scrambling to the ground, ignoring his words as she made her way toward the nondescript house in the center of the wide fields. He did not so much as warn me at the market the day Abraham Borthwick appeared, yet now he wishes to act as my governess. I do not need John Henry. I need no man at all. Honora did not need to remind herself that the coachman was a boy, not a man. You will wait here as instructed. She replied without turning her strides filled with a confidence she did not share with her heart. You must be brave and do this for Edward, even if he never knows of it. She could feel John Henry staring after her, his indecision damned near palpable as it followed her, but she did not bother to look over her shoulder at him as she cleared the short distance to the cottage. She steeled herself for whatever might lay ahead. In her mind, she had tried and discarded several approaches to speaking with Sarah Borthwick, it was difficult to know how she might address the issue at hand when she had so little first-hand knowledge of the situation. Even Mr. Carter had not enlightened her all that much. All she had was the information she had gleaned between the Duke, his adviser, and the wicked rumours which continued to circulate through the towns. Of course, his information is also secondary to the truth. My best way of speaking to Miss Borthwick is merely by listening to what she has to say if she does not order me from the property. She stepped across the picket fence line, inhaling deeply to collect courage from the sweetness of the air around her. It was a charming spot, small but quaint with white trim. Honora was reminded of the fairy books her mother would read to her, lulling her to sleep. There are no fairies within these walls. Honora did not hesitate, raising a fist to knock gently against the wood of the simple, arched door. She stepped back gathering her gloved hands against the folds of her yellow dress, waiting for signs of movement inside. For a worrisome moment, she wondered if somehow Sarah had ventured from the cottage, but it seemed unlikely, given what Honora had learned. Simultaneously, she hoped that she would not be there and that Honora would have more time to plan a conversation which might sway Sarah onto the right path. She is in hiding, shamed by the district. She would not chance being seen about, would she? Again. Honora penetrated the mystery that she had no true way of knowing anything as fact, and she instantly wished she had gathered more solid information before venturing forth on the quest. "'Tis too late now for such regrets,' she amused, craning her bonneted head toward the windows. She did not wish to invade Sarah's privacy, but she felt rather conspicuous standing in plain view of the Cloverfield estate where anyone from the main house might see her and demand to know what business she had being there. I need not justify visiting a friend, Honoro understood, but she also knew that she was not Sarah's friend, at least not for the time being. She did not wish to be discovered by anyone. Again, she rapped against the door, glancing uneasily over the ruffles of her dress to look at the mansion in the distance. She expected a flock of angry servants to descend upon her from the main house, demanding she explain her presence. Who is there? Honora exhaled with relief. Albeit raspy and coarse, the voice was undoubtedly that of a woman and she stood near the door. Miss Borthwick, may I enter? Who are you? She demanded again. I have no interest in peddlers. Lord Cloverfield has banished them from his land. You must leave. I am not a peddler. Honora replied quickly. I am a friend. There was a snort of contempt followed by a long silence, and Honora waited, wondering if she had been dismissed. Please, Miss Borthwick. I am called Nora. She offered, attempting to keep the urgency from her tone. 
she did not wish to alarm Sarah, her desire was only to put the woman at ease. Who are you? Sarah demanded again. I know no Nora. I am a friend of the Duke of Blessington. There was a sharp intake of breath which Honora heard through the thickness of the door. Edward sent you? Sarah choked, throwing the door open to stare at Honora with worried eyes. Why? Is he harmed? Honora was taken aback by what she saw. She was not certain what she had been expecting. But the gaunt blonde with haunted blue eyes and unkempt tangles was not what she had envisioned when she thought of Sarah Borthwick. Perhaps she had thought of a more elegant woman or sweeter in some fashion. Yet this woman. Honora could not reconcile how the girl had come to befriend the Duke at all, but this was neither the time nor the place for such musings. Honora had a mission to accomplish, and she would not be deterred by the bedraggled appearance of the house secretary's daughter. Perhaps, beneath it all, she is a lovely woman, full of wits. May I come in? Honora asked again her own nervousness becoming difficult to stifle. The longer she spent in plain view, the greater the chances of someone seeing her and reporting her visit to Abraham Borthwick. Whether or not the man was on the property was irrelevant. Should he learn about the visit, what would he do? Honora shuddered to imagine what might happen, if not to her but to Edward. The man had already proven himself unstable. It was exceedingly risky to provoke a madman. She shoved the thought of the girl's father from her mind and refocused her attention upon Sarah and her quest. Please. She implored, her eyes beseeching. She wished to show Sarah that she meant no harm, that her business there was not to be met with suspicion. Yes. Sarah said, begrudgingly, extending the door to permit her entry. It was then that Honora saw that she still padded about in her nightclothes, despite the hour nearing noon. She eyed Sarah, unsure if she should offer to wait as she dressed, but Honora quickly assessed that the blonde waif had no interest in tending to her appearance. It was obvious in the chaos within the cottage. Never had Honora been in such an untidy home, dishes were strewn about, unwashed clothes in every corner of the three rooms. There was an inch of dirt caked about the floor and minimally a week's worth of dust settled upon the furniture. Honora desperately wished to begin cleaning an inherent domestic sense overtaking her, but she dared not, lest she offends the girl who flopped unceremoniously upon a wingback chair which had seen much better days. Stuffing sprung impartially from holes and Honora was of the distinct impression that some vermin had made it home. Unladylike, Sarah thrust her legs over the arms of the seat, waving her bare, dirty feet like she was a baby learning her legs. Honora forced her mouth not to gape in shock as she wondered what had brought Sarah Borthwick to such a place. Surely, she had not always been such a fright, and traces of her original beauty still lingered beneath the deadpan expression on her face. Her dignity is gone, her sense of pride. Will she waste away here in this cottage or will she continue her descent into a clear madness? Honora was unbearably sad for the girl and furious at the man who had put her in such a position. What choices did Sarah have but to confine herself away from the titters and gossip of the towns? She was disgraced, after all. Abraham's personal agenda did nothing but keep the fires of gossip burning brightly, and Sarah simply melted away as if she had never existed. Her future was undoubtedly that of an old maid if she did not do something drastic to herself. A pang of worry pierced Honora's heart as she understood that Sarah Borthwick was in the throes of melancholy and apt to do something dangerous to herself. She should not be left unattended, even for short periods. Even I can see she intends to do herself harm. Idly, a twisted thought occurred to Honora, perhaps that was Abraham's intention all along. If he merely sent her away, she would be watched. Here, if she did something irreversible to harm herself, more cold shivers twined against Honora's backbone. He is her father. No father would ever do such a thing to his child, regardless of how great he felt his shame might be. You may sit if you can find a place. She offered, but Honora chose to remain standing. Even if she were able to find such a place, she could not be certain it would not be rife with lies. I will not take much of your time. Honora told her slowly, trying to keep her expression neutral as she peered about at the mess among them. What has he done to Edward? Sarah asked dully. Is he hurt? Not yet. 
Honora replied quietly. But I fear that if things continue in this fashion that your father will ensure that the Duke falls swiftly and without hope of reclaiming his own reputation. Sarah's clear eyes seemed shadowed with emotions which Honora could not quite place. And what would you have me do? She spat bitterly. I am a fallen woman. I hardly hold any favor in my father's eyes. Honora's own eyes narrowed slightly, wondering if Sarah was daft or simply too mad to understand the proper course to take in her state of mind. You must tell him that Edward was not the father of your child, of course. If he understood that he offered to marry you as a dash. As an act of pity? She screeched bolting upright quite suddenly, startling Honora. She gasped at the abrupt movement, stepping back, a slender hand over her throat. She could not help looking at Sarah as if she was a rabid ferret. Her father was capable of violence. Is she also? Honora had never thought that Sarah might be a danger until that moment, but Mr. Carter would have mentioned such a possibility. Would he not, Edward? Sarah spat, catching the informal slip of tongue Honora had used. Are you in a courtship with him now? Honora's face flushed crimson as she recognized her gaffe calling the duke by his given name. But it seemed the least of Sarah's immediate anger as she continued to speak without affording Honora an opportunity to respond. Have you not ears? Sarah growl was close to menacingly. She did not rise from her spot, but her body was posed like a cat on the prowl intending to lunge from her seat and pin Honora to the ground. My father will heed what I have to say. He is hell-bent on avenging my situation even though he is responsible for it. Goose flesh prickled on Nora's arms as she tried to make sense of what Sarah was saying. How can her father be responsible for her situation? Does she mean because he continues to fan the flames of malicious whispering? I do not understand. She said finally. Miss Borthwick, you must explain yourself at once. Sarah's face went slack, a deadened look falling upon her eyes from having said far too much. Her rigid body relaxed against the chair and she began to rock slightly, her legs twitching beneath the flimsy material of her gown. He told you. She murmured slowly. He vowed he would not. He told me nothing. Honora insisted, reasoning that it was important she gain Sarah's trust. I have come here on my own accord and in fear of my own safety. Sarah studied her closely, attempting to gauge the truth of her words. Who are you? Honora Burney. I am a guest at Briar Hill. She explained, looking about for a place to perch her rump. She needed to reach the girl, even if she was half crazed. Honora knew she could not return to the estate without having tried her best to convince Sarah to speak with her father. How can you know that Edward was not the father of my child if he did not tell you? Honora knew she had been caught in a lie but she did not give away her position so easily. It is easy to glean the honor of a man when you rest in close quarters. Honora replied. I dare say, he would never have taken advantage of a woman, much less a dear friend. Sarah's pale mouth parted, and Honora noted a slight quiver in her lip but she managed to catch herself. She has experience in keeping her emotions under the surface. Tis the marking of a girl reared in a noble household. She also knows precisely how to keep a secret at all costs. He is too honorable. She agreed after a short silence. Tis his downfall. Tis how I knew I could trust him to never betray my confidence. Miss Borthwick, all has gone too far now. Your father has committed arson in his misguided notions that the Duke is responsible for you. Sarah peered at her, face shocked. A fire? Were there injuries dot or worse? She gasped but Honora shook her sand-colored braid softly. Nay, not this time. She murmured. That is not to say we will be so fortunate the next time. Sarah shook her head in disbelief. I was foolish. She muttered. I should never have called off the engagement when I lost the baby. It was Honora's turn to be stunned. This revelation was news to her. You called off the marriage. She repeated. Why? 
It seemed impossible that a woman in her position would do anything so reckless. Sarah must have foreseen what would have come of such an action. Sarah laughed mirthlessly, closing her eyes, caught up in the memory. Edward did not wish to marry me. He did it to preserve my honor only. There was no need for him to wed below his class after. She trailed off as if the wind had been knocked from her and she shook her head. After the baby was lost. Honora knew the tale behind the loss of the child, but she dared not ask for the story, knowing that Edward had not been the one responsible for the beating which had caused the baby's premature demise. Did her own father beat her so severely that it caused her to lose the child? Was it done willfully? Is that what she meant when she claimed Abraham responsible for her situation? The ideas filled Honora with horror and she swallowed the lump in her throat, willing the terrifying image from her mind. She could not envision a father being so cruel to his own daughter, not when her own father loved her so truly. I am blessed in this world. I must not judge. If I had known what would transpire afterward. Sarah continued as if she had forgotten that Honora was there. I would have married Edward if only to save him from the reign of fury my father had planned. Sarah. Honora said urgently, leaning forward to extend a gloved hand toward the trembling woman. Tis not too late to rectify what has been done. You must explain Dash. You know nothing. Sarah roared, leaping abruptly from her spot, thrusting a finger outward. Leave my home at once and do not return. You cannot stop what has been started here. The compassion which Honora felt vanished at once. You claim that the Duke is an honorable man. You have taken advantage of his honor when he did nothing but help you. Have you no shame? A slow, cruel smile formed on Sarah's waxen lips. Shame? She echoed the word seeming to roll about in her mouth. You speak to me about shame? Sarah, you have made a terrible mistake, but Edward does not need to suffer for it. Honora insisted. She could feel frustration mounting inside her. She could not understand why the girl was being so hard-headed about setting facts right with Abraham. It was but a conversation to be had, nothing more. Was she so mad that she enjoyed the endless suffering bestowed upon her father? It did not seem so. Honora could read a genuine sadness in the depth of her blue eyes. You are in love with him. The sentence was flat and void of any emotion but it chilled Honora to think she had thieved the blonde's bow. Ridiculous. Honora chided herself, but that did little to alleviate the guilt she felt. I am but a houseguest who is influenced by the havoc your father is wreaking about the duchy. Honora replied firmly, but she remained on point, attempting one last time to speak her peace. You have the power to end this, Sarah. I do hope you will find it in your heart to dash. The door to the cottage flew inward and both women choked in shock as a tall, thin man appeared at the threshold. There was something elusively familiar about him, but Honora could not immediately place where she had seen him previously. Perhaps in the towns? The answer did not come to her freely and she turned her attention to him with alarmed curiosity. How uncouth it was for a man to simply burst his way inside Sarah's home without so much as a call of warning. Are you Miss Burney? The man demanded, striding forward, his brow furrowed in concentration. Honora glanced at Sarah who shot her eyes downward and sank back into her chair. She did not seem the least bit alarmed by the sudden arrival. It was clear the blonde knew the man, but she did not speak one word to him, nor did she open her mouth to introduce him to her. She seemed to retreat back into herself cocooning herself into a bubble of security and was no longer aware of what else was happening around her. I am. She replied firmly, hoping her voice did not betray the nervousness seizing her body. Who might you be? You must return to Briar Hill at once, Miss Burney. He said, reaching to pull her from the cottage, ignoring the question. Honora was instantly furious at the unwarranted movement. I will return when I am good and ready. Honoro snapped, wrenching her arm back in defiance. How dare you burst into this home without announcing yourself? How dare you put your hands on me? The man gazed at Sarah but she did not look up. I need not announce myself in my own home. He replied evenly, his eyes flashing. And I suggest you do as you are told. 
I only meant to urge you along, not harm you, Miss Burney. The words took Honora aback. She had not followed that there was another living among the cottage with Sarah and her father, but before she could demand to know who he was, Sarah spoke. Nora, you must leave now. Honora did not argue, sensing that if she remained, trouble would ensue, despite the man's assurances that he meant her no harm. Such impertinence. Honora snapped haughtily, spinning to leave. I never dash. I suggest you save the histrionics for another time. The man retorted. You have been sent for by the Duke of Blessington. There is a messenger outside. Your grandmother has passed. We are sorry for your loss, Miss Burney. Chapter 19 Edward stood outside the apartment, peering at the statue-like form as the servant paused to address him. You must speak with her. Susanna urged, her face pinched with worry. I have offered to relieve her but she will not speak to me, your grace. I fear for Miss Burney's health. Edward knew that Betty's advice was sound, but his previous attempts to speak with Honora had failed terribly. She had been holding vigil for two days in the back salon where the funeral furnisher had set up the room in black cloth. The funeral was arranged for the following morrow, but Honora had not eaten nor slept since receiving news of Marjorie's death. She remained in the same dress she had worn upon returning home from Shady Knoll. I will see to it. Edward sighed. But Susanna was not convinced by his words. Your Grace, if anything should happen to her before Mr. Burney returns, Susanna. He snarled. Tis beyond your scope to dictate such a thing to me. Carry on with your chores. Susanna's face flushed, and she lowered her eyes, curtsying slightly in apology. Yes, Your Grace. She disappeared and Edward felt a stab of shame as she flitted away, knowing that she was correct. It was a devastating loss that Marjorie had died while in his care. He could not risk something happening to Honora in the aftermath. And the reason has little to do with William Burney although I am not looking forward to delivering such sad news when he returns. He was sincerely concerned for the woman who sat like a statue beside the purple-lined coffin which Edward had ordered. The instructions to the funeral furnisher had been simple, ensure the services were lavish and with no expense spared. He knew he could not afford to spend the money but what choice did he have in the matter? Honora did not hear him enter the room, despite the old wood creaking beneath his feet. She was far too absorbed in her own thoughts or prayers as she stared blankly at her grandmother's ghastly face. Nora, you must come away from there. He sighed, dispensing of any formalities. He was unsure she would hear him as his past attempts to reach her had been futile, her grief far too intense. As he expected, she did not respond, nor did she blink her reddened eyes to acknowledge his arrival. He lowered himself to crouch at her side, unsure of what else he could do to attract her attention. He did not know how she would react to being touched, but he wished to reach out and touch her face, to guide her eyes toward him. I will sit with her. He offered again one he had made previously but still, there was no response. The sound of footfalls attracted him toward the doorway where Benedict stood, gesturing for him to come. I will return in a moment. He told her, wondering why he was bothering to waste his words. It seemed there was little he could do but wait for Honora to dispel her anguish. What is it? Edward asked, well nigh cross with the interruption but he knew his ire was not with Benedict so much as it was with the unexpected situation. The coachman has arrived from London. Benedict announced. What? The Duke asked, unsure of what the adviser meant. Which coachman? Who is here? The one whom Miss Burney and her grandmother sent for to take them home. Benedict explained. Edward gaped at him in shock. My God! He snapped. Why are you here and not dealing with such nonsense? You must send him away before she learns of this. What will I have him do? Return to London? Of course. What else do you propose? Edward could not comprehend Benedict's question, and while he knew he was fatigued from the events of the week, he did not see the issue which Benedict did with such apparent clarity. 
Benedict shook his head slowly and Edward peered at him suspiciously. What is it? He demanded, his nerves too taut for such foolery. He did not wish to guess what was on his friend's mind. Please, Carter, out with it before I lose my temper. What if Miss Burney wishes to return to London following the funeral? The idea pierced Edward's heart as it had not occurred to him in the wake of all that had happened. She cannot. He heard himself say before he could stop himself. She must remain until her father returns. Forgive me, Eddie. Benedict muttered, looking over the Duke's shoulder. I dare say that she will do precisely as she pleases, regardless of your wishes. If I send the coachman away, she may call for him and be resentful of you for making such a decision on her behalf. Perhaps you should consult Miss Burney on the matter. Edward conceded that his friend had a point. A deep-seated part of him believed that Honora blamed him for Marjorie's death but he could not be certain, not when she had not spoken but a word in days. If I send her man away and she intends to leave, I will only be fueling her animus toward me. For a fleeting moment, Edward longed for a time when his biggest concern was the insurmountable debt of the duchy. Of course in those days, I had not known Honora Burney. Perhaps, in spite of it all, I am better off now. I will speak with her. He agreed and returned to where Honora sat. He reclaimed his position at her side, but this time he did not stop himself from reaching for her hand. He was shocked at the iciness of her pale fingers, but she did not flinch. She also did not return his touch. She merely continued to sit as if she was a garden fountain, still and expressionless. Nora, your driver has arrived from London. If possible, her spine seemed to grow more rigid and slowly, as if she was made of rusting metal. She turned her head to stare at him uncomprehendingly. He was expecting a creaking noise to emit from her rose petal lips when they parted to make words for the first time in days. Michael? She whispered, her tone gritty. He has come? Yes. Edward replied softly, his pulse quickening as he waited for her response. What shall I tell him? Honoro seemed to be looking directly through him but he noticed her fingers curled slightly into his as she absorbed the information. Grandmama wished to be home. She murmured, tears filling her red-rimmed eyes but they remained in place, unshed. Perhaps she knew her time was coming and that was her reasoning. Why did I not take her home when she asked? Edward wised up to the fact that Honora was filled with the same guilt which had enshrouded him since learning of Marjorie's death. You would have been alone in London if you had. He offered gently. Tis a blessing she was surrounded by capable staff to care for her until dot until her end. Perhaps she would not have died if dash. No. Edward said sharply. You must not forget that if she had not come here, we would never have learned about her heart or the apoplexy. I dare say that she lived longer under our care than she would have in London. You cannot know that. The anguish in Honora's voice struck him deeply, and not for the first time did he wonder what it was like to be loved and love someone as deeply as the Burnies did for one another. She must return to London. She must be buried with our family, with my mother. She must be close to my father and I so we can visit her grave often. I will see her remains brought there following the funeral, Honora. You must not fret. Her jade eyes bugged slightly as another thought occurred to her. The expenses. She choked. I, I will see to the expenses, of course. Nora, look at me. He raised a hand and softly cupped her cheek, turning her ashen face to his. Her lower lip quivered as he spoke. You must not fret. He told her again. I have tended to all the arrangements. My concern now is your health. You must eat and rest. I will stay here with Marjorie and hold vigil if you wish, but you must remain strong for her. She would not wish to see you in such a state. A light glimmered in her eyes and she nodded. Yes. She murmured, a sad smile forming on her lips as she gazed lovingly at her grandmother. Yes, she would loathe to see me sobbing. I can almost hear her voice chastising me. 
Another small sob escaped her lips, but she swallowed it before it could escalate beyond the air between them. She rose unsteadily from her chair and Edward was on his feet, his arm extended for her to take. He was unreasonably pleased with her strength, considering her lack of nutrition and rest in the past days. I will see you to your room and have Susanna bring you food. He told her as they shuffled toward the door. Edward turned to Benedict who remained in the shadows, cocking his head expectantly as he waited for an answer about the coachman. Mr. Carter, will you stand vigilant till I return? He asked but he did not wait for a reply as he led Honora away from the back salon and toward the servant stairs. Forgive me. Honora murmured as they climbed, her step seeming laborious in her weakened state. You have much to concern yourself with and I need not add to your troubles. I do not consider you a trouble. He assured her, squeezing her hand gently as she clung to his upper arm. I am sorry for your loss. Know that I will do all I can to ensure your grandmother is laid to a most peaceful rest. Even through the cotton, her hand was chilled. Despite the mild temperatures outside, he vowed to start the fireplace in her apartment as they entered. He wished for Honora to feel warm and secure. You are very kind, your grace. She mumbled. I am unworthy of your generosity. Edward paused and stared at her. It seemed an odd statement to make, even in her somewhat delirious frame of mind. That is simply untrue. He replied. And you must not forget that you have helped the duchy with your adept bookkeeping skills. Honora untangled her arm from his and made her way to the bed, collapsing against the pillows in exhaustion. Edward turned toward the hearth and began to busy himself with the fire. After she eats and sleeps before the fireplace, she will be in a much better state, he thought confidently. He hoped he was right. Selfish as it seemed, he longed for the company of the woman who had become his friend in the past weeks. The Elnora who lay upon the mattress was a mere umbra of that woman. I have failed you. Honora muttered and Edward thought he had misunderstood as he turned to face her. Come again? I have failed you. She repeated, pulling herself up, a mass of unruly waves falling over her face. With Sarah? Chills shot through him but he willed himself to force a smile. He would be untruthful if he said he had not wondered what had happened with Sarah and Honora, but when had there been a time to ask? Tis unimportant. He said gruffly turning back toward the fireplace, but he could not deny the information was disappointing. Why are you surprised? You knew nothing could come of such an encounter. If Sarah had wished to set her father straight, she would have done so long ago. Tis important. Honora protested, but Edward would not hear of her upsetting herself on the subject any further. It was not her responsibility to cope with the Borthwicks, it was his. Honora, he sighed. You must not concern yourself with such trite matters at this time. He paused and studied her face as she reluctantly fell back against the pillows, her half-closed eyes still fixated on him. It is not trite. She breathed, but even as she spoke, her words were carried away in whispers. Honora. He called gently. What should I do with the coachman? Oh. She breathed. Michael. He waited, silence ensuing and for a moment, he was certain she had fallen asleep, but as he pivoted to leave her alone in the chambers, she spoke again. Send him home. She declared. He paused mid-step and turned to face her. Yes? She managed to lift her head again and nodded slowly, her next sentence filling him with hope. I will not leave Briar Hill until Papa returns. My place is clearly here. Is her place here with me? Edward found himself wondering, but he dared not entertain such a brazen thought. Life in the duchy was much too unstable to entertain romance. No matter how difficult my feelings for Honora are becoming to deny. Chapter 20 The service was lovely although Honora could not help feeling that her grandmother would have despised the way the strangers spoke of her. On the second day, after she had been rested and fed, she had sent word to London, knowing it was far too late for her grandmother's friends to arrive, the mails being slow. 
The letters would not reach their destinations until Marjorie was already bound back to London to be buried in the family plot. They will hopefully receive word by then and arrive at her graveside to say their goodbyes, Honora thought shamefully, wondering how she had permitted herself to fall apart. She recognized that her grandmother's friends were quite elderly and would, therefore, be unable to make the journey to Blessington regardless but that did little to lessen her guilt. If not for Edward, I would still be sitting stock still staring at a corpse. Honora cast the Duke a sidelong look as the minister finished his sermon, and the house staff bowed their heads in silent prayer. He looked at her precisely at the same moment and twisted his mouth into a warm smile. She could see he was trying to comfort her, even from the distance between them across the coffin. She had considered going to London to bury her grandmother but the words she had spoken to Edward remained true even in the sensible light of morning. Her place was at Briar Hill, even if temporarily until her father returned from his journey. Perhaps Marjorie had confirmed it by dying so close to their return home. Or perhaps I am being superstitious, she thought. Whatever the reason, Honora knew that she would remain. The servants at her home in London were prepared for Marjorie's arrival, Michael being sent ahead to notify them of her death. Amen. The minister intoned and there was a gentle chorus echoing his prayer ending. She watched as the pallbearers lifted the casket to load onto the waiting wagon which would bring Marjorie home. Once more, Honora was struck by a mournful chord and she craned to look at the closed unit as if to say goodbye one last time. Oh, Grandmama, forgive Papa for not being here. Forgive me for not being at your side for your last minutes. I will spend my life regretting that I was not there. She had not felt the tears rolling down her cheeks beneath the black veil until someone touched the sleeves of her dress. As she turned, she hastily dabbed at her eyes with ebony gloves, but Edward produced a handkerchief for her. She accepted it gratefully, turning her head slightly so he would not see her display. Thank you, Your Grace. He did not respond as Honora collected herself, finally pulling the lace from her face to peer at him with a timid smile. Forgive me she murmured. Nonsense. He replied sternly. You have nothing for which to be forgiven. You are holding yourself together quite well given the circumstances. She had no way of knowing if he was merely flouting or if he was genuinely admirable of her composure. I have arranged for wine and cheese to be served in the mess. He explained. I do not know how many to expect. Not many. Honora sighed. I fear I did not perform my diligence and inform my grandmother's companions in a timely fashion. I have failed Grandmama. Nay. He insisted. There will be a celebration of her life, I assure you. How could I have forsaken to send notices? I must produce an obituary. Oh, how could I have left so much to be done? Tis to be expected in a time of loss. Edward replied, extending his arm to lead her away from the salon. No one shall fault you for such a thing. I imagine her friends are quite advanced in age. A four-hour journey by carriage is much for brittle bones to endure. Honora did not answer but she found herself staring at him admiringly, knowing she had thought the same way. Perhaps he and I have more in common than I initially pictured, she thought although Honora was not sure why she was surprised. Each day it seemed that she learned something more about the misunderstood Duke, things which she found endearing. How could anyone believe he was the man they claimed? He has lived here his whole life, and yet the commoners and noblemen alike believe the terrible tales they heard about him. It made Honora wonder if anyone truly knew Edward. Sarah Borthwick knew him. He trusted her enough to protect her honor and she betrayed his trust. Abraham Borthwick knew him and now he is prepared to ruin him. Everyone who has ever been close to Edward has hurt him, and yet he does not grow embittered and angry. Would I be so forgiving? Would I protect someone's secret if it endangered me? Honora admitted to herself that she would not. Mind you, I have never been afforded long-term friendships with all the travel I have done with Papa. She did not wish to judge Edward's decision, but as she attempted to understand his reasons, she confessed that she was lost at what kept him so steadfastly silent. Perhaps you should return to your chambers and rest. Edward suggested, apparently mistaking her quiet for exhaustion. 
You have endured quite a lot in the past days. I would prefer to greet those who were kind enough to attend. She replied, even though she knew none of the people in her midst. The servants and Benedict Carter were the only recognizable faces, and Honora wondered where Edward had found the others. Judging from their dress and manners, she assumed they were of noble standing, in attendance merely to gain favor with the Duke. I will introduce you to the guests. Edward offered again, did he just read her mind? And she was becoming less stunned by his ability to do so. She nodded and accepted his arm as they moved toward a gaggle of handsomely dressed men and their wives. He paused before a couple standing slightly to the side, sipping on glasses of port. Miss Honora Burney, permit me to introduce the Baron of Cloverfield and his wife, Lady Emily Cloverfield. Edward offered, and Honora whipped her head to stare at him in shock. That introduction is scandalous, she thought, but as she read the bemused smile on the Duke's face, she understood he had done it purposely. The Cloverfields were apparently annoyed with the improper introduction but were cultured enough to make no comment, particularly under such circumstances. I cannot imagine how he would think to lead with my name in the presence of royalty. He certainly is impish. Charmed. Lord Cloverfield said, taking Honora's hand and pressing his lips to the velvet of her glove. Albeit, I had hoped to meet you under happier tidings. I am terribly sorry for your loss, my dear. Thank you. Honora replied, a slight confusion touching her as his words registered. I appreciate you coming, considering you do not know either me or my grandmother. Oh, but we have heard so much about you. Lady Cloverfield giggled in a childlike way unbecoming for a woman of her age. She was by no means elderly but a girl of ten and two, she was not. Is that a fact? Honora murmured her eyes closing slightly with wariness. How could she be subject to gossip when she had made herself so scarce? Heavens, I have barely been to market a handful of instances since I arrived and Abraham Borthwick threatened me. How could they possibly have known anything about me? Inadvertently, Honora shifted her eyes around the apartment, her gaze resting on Benedict Carter. Has he been telling tales out of school? Oh yes, my dear. Lord Cloverfield chuckled dryly. Everyone has been most eager to cast eyes on the witty and charming Honora Burney. Your father's reputation precedes him, of course, and knowing that you have been hiding beneath our noses has been quite the stir of conversation. I hope I do not disappoint. Honora offered, forcing a smile upon her lips. But I fear I am rather a dull subject. Nonsense, my dear. Cloverfield chortled, clapping Edward on the back. As you must know by now, where women are involved, his grace is legendary. You must regale us with tales of how he has treated you. A protest of defensiveness sprang to Honora's lips, but Edward interjected quickly. I dare say, Lord Cloverfield, that you allow your manservant to run rampant with his mouth and misdeeds simply so you will have entertainment. The Baron released a mirthless laugh but he seemed game for the banter, even if it made Honora uncomfortable. I imagine it is a difficult concept for you to grasp, your grace, not being a father, but men are particularly protective of their daughters. I cannot fault Abraham for being upset. Upset I understand, committing crimes against my estate is quite another matter entirely. Of course, I reckon you are having a difficult time of it all, what, with your own horde of bantlings. I do pray that none of them become men like Abraham Borthwick. The men's eyes met in a silent clash of wills, tensions mounting between them. Honora cast Lady Cloverfield a look, but she seemed half drunk already, a peaceful beam upon her face. She does not understand what is transpiring here, Honora thought in disbelief. How can one be so oblivious? Honora wished that the Duke had not chosen that moment to show Lord Cloverfield his displeasure in how he was handling Abraham Borthwick, but the cat was already sprung from the bag. There was little she could do but watch whatever might unfold. He only brought it forth because Lord Cloverfield goaded him through me. Edward feels as if he is defending my honor. Tis amusing you bring this forth today. Lord Cloverfield said suddenly, breaking his eyes apart from Edward's. I have come bearing gifts. Gifts? 
Edward echoed, but Honora could not shake the sense that the Lord's present was not something for which he truly hoped. A peace offering. Cloverfield said raising his head toward the doorway. With a mounting sense of dread, Honora also turned to look where Cloverfield's eyes had rested. Her heart leapt upward into her throat, and at her side, she heard Edward release a gasp of air, the feel of his breath fluttering the veil atop her head. Abraham Borthwick stood in the doorway of the mess hall. Even from the immense space, Honora could see his eyes flashing with defiance. Dread filled her gut as she whirled back around to confront the Baron, but Edward was already speaking. What in God's name is the meaning of this? The Duke hissed, his good humor evaporated. Remove him from the premises before he hurts someone. He stepped between Honora, intending to protect her from the simple glare of the house servant. Lord Cloverfield laughed gaily and rose a hand to gesture Abraham forward. You are much too dramatic, Your Grace. I have invited Mr. Bothwick here to show he is prepared to leave the past where it belongs, behind us. I have no dash. You have sought a truce for months, Your Grace. Lord Cloverfield interrupted as Abraham neared them. I am presenting it to you on a silver platter. Edward and Honora shared a nervous look as Abraham glowered at them. Ah, Mr. Borthwick, tell his grace what you came to say. Lord Cloverfield chirped. Honora could not begin to understand what Cloverfield was thinking as Abraham lowered his head. I have come to say that I no longer hold any ill will toward you, your grace. I accept that my daughter disgraced herself and is the only one to blame for the events which occurred. Honora watched as Edward's eyes clouded, apparently upset that the man was so willing to renounce his own child, but he wisely did not contradict the apology. Honora could read his thoughts as if he were speaking aloud at that moment. How convenient that he should choose to apologize after causing such destruction to the barn and creating terror among the household. I do hope we can move forward from this experience. Abraham continued in a rehearsed fashion. Honora wondered with what Lord Cloverfield had coerced Abraham into making such a statement when it was obvious the man did not mean a word he said. He is likely in danger of losing his home and employment. You see? Lord Cloverfield boomed happily, attracting rather disapproving looks from the mourners. All is forgiven, ye? Abraham did not raise his eyes as he waited for the duke to speak, his shoulders visibly tense, and Honora could feel the air grow thicker among them. Well? Cloverfield demanded, somewhat impatiently. What say you, your grace? Of course all is forgiven. Edward replied slowly, casting Honora a look through his side vision. Carry on. Abraham spun to leave but as he passed Honora, he paused, a barely audible whisper escaping his lips. He was gone before Honora could call attention to his chilling words, leaving her to stare open-mouthed after him. Did he say something to you? Edward asked, leaning to speak into her ear discreetly, and Honora nodded slowly, her heart pounding dangerously against her ribs so that she feared it might leap clean from her chest. What did he say? Honora turned her head toward him the color having drained from her cheeks. He said, if I ever visited his daughter again, he would strangle the life from my body with his bare hands. Chapter 21 The days after the funeral brought torrential rain to Blessington. God was bestowing his own grief upon the household in a mass of tears, which started the night Marjorie Burney left to be buried and continued for three long days. Edward could focus on little but the sound of the driving force outside the windows and the darkness which seemed to be closing around Briar Hill. There was a heavy silence, one reminiscent of when his father was alive. Edward had been a marquis, avoiding the man at all costs as he slunk through the vast halls of the manor house. The brightness which Honora and her grandmother had bestowed upon the home seemed to have disappeared with Marjorie. It was a terrible foreshadowing of things to come, Edward was certain. The walls were ink, seeping through to suffocate all who lived inside. It was only a matter of time before the saturnine temperament took full hold. The threat which Abraham Borthwick had uttered was not forsaken, particularly not by Edward although he could not be sure the same was true of Honora. She portrayed a face which showed nothing but cheer, 
yet even the most observant could see it was a farce as she struggled to regain her footing without her grandmother. The woman had been more than her grandmother, Edward reminded himself. She was a mother and confidant. They were friends, in spite of the years spanning between them. It occurred to him that she did not speak of friends in London and he wondered if she had many acquaintances. Your Grace? Are you well? He turned away from the window where he had been staring out, too lost in his thoughts to smile warmly at Honora. I am simply wondering how many more days we are destined for rain. He replied, a modicum of truth in his reply. That was one of the many thoughts I was having, he reasoned. I dare say, if it should continue, we will face flooding conditions. Honora agreed, crossing the space to join him at the elegant front window. Perhaps I should send for a boat, lest we need start a knock. He jested, and she laughed. Edward had forgotten how musical the timbre of her laugh was to his ears. I have not heard her chuckle in the days of late. I will round up whatever animals I can find. Honora teased in return and he guffawed. I always marveled at the tale of Noah. Imagine the stench he must have endured upon that boat. One lone man to care for all those animals. I have ridden upon a boat transporting animals. Honora admitted. Twas a reek I would rather soon forget. Have you? He asked, his eyes shining with appreciation. I oft forget that you have travelled the world. Not the world precisely but I have been to many places. You must regale me with accounts of your journeys. Edward insisted, patting the pillow beside him for her to join at the window seat. If you have not other matters which to attend. She looked at the close quarters, and Edward noted a touch of pink on her cheeks, but she sat. He exhaled as she did, but he had not realized he had been holding his breath. She instills nervousness in me, and the understanding made him both uneasy and warm simultaneously. They both turned to stare back into the storm, but Edward was quite aware of her nearness. What stories can I recount? She asked lightly, but he could also hear the slight nervousness in her tone. Tis not I who makes her uncomfortable. She feels the bond tentatively growing between us. Or so I like to think. He hoped he was not imagining things, but it had been such a long while since he had been in a courtship, and Honora Burney was unlike any woman he was likely to meet in Blessington. Tell me when you began to join your father on his trips. He suggested. What age were you? Honora turned her head to stare at him, blinking, confused by the question. I cannot say. She answered honestly. I do not recall a time when I did not go with him. Edward was surprised by the response. Even when your mother was alive? He asked. She permitted her girl child to go abroad? She oft came along. Honora replied, a small beam forming on her lips as a memory of her mother seemed to surface. She was such an adventurous soul. Papa swore that she was half gypsy. There was nowhere we did not go where she did not become part of the culture. She was meant to travel and explore. It was no true shock that she married a man like Papa, even if it was not much by choice. Edward's brow furrowed. It was arranged? He asked, but Honora shook her head. Not in the formal sense. She replied quickly and he could see she regretted raising the subject of her mother. My papa believes he was the only man she could tolerate. Edward was unsure if she meant it in jest, but he found himself fascinated by the lives of the Burneys. Your mother sounds as if she and your grandmother had much in common with one another. I cannot say. Honora replied softly. I do not much recall how they interacted, but if I had to venture a guess, I would imagine the opposite to be true. They share too many commonalities? Edward suggested, and she nodded, giggling. I dare say tensions must have been high in the household. Honora agreed. Yet Grandmama always spoke highly of Mama. I believe that she loved her very much, despite their stubbornness. I have never seen a more loving family than yours. You have been through much together it seems. 
Honora's eyes bored into his, and her smile faded. We have not endured nearly what you have, Edward. She murmured and his pulse quickened. It was the first time she had ever called him by his first name, and it had precisely the effect he had expected. We all have our crosses to bear. He said gruffly, holding her eyes with his. Tis what we do with our burdens which make us stronger in the end. She nodded slightly and broke her gaze to look back out into the rain. The desire to touch her again was strong, but he dared not, lest he ruin the moment of closeness they shared. I suppose your father will permit you to travel again. He offered optimistically, but she scoffed lightly. I find that unlikely. She sounded forlorn, and Edward wished he knew what went through her mind. He did not have long to wonder as she spoke her thoughts aloud. Before we came here, she sighed. Papa expressed his desire to see me married. Edward's heart thudded with such power, he was shocked she could not hear it. Or perhaps she is able and I am fooling no one, he amused. You have already expressed that you have no interest in marriage. Will he insist? A wry grin formed on her lips. Nay. Papa is much too clever to attempt force with me. He does not much care for conflict, particularly ones of the feminine variety. However, that does not mean he will not see other ways of ensuring it occurs. Edward was puzzled by the enigmatic conversation. If you have decided not to marry, and he will not insist upon it, how does he intend to see it through? She eyed him through her peripheral vision. He had hoped that you and I would find common ground, I am certain. Hence the reason for sending us here. There was no other reason for us to come. We certainly did not require a caregiver when we house a manor full of servants in London. You are far too occupied with the duchy to learn the business properly, a fact of which I am sure Papa was aware. Your books could have waited until his return. After all, you have been sitting upon those accompts for tens of years. A few more weeks would have made not an iota of difference. Edward's face was crimson. Of course she had seen through her father's attempts to act the matchmaker. It was a small wonder she had spent weeks up in arms about the situation. She felt she was being appraised for market. I see. Was all Edward could manage, embarrassment for himself and William Burney overwhelming him. I dare say, I did not realize that was his intention and rest assured, I would like to learn as much as I can regarding the business. If I am to partner with your father. Her smile widened and she shook her head. My father will only take upon a partner if that partner is his son-in-law. She replied. Hence how he appeals to my senses. How is that? Edward was genuinely confused, unsure if Honora was for or against a union with him. His mind was beginning to jumble in the cryptic wording. He knows that as a woman, I will never be received well as a merchant. As long as I hide behind the waistcoat of my father, I will fare well. But if he were to pass, his business will also die in my hands. He knows my only hope of surviving the business is with a husband at my side. Edward's mouth gaped slightly as he grasped what she was saying. She has no interest in marriage but she will do it to save the business. In a peculiar way, Edward understood precisely how she felt his own plight not being much different. Benedict thinks the marriage would be beneficial to the duchy. The duchy is my business. Listen to me, rambling about the mouth without end. She said, shaking her head suddenly, trying to move some sense inside. Forgive me, your grace. He was disappointed that she was once more calling him formally, but he did not correct her. The moment had passed and whatever desire he had to blurt out plans for a mutually beneficial future was gone. Tis hardly the time to present such a question, he warned himself. Too much has happened, and she needs not more to process. I will wait until her father returns before I offer the idea of a jointure between us. She does not need to love me, and I will not stifle her adventurous spirit. Yet, as they continued to watch the rain pelt against the windows in a barely frenzied crescendo, Edward wondered if Honora might ever learn to like the idea of marriage or grow to love the idea of him. Chapter 22
A pang of homesickness swept through Honora two weeks after her grandmother passed. She had been out in the orchards, picking cherries from the blooming trees near the conservatory, when nostalgia nearly brought her to her knees. In her mind's eye she was a wee bandling, running through the fields in London in her Sunday best, as her mother and Marjorie called out for her. You will soil your dress, Nora. Slow down, child. They yelled in unison but she only giggled and continued through the grass until she fell to her knees and dirtied the pristine white of the dress. She did not recall the scolding although she was certain there had been one. All she remembered was the feeling of being home, and embraced by the people who loved her most in the world. Where had Papa been then? Was he away or had he been in the house? Miss Burney. Miss Burney. Eliza ran toward her, waving something in her hand, and Honora was instantly concerned. What is it? She gasped, rushing forward to meet the servant, with purple-stained hands which she wiped hastily against her apron. What have you? Tis a letter from your father. Eliza gasped, thrusting the page into her outstretched palms. Honora did not ask her how she knew, seeing as the uneducated Betty could not read. Her hands were shaking as she tore at the pages, expecting more bad news. Eliza stood, waiting for instructions, but Honora barely noticed as her eyes scanned the page, her short breaths becoming longer. The relief must have registered on her face for Eliza also seemed to relax. All is well, Miss Burney? Yes. Honora sighed, a beam illuminating her face. His travels are proving fruitful and he will be home in a fortnight. Eliza smiled and nodded. That is wonderful news, Miss Burney. Will you return to London upon his arrival? The question was innocent enough, yet it cast a wave of doubt through Honora, who could only gape at the servant, as she searched for an answer. What was there to say? That she was entertaining the idea of marriage to secure her position in her father's business? That she was developing affections for the Duke of Blessington, despite her resolve? We shall see what Papa has planned for me. She finally answered, but it seemed to Honora that there was a twinkle in the Betty's eye. I shall be sorry to see you go, Miss Burney. Eliza told her confidentially. I dare say I will not be the only one. Honora felt embarrassed at the bold words, but before she could chastise the maid, Eliza had skirted off leaving a hee-hee-hee in her wake. Honora looked back at the letter in her hand and re-read it with clearer eyes, now knowing it contained nothing to cause her alarm. Dearest Nora, it began. I miss you terribly but I look forward to enlightening you on the places you have yet to discover. I trust that you and Mama are being treated well in the company of your guardian. I do hope you have shown him some mercy. Despite what you think of Duke Blessington, he does not seem to be the man you believe him to be. I have known many people in my life, Nora, and I dare say I can sense a bamboozler from leagues abound. If you can look through your infuriation at the situation, you might find that the Duke is more pleasant than you have allotted him credit. I have seen India and the Orient. Our wares are plentiful and authentic. We have been blessed with good weather and good sailing. If all continues in our favor, we shall return to England mid-month as expected. Do give my love to your grandmother. I do hope she, too, is minding her manners but I do not hold my breath for such miracles. My heart grows full at the thought of seeing your faces in short order. Always yours, Papa. Honora choked back a sob, again remembering that she would be forced to deliver the news of his mother personally, but she waved aside her unhappiness for the time being. He and I will get through this loss together as we did with Mama. She retraced her steps to grab the basket of cherries she had collected. Perhaps she would make a pie for dessert. Overhead, the swallows swooped playfully. For the first time in a long while, Honora felt somewhat at ease, the early about of homesickness all but forgotten. As she entered the kitchen, she placed the basket on the wooden countertop, and looked about for a sign of Susanna, but she was not preparing supper as Honora had expected. Edward was in town for the night, leaving Honora alone in the manor with the servants. It was the first time he had left her there alone, and initially he had offered to leave Benedict behind in the way of security. Security? Whatever for? Honora had asked in confusion. I need no protection. 
Edward had not supplied an answer immediately but she suspected that he was still concerned about Abraham Borthwick, despite not having heard from the man since the day of the funeral. Honora wished to believe that he had finally given up his ridiculous quest to fell the Duke, and Honora had not neared Sarah again, even though she had been plagued with the temptation to do so. Abraham's threat still rang vividly in her ears, and while she did not truly believe the man would come after her, she could not help remembering the fire he had set in the barn. Desperate men do desperate things, she told herself, and it was enough to keep her away from the clover fields. You must not concern yourself with my safety. Honora insisted. Go about your business, and I will see you when you return. He reluctantly accepted assurances and left Briar Hill with his adviser, but not without a firm warning to remain at the manor. You must not go to market nor anywhere else alone. He told her. Promise me you will not. I swear it. She agreed, and she was sincere. His concern gave her a rush of heat, but lately it seemed that much of what Edward did seemed to send the warmth of a hug through her body. It was both confusing and distracting to Honora who was no longer certain about what she wanted from her future. Once, she had been so determined not to marry, not to succumb as her mother had, but the more she considered the life her father had made for them, she wondered why she had been against the notion. Possibly because you have never encountered a man like Edward, she thought as she continued through the halls toward the front hall. It was there she came across Susanna, primping the appearance of the foyer, a filthy rag in hand. Tis a never-ending folly, housework, is it not? Honora commented, her mood light as she clutched the letter close to her heart. Susanna looked up at her in surprise. I had never considered it as such. Susanna admitted. But I dare say you are correct. To dust away only creates more. One might ask why bother at all. The women chuckled, lost in the idea of ceasing chores and permitting the work to mount. I will make a pie. Honora told her. And I will dine with the servants tonight. If Susanna was surprised by the notion, her face did not express it. It was not uncommon for the merchant's daughter to join the household staff when the Duke was away. We look forward to a meal together. Susanna replied, smiling warmly. Eliza tells me that you will be returning to London in a fortnight. Honora could not stop the frown forming on her face. Eliza had too much to say, particularly when she knew little on the matter. She is only a girl. I must not grow irked with her. I dare say, Miss Burney, I will rather miss our conversations. Tis been a long while since I have had the benefit of pleasant chatter laced with a modicum of wit. Eliza and the others are lovely, but they do not reflect your class. I have been honoured to know you. I will write you should I return to London. Honora insisted, knowing that Susanna was the only servant who had been afforded the ability to read. Her mother had been a schoolmarm, the woman herself a bastard, hidden away for half her life until she had come of age and found employment in the manor houses of Blessington. You seem unsure that you will be returning. Susanna said hopefully, her eyes wide. Will you consider staying when your father returns? I understand you received word. She nodded toward the envelope in Honora's hand. Ah yes, it must have been Susanna who told Eliza who wrote me. Indeed, my father's travels have gone as planned. He shall return in two weeks' time but I have not the foggiest notion what he has in mind for the future. I did not tell Eliza I intended to leave. Susanna seemed to detect the note of mild irritation in her tone and smiled softly. You must forgive Eliza. She grows excitable without much cause. Honora laughed. I had noticed. She confessed. And I do not fault her. I fear I am quite at a loss for what I desire these days. The words escaped Honora's lips subconsciously. Her face flushed with humiliation as she looked at Susanna in a mild panic, willing the heat from her cheeks. He is a good man, the Duke. Susanna replied, and Honora was certain her head was going to spring clear from her shoulders as the fire grew inside her. He has been very kind. Honora choked, not wishing to discuss Edward. She felt disloyal speaking of him with the servants as if they were gossiping. 
It is clear he rather fancies you, Miss Burney. He is too much a gentleman to pursue you without certainty, but I dare say, I have never seen him quite so smitten with another, if I may be so bold. You may not. Honora thought furiously, but she did not speak the words aloud. She knew Susanna meant no harm, and as the Betty had said, they had developed a tentative friendship during the past months. Susanna felt comfortable enough to speak without reservation. Something occurred to Honora then, an unexpected thought which abruptly touched her, and she peered at Susanna with curiosity. Did Sarah Borthwick spend much time here? Honora asked and Susanna's mouth parted in surprise. Her eyes darkened and she turned, slightly disturbed by Honora's question. Miss Burney, I would have thought you understood that whatever transpired between His Grace and Miss Borthwick was an escalation of rumours and innuendo. She murmured. I am aware. Honora assured her quickly. It was not the purpose of my inquiry. No? No. Honora insisted. I long to know how she was a daughter for her falling. Her falling. Susanna spat with some contempt. Tis never the man who falls, is it? Honora silently admitted that the servant was correct but was not the time to discuss such issues. She knew that Susanna had a personal distaste for the subject, and Honora had no desire to raise ill feelings in the maid. Please, Susanna, how was she? I feared for her when I saw her, but I have nothing which to compare her in the past. Was she kind? Susanna's hard look chipped away at the edges, and she eyed the other woman pensively. She has endured much these past months. I have seen little of her since all has happened, but prior to the engagement, she was here with frequency. She and the Duke were unlikely friends, but they have known one another since childhood. I always suspected that Miss Borthwick was smitten with his grace, but theirs was never a courtship. Honora took a deep breath, feeling much needed relief hearing Susanna's words solidifying what she already had known about Edward. There was always a sadness about that girl. Susanna continued, sinking onto the steps, her apron fanning about the legs of her work dress, her eyes far away. From the moment I laid eyes upon her, I knew she was pained deeply but how I could not say. What of her mother? Honora thought of the melancholy she had carried in the wake of her mother and grandmother's passing. I cannot say. Susanna replied. There were rumours that she perished in childbirth and others that she ran off. The Borthwick brothers suddenly appeared in Blessington with a bantling of not yet one. They came from up north somewhere. I do not recall where precisely, but they made a home for themselves with the Cloverfields almost at once. Brothers Honora echoed. How many? The two, Abraham and his younger brother, Walter. Walter is employed as a butler. More charming than Abraham, that is a certainty. Honora remembered the man who had appeared to announce the death of her grandmother, and suddenly his presence made sense although it had not at the time. She had barely given the man a second thought since that horrific day. She hardly considered him charming in the least, but given the comparison, she mused that Susanna had a point. She was somewhat shy, but she seemed to forsake her bashfulness in his grace's presence. I was always taken by her sweetness, her eagerness to please. It was difficult for Honora to reconcile that the woman she had seen on the brink of madness was the same of whom Susanna spoke. We are all but one tragedy apart from madness, she thought with some mournfulness. Under the thumb of her father, what chance does the girl have for happiness? She is considered nothing more than a bored now, ashamed, scorned woman. No man will ever accept her or see the girl whom Susanna describes. I am shocked that her father has not sent her away. Honora said, wondering how many more secrets the Betty knew. She would be foolish not to connect that the servants had ears throughout the estates. While they would never risk spilling those findings to outsiders, Honora knew her standing among the staff was better than the nobles. I cannot say why he has not. Susanna replied. I dare say, any man in his position would be apt to do so, simply to strike the memory of the family shame aside. Moreover, I find it remarkable that Lord Cloverfield has not ordered him to remove her from the property. Yet she remains. 
Honora's feelings were a swell of sympathy and bitterness, her heart and mind uncertain of how to deal with such a situation. She wished that scandal surrounding Sarah Borthwick was not hanging over the roof of Briar Hill. Would matters have been different between Edward and me, if her memory did not sit constantly in the shadows? Honora was shamed by her selfish thought, knowing that Sarah was enduring a life of hardship, while Honora fought against the growing affection in her heart for the Duke. Your issues are impertinent when that girl and the Duke face such scrutiny. The sound of horses' hooves distracted the women, and Suzanne arose from the stair on which she sat as Honora pushed herself away from the banister. She became aware that she had leaned in so casually in their discussion. Who could that be? His grace is not expected home until tomorrow. Susanna murmured nervously, slowly opening the wooden door to stare out into the diminishing sunlight of the afternoon. Wait. Honora gasped, afraid of who might be coming to call, but Susanna did not heed her warning. Instead, she further parted the door, and her face paled. Who is it? Honora demanded, unable to see from where she stood, but she was reluctant to go closer, lest danger awaited. Susanna did not respond, but she stepped onto the veranda. Susanna! Honora cried, hurrying forward despite her resolve to stay hidden. She could not risk the servant being hurt, not while she stood by idly. Susanna! She called again but the word died on her lips as she stared at the figure upon an unbridled horse. Hello, Nora. Sarah said, her voice flat. Is Edward home? Chapter 23 She still donned only night clothes and they were soiled as if she had not changed since Honora had last seen her. There were fresh cuts and bruises against her too thin face, but Honora had no way of knowing if she had done them herself. She could have stumbled in her declining stability or harmed herself. There was no telling what happened within the mind of the senseless. Nay. Honora finally managed to say when she found her voice. He is in the towns on business. Sarah looked uncertainly toward the property line. Will you come in? Honora asked, her heart thumping. She did not know if asking the blonde woman inside the Duke's home was fitting but she could not very well permit her to run off, half-dressed, and injured. I have come to see Edward. She said again and Honora nodded, exchanging a look with Susanna. He will not return until the morrow, Miss Borthwick. Susanna offered, her anxiety clear. She was having the same doubts as Honora, but as women, they simply could not turn away one of their own in such a state. Please, miss, do come inside and have a spot of tea. Honoro stepped forward cautiously thinking Sarah was a scared mouse who might flee without warning. She extended a hand upward and Sarah eyed her warily. Once more, her eyes darted toward the road, her expression alerting Honora that she expected someone to be on her trail. Shall we put the horse in the stables to be watered? Honora suggested sidling along the gentle beast who obviously did not need for hydration. It was merely a ruse to move the beast from sight, lest Sarah's father came searching for her. Slowly, however, a glimmer of understanding flashed through Sarah's eyes, and she dismounted the gentle giant on which she sat. The horse belongs to Lord Byron. She murmured. If he should learn I have taken it. You need not worry. Lord Byron shall not know you have borrowed his horse. Honora told her with confidence as Sarah scrambled to the ground. She nodded at Susanna who cast her yet another worried look but she did not argue as the woman led the equine from view of the road. Come along inside. Honora instructed, closing the door firmly in their wake. Sarah did not speak until they had made their way to the kitchen. It was plain to see that she was unaccustomed to walking her step seeming wobbly, her gait uneven. He is a heathen lick spittle. Sarah growled as she plopped into a chair, causing the legs to scrape unpleasantly across the floor. I despise him the worst of the gaggle which is why I chose his horse to steal. Honora looked at her, unsure of how to respond. She did not know any of Lord and Lady Cloverfield's children but she had found the parents insufferable enough. It took little to imagine the progeny being the same. I am sure he shall not miss the beast. Honora supplied, striking a match to ignite the stove. 
there are others, I am sure. Of course, there are others. Sarah snapped, as she gazed about the room. But he is bound to notice it gone eventually. Have you merely borrowed it? Honora insisted. He will not know Dash. I have taken it. She interrupted firmly. I will not return. Honora whirled to stare at her aghast, again taking in her poor dress. Sarah, what do you mean by such a statement? You must return home. Surely your father will tear the duchy to pieces in search of you. Sarah's face twisted into a hideous expression which was neither a smirk nor a snarl, but there was a determination at its core which sent a sliver of alarm through Honora. He will be grateful for the release of burden. She replied shortly. He has wished to send me away since the day I ended the betrothal. If that is so, he would have sent you by now. Honora sighed. She sensed that reasoning was not Sarah's ally, but Honora had nothing but words to offer the girl. Has he struck you? Instantly, Sarah's body became a rod of tension, but she shook her unwashed hair vehemently, the stray strands dancing over the dirt of her nightclothes. She clamped her lips closed, darting her clouded crystalline eyes away as Susanna entered. Lord Byron's horse is being tended to by John Henry. Susanna announced. Thank you, Susanna. Honora replied when Sarah said nothing. She continued to study the blonde girl's face, waiting for an explanation. Sure you must know that this is the first place your father will seek for you. Susanna paled. She understood the connotation of Honora's words. Let him search. Sarah giggled madly. If you hide me well enough, he cannot find me. Hide you? Honora echoed, gazing at the girl in shock. She remembered Abraham's words as he breathed them directly into her ear. If you approach my daughter again, I will strangle the life from your body with my own two hands. You will. Sarah insisted. You cannot send me back. I haven't a choice in the matter. Honora exploded, wondering why she bothered with good sense. It was obvious that Sarah could not reason in her state. Sarah looked at her not comprehending what Honora was saying. You are the lady of the manor now. You can do as you please. Honora would have snickered if the situation was not so perilous, and she looked to Susanna for aid. The Betty cast her eyes away, pretending to busy herself with the tea. I am merely a guest at Briar Hill, Sarah. She said, trying to compose herself. Forgive me if you misconstrued me inviting you inside, but I have no standing here. Sarah did not appear to believe her and folded her arms over her chest in the manner of a petulant child. I will not leave. She insisted. Edward would not force me to leave. Honora had no doubt that Sarah spoke in truth, but the fact of the matter was that the Duke was not home. She would not be held responsible for what would occur should she permit the girl's sanctuary on the property. Oh, why did I allow Mr. Carter to go with Edward? I should have known a dark matter would arise in their absence. Sarah, your father Dash. My father speaks a great deal, but he will not harm you should you dismiss him. Sarah interjected. Honora could not help wondering about the markings on her face. If matters are not so dire at Shady Knoll, you should return. Honora said firmly. You may call upon Edward when he returns from the towns, but in the interim, I give my permission. You will make a terrible lady of the manor when you are wed. Sarah growled. Honora did not correct her again and she turned away, wringing her hands as she tried to think of what to do. In good conscience, she could not send Sarah away but her sense of self-preservation battled with her desire to protect the unkempt stranger sitting before her, slurping tea. She has become a feral animal in the time since she has been hidden. If she wishes to leave, I cannot stop her, but if I hide her here, how will matters be different? What will you do here? Honora asked gently, pivoting back to join Sarah at the table. You will be in the same position as you were at Shady Knoll. Would you not rather be among your family? Fire and despair touched Sarah's face. I will not stay a long while. In due time, 
I will leave the duchy. With what means, Sarah? A stolen horse and your bedclothes? Honora growled, her patience expired. For the first time since her arrival, the girl seemed to recognize the situation as she stared at her soiled clothes. My God! She muttered. I am a fright. Honora swallowed a response, knowing that no matter what she said, it was not the proper answer. We will bathe and feed you. Honora decided, at last, shooting Susanna a glance. But then you must return, if not just to return Lord Byron's horse. That contemptible bootlicker is not deserving of such a beast. Tis not your place to decide such a thing. Honora snapped. You will return the beast after you bathe and eat. There was a finality in her words, but Sarah's eyes told Honora that she was not finished with the conversation. Are we understood? Honora demanded, sensing another protest brewing from her lips. You may return and speak with the Duke about your plight upon his arrival but not before. Sarah's lips curled into a sneer, and she sat back against the chair, her arms still crossed over her chest. I will return the horse. She agreed. Only because I know that they would sooner search for the little lord's animal than the fallen daughter of the house secretary. Honora exhaled in relief, realizing that possibly there was some sense inside Sarah after all. Before she could speak, however, Sarah continued on a slight diatribe which chilled her. But I will not stay at Shady Knoll. I will simply make my way far from the duchy without a pence to sustain me. If they should find my corpse in a break, pecked apart by red kites, I wonder if you will tell them it was you who rejected me, sending me off to a certain demise. There was little emotion in Sarah's words like she read from a page rather than believed how she spoke, but Honora knew that ending was feasible if the girl was determined to be without reason. Susanna, draw a bath for Miss Borthwick. I will prepare supper with Eliza. She was not willing to adjust her position. How could she? It was not her house, regardless of what Sarah assumed. Susanna seemed uncomfortable with the idea of the other servants seeing Sarah on the premises, but what choice did they have? Honora had already promised the girl a meal and bath. Come along, Miss Borthwick. Susanna urged and Sarah reluctantly rose, apparently unhappy with the way the conversation had gone but Honora did not permit her another word as they left her. Sighing heavily, Honora sank against the table, her palms splayed, heart racing. I should not have allowed her entry. How long will it be before Abraham comes looking for her? What will he do if he finds her here? The truce has been uneasy at best until now. He is likely waiting for an excuse to declare war on Edward again, and this will undoubtedly be it. Susanna reappeared in the kitchen her face lined with worry. What shall we do with her? The servant murmured. She is not well. I have never seen her in such a state but losing a child will expel the worst in a woman. Susanna seemed to be speaking more to herself than Honora as she went to fetch water from the well for Sarah's bath but the sentiment resonated. She is battered, broken and kept as some caged animal, yet she maintains some fight within her. How long will it be before Abraham manages to take that from her? She cannot continue where she is or death is inevitable, by her own hand or simply from lack of care. She might grow ill or apathetic. Honora watched Susanna set the water upon the stove, the woman still muttered to herself in a barely audible tone. The conflict within Honora was strong, her morals battling as she tried to determine what was the right path to take. Why do you regard me in such a way? Susanna asked suddenly, shattering Honora's inner turmoil. Should I find Eliza? Nay. Honora replied slowly, a wave of dizziness sweeping through her as she formed her next thought. Nay, tell no one about her being here. Susanna exhaled with great relief but her ease was premature. In sure she remains unseen by everyone. I will have John Henry return the horse to Shady Knoll without detection. No one need know she was ever here if he leaves the mare in the neighboring fields. She came without a saddle, so there is no reason to suspect that the horse did not simply get loose. Miss Burney Sarah may not leave her chambers. 
you must make that abundantly clear. I will explain to her if she violates that term, she will be turned away, regardless of the outcome. I will see to her meals until the Duke returns, Susanna. Miss Burney, what will you do if Abraham Borthwick comes calling, which I assure you he will? The panic in Susanna's tone was unmistakable and Honora was once more having second thoughts on the matter. But she pushed them from her mind. She was a businessman. It was her job to take calculated risks and adhere to them once she had decided on a course. She would not give in her doubts, not when a woman's well-being was at stake. If I do not tend to her, surly and melancholy as she might be, no one else will care if she lives or dies. It is my duty to Edward to protect this woman whom he has cared for since childhood. I will not allow her to suffer, not when I have a choice in the matter. Should Mr. Bothwit dare come on to the property, you will tell him that I have joined the Duke in the towns, and we shall return on the morrow. Miss Burney, if I may speak freely. You may not. Honora barked, her tone harsh and final. She did not require Susanna's arguments clouding her mind. I have more than enough doubts without her, she thought, shaking her head. Yes, Miss Burney. Susanna said crisply, but she did give the woman another look, one which Honora could see was edged in pride. The Betty knew Honora had made a perilous decision. She was rightfully concerned, but she was also moved by Honora's courage. Susanna. Honora called to her in a much softer tone. Yes, Miss Burney? You must not fret. Should this go awry, I will accept full responsibility for the outcome. Susanna's mouth parted, the corners turned up slightly in a bemused smile. I haven't the faintest notion what you mean, Miss Burney. She retreated into the hallway, lugging the piping hot water along and Honora chuckled, trying to steady her taut nerves. Nothing will go awry. We will hold the fort until Edward returns, and then the decisions will be in his hands. As Honora turned to find John Henry, she was struck by an amusing but worrying thought. Who would have ever imagined a day when I, Honora Burney, would yearn for a man's return home simply to put my mind at ease? It was the first time that she accepted how much Briar Hill and Edward, Duke of Blessington, had changed her. Chapter 24 Benedict slept on the journey back from the towns, his light snores only adding to Edward's impatience. Their interviews had gone late the previous evening, causing them to remain one night longer than they had anticipated when they had left Briar Hill. Edward could not help being concerned for his household, particularly Honora, but he did not wish to make his worry obvious. He knew that Benedict would only mock him if he voiced his thoughts. Honora is a woman of the world. She has been in exotic places, sleeping in huts, dancing among the gypsies. There is no need to fret on her account, he told himself, repeating the mantra as he attempted to convince himself over and over again. Edward had wanted to leave the night before, despite the late hour, but Benedict had caught the attention of a rather brazen blonde girl at a local tavern and the two had disappeared, leaving Edward to think about Honora. What of Miss Starling? Edward asked his friend when Benedict reappeared on the morrow, still reeking of ale and bleary-eyed. What of her? Benedict asked, his brow raising impishly. Clara and I are not betrothed. I wonder if she shares your flippant attitude. Edward commented dryly, although he was secretly dismayed by Benedict's adulterous ways. While it was true that he was still a bachelor by definition. Clara Starling would certainly feel betrayed to know her bow shared his bed with others. Are you going to tell her? Benedict snorted, climbing into the carriage after him. Of course not. Edward scoffed. Have I ever in the past? Just because I say nothing does not mean I approve of his ways. It seemed that the moment the carriage went into motion, Benedict had nodded off, presumably feeling the aftermath of the previous eve's events. Edward much preferred the silence, and he reached into the pocket of his waistcoat to retrieve the necklace he had purchased at the market in Bath. The item was one of exquisite beauty, a rare, gleaming jade set inside an ornate lace of silver. It had caught Edward's eye immediately, the stone reminiscent of Honora's eyes. He managed to purchase the necklace without Benedict seeing, knowing that he would be subjected to much teasing should his friend see it. 
it felt cheap sharing his feelings with Benedict, who, despite suggesting the union, thought so little of marriage. It was a jointure to strengthen families, according to Benedict. There was no emotion involved. It was why, then, that Edward opted to keep his friend out of his personal sentiments and quietly woo on Nora away from prying eyes. Benedict stirred, grunting lowly, and Edward shoved the necklace back into his pocket, leaning casually back to stare out the cab into the fields beyond. How long was I asleep? An hour or two. Edward replied. But in truth he could not be certain. He had not checked his pocket clock since they had departed from the inn. All the Duke knew for certain was that the journey was taking much longer than he desired and that he wished the horses would move faster. I cannot say I have ever seen you so eager to return to Briar Hill. Benedict commented, yawning quite rudely without bothering to cover his mouth. Edward stifled a sigh, realizing that Benedict was already his perceptive self. I have not been away in quite some time. The Duke reminded him, but Benedict did not accept his excuse, a wide smile breaking over his dirty face. Goodness, Eddie, you must think me daft. He laughed. You did nothing but travel about the towns before Miss Burney came to Briar Hill. Why can you not simply say that you are smitten with the lass? Why must you pervert all the pleasant things in life? Edward growled. Perhaps that is why I do not disclose my innermost thoughts. Benedict chuckled again and shook his head. If it brings you closer to marriage, I happily support your endeavors to charm Miss Burney. I hope you will announce your engagement sooner rather than later. You are hardly one to give me a lecture on securing a relationship, Carter. Edward snapped, already annoyed with his friend. You have been courting Miss Starling for two years. Again with Miss Starling. I dare say, you are growing defensive in your love-struck ways, Eddie. His jesting tone was fraying Edward's nerves, and he clamped his mouth closed before he spoke words he would regret. Do you suppose we have heard the last of Borthwick now? The unexpected question caused Edward to swivel about and stare at the adviser. Why do you ask such a question? It has been weeks since I have last seen his face. Moreover, I did not hear a breath about Sarah during our interviews, did you? Benedict shook his head. I did not, which is why I presented the inquiry. Could it finally be a chapter closed? Edward felt a jolt of alarm although he could not be certain from where the feeling came. There was a good reason for Benedict's optimism, but after months of fearing the worst from Abraham Borthwick, it was difficult to accept the man had simply tired of his desire for vengeance. In the back of Edward's busy mind, Borthwick was lurking, but he admitted he had thought of him less and Honora more in the past weeks. We will not know until we know. Edward answered enigmatically. Through his peripheral vision, he made out the familiar landscapes of home and his pulse began to quicken. He had vowed to himself that upon his return, he would sit with her and discuss their future together. If she feels we could have a future together, he reminded himself. He knew that was why he had failed to bring up the conversation until then, the idea that she might reject him would overwhelm his heart's desire. Yet, as he lay in his lumpy bed at the inn, unable to sleep, Edward decided that he would never truly know unless he was brave enough to broach the subject. We have become as thick as two thieves since the death of Marjorie. I think she has learned to take comfort in me. Are we home already? Benedict called, his eyes widening as he, too, recognized the fields and forests which rolled past. Indeed. You said I was asleep only an hour or two. I am not the town crier, Carter. Benedict guffawed and settled back against the cool seat, his head bobbing gently against the movement of the carriage. Perhaps. Benedict offered, yawning once more, and Edward eyed him with mild disgust, catching a whiff of last night's scotch emanating through his paws. Perhaps what? Perhaps it is our time to succeed now, Eddie. Benedict finished, smiling warmly and suddenly Edward bolted up in his seat. Indeed. He said again, his own smile lifting his stoic expression, the feelings of irritation melting away. What is it? Benedict asked suspiciously. Tis precisely what you have said. 
I have been expecting the worst my entire existence. From the day I was born, I have known nothing but misery and troubles. Yet, you say that with a beam clear across your face. Benedict responded, cautiously as he worried his friend was taking leave of his senses. There is nothing amiss now, Benedict. The duchy is flush, Abraham Borthwick is at bay. I have a comely woman awaiting me, and I sit in a coach and six with my best mate. Why has it taken me weeks to feel content about all that is right? Benedict seemed amused and he nodded in agreement, reaching inside his topcoat for a flask which he unlatched and downed in a toast. Here, here. He chortled, thrusting the canister toward Edward, but the Duke waved it aside. They would be at Briar Hill in less than a quarter hour and he did not wish to arrive soaked in scotch. I wish to be clear-minded when I speak with Honora. I wish to remember every minute of our conversation, regardless of which way it might go. Suit yourself. Benedict took another swig before stuffing the flask back into his vest and closing his eyes. He seemed peaceful and it only enhanced Edward's own sense of ease. Tis been a long road uphill, he thought, smiling affectionately at Benedict and grateful that his friend had been with him for the trials and tribulations which had been bestowed upon him. We have reached the end. The house was remarkably silent when the men arrived, only John Henry appearing to relieve the other coachmen and help them with their trunks. Where is the household? Edward demanded as they stood in the shadowy foyer. Not a candle had been lit despite the overcast nature of the sky. He could not hear a sound throughout the echoing chambers of the house. I cannot say, Your Grace. John Henry mumbled, shuffling away with the trunks toward the stairs. There was an undertone which made Edward stare at him with intense closeness. John Henry, where is Miss Burney? Where are Susanna and Eliza? James? John Henry seemed uncomfortable by the pointed questions, but Edward did not stop his blue irises from boring into his half-turned back. John Henry. Benedict barked. Out with it, boy. Miss Burney gave the household a day away. He rushed on quickly. For what reason? Edward asked, his brow furrowing in confusion. He was not opposed to having the employees have a day in the towns but to leave no one about seemed odd. She did not give a reason, your grace. You did not go. Benedict observed, his own eyes narrowing as he, too, saw the light that something queer was occurring. Edward was still unable to make sense of it. I did not wish to leave until you had returned, your grace. You were expected yesterday and, where is Miss Burney? Edward demanded. I I cannot say. You cannot or will not? Benedict growled, sharing a look with the Duke but Edward's gaze remained fixated on the young man. I do not know, Mr. Carter. They simply vanished. They? Benedict and Edward chorused in unison. Who accompanied Miss Burney? Please, Your Grace, I would much prefer if you spoke with Miss Burney upon her return. You are not employed for your preferences, John Henry. Benedict yelled. Tell us what you know at once. Please dash. So help me God, John Henry if anything has happened to Miss Burney. No. I swear she was well when I saw her yesterday eve. Where was she when you last saw her? Edward asked, blood rushing through his veins like rapids in the river. Who was she with? Benedict asked simultaneously. Your Grace, Mr. Carter, when you did not return last night, she rounded us into the salon and told us to take leave far from Briar Hill. Why, John Henry, what has happened in our absence? Edward could not make heads nor tails of what he was hearing and he could see that the questions only increased John Henry's nervousness. Please, your grace dash. Do not require me to ask you again, John. Benedictist, and Edward watched his hands ball into fists. He cast his friend a warning look. Upsetting the coachman's apple cart would not get them anywhere. A beating would only make it harder to find the truth. Mr. Bothwick came here. John Henry blurted out. Two nights ago. 
very nearly woke the entire household. What? Edward gasped. Why? What said he? He was looking for his daughter. John Henry rushed on. She disappeared from Shady Knoll, Your Grace, Mr. Carter, and he was furious. A feeling of discomfort rose in Edward's stomach and he looked at the boy expectantly. What did he do? Nothing, Your Grace. Nothing? What did Miss Burney say to him? Nothing, Your Grace. Miss Burney had Susanna tell Mr. Borthwick that she had joined you in Bath. Are you certain? Edward insisted. Abraham did not speak with her, not even for a moment. I am certain, Your Grace. I saw him leave with my own eyes. His brother was with him. That information gave Edward a slight feeling of relief. Walter was the more level-headed of the two. He would not permit his brother to do something rash like strike a woman. Where is Miss Burney now? Benedict asked again, the question bringing them full circle to the mystery surrounding the questions. I imagine that she is in hiding. John Henry mumbled. The words pierced Edward's heart like blades of fire. I should have never left her here alone. She must be terrified. I must find her and show her that she is safe. Then I must learn what has become of Sarah. Suddenly, all the peace which had followed Edward home from the towns vanished at once. We must find her. Edward muttered to Benedict, and he nodded in agreement, but John Henry cleared his throat nervously, indicating he had not finished his tale. What is it, John Henry? Have you any idea where she is? No, Your Grace, I swear I do not, but I can tell you with whom she travels. Well? Benedict spat. Out with it, boy. He lowered his brown eyes shamefully and scuffed a worn boot against the grassy dirt at his feet. Sarah Borthwick. He breathed. Chapter 25 Honoro glanced at Susanna whose face was barely visible against the shadows. She wondered if the servant was furious with her, but she had been left with little choice. She had hoped to keep Sarah out of her father's sight until Edward's return, but when he did not appear when he was expected, panic had seized her. She had only purchased a small block of time but there was no doubt that Abraham would return, searching for both her and the Duke, and Honora feared there would be no stopping him from storming Briar Hill if he did. The only alternatives were sending Sarah out to fend for herself or finding another place for the girl to hide. Sarah had not offered any more explanation to what had happened, why she had left so abruptly after months in relative captivity, but Honora did not push her either. If she feels the need to give me the details of what the reign of terror has been like under Abraham's control, she will. For now, she is safe. We should be returning to Blessington. Susanna murmured. If the Duke has returned and we are not there. Yes, of course. She agreed quickly. She had purposely dismissed the household, concerned that one of the servants might grow loose slipped about Abraham's visit on the night Sarah had arrived. She and Susanna had done their best to keep Sarah out of view, but as Honora had known for a long while, there were ears all over the manor in the way of staff. She did not wish for Edward to learn of what she had done by anyone else but her, lest he grow angry and mistakenly blame the servants for her decision. Honora looked about, her heart swollen with memories. The tables were littered with her grandmother's doilies, the needlepoint pictures hung on the walls. The furniture was precisely how they had left it the day she and Marjorie departed for Blessington, draped now in sheets to protect the gleaming wood from dust and critters. Honora had not been home in months but the moment she and the other two women had stepped over the threshold, a veil of warmth enveloped her. This will be a decent place for her to stay. I should have thought it first before permitting her even one night at Briar Hill. Here she will be cared for by Michael and Rachel and she will not live in constant fear of her father finding her. You will leave me then? Sarah's voice sounded like a small child, a slight crack in her words. You will be looked after. Honora assured her. No one will think to come for you here. When I return to Blessington, I will speak to the Duke about what to do going forward but you are safe, protected. You will want for nothing. 
Sarah shook her freshly washed head of hair and looked around at the opulent surroundings, tears swimming in her eyes. Forgive my petulance. She whispered, her eyes haunted but strangely clearer than Honora recalled. Perhaps she is feeling more secure already. It was all Honora could hope for, given the danger she faced. What would Abraham do now that he learned that his daughter had truly fled and was not simply out shopping? Honora shuddered to think. You have no reason to apologize. Honora said firmly, gesturing for Susanna to follow. You are a dear friend of Edward and he would want for you to be protected. Sarah stared at her with sad but grateful eyes, her lower lip quivering. I am glad that I ended the engagement. She murmured. I recant what I said to you on the day we met. If I had the chance again, I would not marry him. Oh? Honora cocked her head to the side. Why? Sarah shook her head and smiled faintly, pulling the woven blanket up to cover her frail body against the settee. The fire crackled lightly, casting sprite-like shapes against the walls and for a moment, Honora thought she felt her grandmother at her side. If I had married Edward, he would not be able to marry you. Sarah explained. Honora's laugh was sharp as she opened her mouth to deny again that she was in a courtship, she stopped herself abruptly. Why do you continue to ignore that you have feelings for this man? Are you so stubborn that you would shear off your nose to spite your face? If you did not care about him, you would never have endangered yourself so greatly. You laugh but you do care for him. Sarah insisted softly. He is a good man, decent, honorable. You are the same, Nora. If I had to choose a mate for Edward, it would be you. Honora looked at Susanna but she had retreated to the kitchen, presumably to gather nibbles for the four-hour journey back to Blessington. You are in love with him. Honora said softly, perching at Sarah's side. Why did you let him go? The unshed tears finally made their way down her cheeks in a streaky pattern but Sarah held her smile bravely. It does not matter whom I love. She breathed, wiping her tears away hastily. I can never be loved. Honora was indignant with this revelation. You made a mistake, Sarah. You are not evil or condemned in the eyes of God. You will find a man who loves you, despite your past. You will see. No. Sarah moaned softly. I will not. Sarah, I have been many places in the world where women have been married after being with child. You must give yourself time to heal and grieve the loss of your baby before you can move forward, but when you do, you will find love. I assure you. Nora, you are witty and sensible but I fear in this instance, you do not know what you say. Honora opened her mouth to protest again but Susanna reappeared, carrying a napkin full of bread and cheese. Miss Bernie, the hour grows late. The servant urged. I do not wish to rush you along but dash. No, you are correct, Susanna. Sarah and I were merely saying our goodbyes. Sarah reached forward and grabbed Honora's hands, squeezing them tightly. Swear to me that you will marry him. Honora giggled, a slight blush forming on her cheeks. I cannot swear any such thing. She replied nonchalantly. However, I will vow to always be his friend. Sarah released her slowly and nodded. That is good. She offered. Eddie could always use a friend. Now that he does not have me. He does have you. You tell Rachel whatever you need and have Michael take you into town. You must explore London when you have gained your strength. We will be in touch. Unexpectedly. She reached down and pressed her lips to Sarah's cheek, the coolness of her skin meeting her mouth. Thank you, Nora. Sarah whispered, but Honora was already out the door, blinking away tears of her own. Are you all right, Miss Burney? Susanna asked as Honora slipped inside the coach. Yes, Susanna. She sniffled, the overwhelming emotion becoming difficult to handle as the hired coach rode away from her childhood home. Miss Burney? Yes, Susanna? There was a slight pause until Honora turned to look at the woman. 
Susanna seemed to be wrestling with her thoughts. She finally blurted forth what was on her mind. Should we stop at your family's plot and see where your grandmother is buried? Honora studied the Betty's face, with new-felt admiration. It was clear that Susanna was very much out of sorts in London, her desire to be back at Briar Hill close to palpable. Yet she had the presence of mind to offer such a thoughtful gesture. Not this evening, Susanna. Thank you for thinking of her. I will return when the timing is not so complex. Susanna tried not to appear relieved, but Honora saw her exhale as they continued toward Blessington. Honora had also considered stopping at Marjorie's graveside but there was no time to do that, not when Abraham Borthwick could be returning at any moment, catching Edward unaware. He must be warned and informed of where I have taken Sarah. Not for the first time, Honora wondered how he would react to what she had done. The situation had escalated faster than she had anticipated. Honora had not intended to move Sarah to her home. Moreover, they needed to discuss where she would go. Honora's father was due home soon and he would certainly want no part of harboring Sarah Borthwick. You took this upon yourself and now you must see it through. She hoped that Edward would support her choice, but she did not know him well enough to conclude he would, especially when the choice came at a time when all seemed to be peaceful in the duchy. Thinking of Sarah's words, she sat back and stared into the darkening London countryside slipping by. Marriage is an odd concept to think of in a time like this, she scolded herself, but she could not force the notion from her mind. She would be untruthful if she said she had not thought of it several times over the weeks, her heart leaning toward agreeing to a jointure. Will I marry him for affection or convenience? was the question which continued to plague her. Honora had never considered marriage for either purpose until arriving at Briar Hill, and yet, suddenly it seemed to be weighing heavily upon her mind. She looked to her left where Susanna had already nodded off and Honora smiled. It was not a bad idea, having a moment of slumber. There would be no one pounding down the doors to wake them, no concern for Sarah's safety. I will also close my eyes for a moment or two, she thought and when her lids met, Honora was already asleep. The slowing of the horses swayed Honora awake. As she rubbed her eyes, she peered at Susanna who sat rigidly straight against the seat, her mouth pressed into a firm line. We are home. The Betty announced but it was unnecessary. Honora could already sense the shift in atmosphere. I will enter first. She told Susanna firmly. Recall what I have said, I alone am responsible for what has happened here. You only did my bidding. I will not permit you to be punished alone. Susanna muttered, misery clouding her eyes. I went on my own accord. No one need know that. Honora insisted as the coach stopped before the manor. As she peered into the night, her heart leapt into her throat. It seemed that every lantern in the grand home was alight. The servants must be home. Honora mumbled aloud, stepping from the carriage but before she could take a step, the door flew inward, and Edward raced out to meet her, Benedict on his heels. Where in God's name have you been? He roared, with a combination of relief and ire on his face. Susanna poked her head from the carriage and Edward glowered in her direction. Susanna, you too? What is the meaning of this? This is not her doing, your grace. Honora said quickly. We will speak inside. No. Edward barked, turning toward the house. Benedict shook his head and dropped his eyes. We must. Honora insisted. Abraham Borthwick has come dash. I know what you did. The Duke interrupted. Where is she now? The women shared a look before Honora turned to face him defiantly, her mind racing as to which servant had told. John Henry, she thought, miffed. Your Grace, you would have done the same if you had been here. She answered flatly. I only did what I thought was proper and in accordance with what you would dash. Nora, listen to me. Edward said, again casting a look to the house. His hands reached up to clasp her about the shoulders, blue eyes boring into hers with intensity. We haven't much time. Where is Sarah? She gaped at him that familiar sensation of dread seeping into her bones. Is Borthwick here? 
she whispered. I will not tell him where she is. Edward shook his head but before he could utter another word, a lumbering figure appeared in the doorway of the house, his mass blotting out the light behind him. The Duke released her instantly, noting the shift in her expression as she stared uncomprehendingly at the man before her. Honora blinked twice, her mind spinning dangerously as she tried to make sense of what she was seeing. Have you forgotten what I look like, Nora? A strangled sob escaped her lips and before she could stop herself, Honora flew forward into the outstretched arms of her father. Papa. She joked. Papa, you are home. Chapter 26 Eddie, you must stop. Benedict murmured as Edward paced outside the salon, the stress upon his face quite visible to even the most casual observer. Your movements help no one. How can you say that with such calmness? The Duke hissed, his eyes wide as he spun to address him. Bernie is apt to collect his daughter and leave this place, never to return when he learns of his mother's passing. Marjorie Bernie was an old woman. Benedict reminded him dryly. Twas why he insisted she come if you recall. He suspected her health was failing. I doubt sincerely that he will hold you responsible for negation. I fear you know little. Edward was far too upset to mind his manners, not that it was entirely necessary in Benedict's presence. However, there was much more with which to concern himself now, and he wrung his hands as if he was a nervous bride on her wedding day, craning his head so that it would better afford him hearing inside the closed room. William and his daughter had secluded themselves inside upon Honora's return from London, and he had little notion what was being said beyond the doors. He assumed, of course, that the mention of Marjorie was made, but from his vantage point, Edward could hear little in the way of response. Your Grace, shall I arrange for refreshments? Susanna mumbled, her eyes trained on the ground. Her face was ghastly pale as if she expected to be ordered out of the manor as the words left her lips. Yet, how can I be irked with her? She did what she believed was best for Sarah, under the guidance of Honora. The deed was noble, kind, not worthy of reprimand. It did not alter the fact, however, that William Burney was nigh to learn he had an unexpected houseguest in his London home. Edward's gut flipped nervously, and he willed himself to slow his breathing. He could only imagine how William might take the news. How many shocks can one man sustain after months on the sea? Eddie, you knew that he would return eventually. Benedict sighed. Why the dramatics now? I had thought we had a fortnight to prepare. I haven't given a thought to this until I saw his face. As if on cue, the door flew inward, and William appeared, his jaw taut as his eyes narrowed dangerously on the Duke. Both Benedict and Edward froze under the stare, forgetting their status under the scrutiny of a distraught and angered man. They seemed to shrink size as if they were reprimanded children. Your Grace, there was little respect in his address and Edward's eyes darted toward Honora who stared at him with wide, jade eyes. Somehow, he read her expression with ease, sensing that her father did not yet know of Sarah's hiding. Mr. Bernie. Edward said, his face twisting in contrition. Please understand that we did all we could for Mrs. Bernie. If there had been means to communicate with you Dash. I do not fault you. William interrupted, rather abruptly and the Duke was instantly silenced. He cast a worried glance toward his adviser, noting that Susanna had slunk, into the shadows as if she hoped to disappear. Bernie looked down, apparently embarrassed by his interjection. Forgive me, your grace. He murmured, peering over his shoulder at his daughter. Tis a great shock as you can imagine. The journey, albeit fruitful, was long and exhausting. I must rest afore returning to London to see where my mother rests. No. Honora and Edward cried out in unison, both clamping their mouths shut as they exchanged a look. No? William echoed with some anger. No, I cannot rest. I merely meant. Edward rushed onward. That you must be fed first. Your strength, sir. You must maintain your strength after such a trying journey. Perhaps I should call upon drive. 
Morgan also to permit you a physical examination. That is hardly necessary. William sighed, shuffling forward. I was checked at port as always. It cannot hurt to have a physician of better standing have a look at you. Edward insisted and to his relief, William did not argue. He suspected that William was too enshrouded in his grief to protest with any grand fashion and Edward was shamefully grateful. The Duke was simply grasping at elements to prolong Bernie's stay, but he feared he did not have much on which to sustain Honora's father. Edward turned to Susanna, gesturing for her to show him to an unoccupied apartment. Susanna, show Mr. Bernie to his quarters. He needs rest after such a trying journey and such news. Have food brought to him and a bath drawn at once. Afterward, send for drive. Morgan to be here on the morrow. Yes, your grace. William eyed him warily, his eyes glittering as if he meant to say more, but his lips did not form words of reprimand. He merely nodded curtly and turned back to his daughter. On the morrow, Nora, we shall return to London where I will pay my respects to your grandmother. Be prepared to leave at dawn. Honora nodded slightly, averting her eyes as William turned to follow Susanna from the foyer and up the centre stairs. Have John Henry bring his trunks inside. Edward barked when he was certain William could no longer hear their voices. Eliza, who had been hiding in the darkness without the notice of anyone, stepped forward, realizing the order was for her. It was clear she sensed something amiss although the Duke could not be certain how much she truly knew. He had not realized she stood within earshot of their conversation. Your Grace? Eliza seemed confused. If he wishes to leave on the morrow, is it necessary to bring his trunks inside? It seems rather tedious a task to perform mere hours apart. Edward and Benedict stared at her quizzically, wondering if she was purposely daft or seeking trouble. The former seemed more apt for Eliza. You dare question his grace? Benedict snapped, his wits clearly as frayed. You will do as you are told. Eliza was instantly contrite and nodded quickly. Yes, your grace, Mr. Carter. Eliza turned and hurried out the room. She feared more harsh words from her employer. Letting that pass, Edward had far more important matters on his mind than reprimanding the staff. You did not tell him? Edward muttered as Honora stepped from the salon, her eyes drawn. Of Sarah? She replied. Certainly not but tis only a matter of time before he learns she is at the house in London. Even if we should manage to move her before returning there, I cannot promise that Michael or Rachel will not speak of her arrival. They are good servants, but not fully witted. They may mean well but they also have loyalties to my father. Where would we put her? Edward moaned quietly. I do wish you had approached me afore acting with such haste. You fault me? Honora asked, her face dubious and shocked. What was I to do? Leave her here for her father to find? God only knows what he would have done if he learned I had kept her here, even for the short time I did. Nay, I did what needed to be done. Papa's arrival is untimely, yes, but we shall figure a way to keep him at Briar Hill until we make other arrangements for Sarah. Of course, I do not fault you he insisted, shaking his head as their gazes met. You have shown remarkable courage in a time of uncertainty. No, of course I have nothing but respect for your bravery in this matter. I cannot say what I would have done. Suddenly, their eyes locked. Were our stares more intense than should be under the watchful eye of witnesses? Edward turned to Benedict who stood nearby, his ears honed to each word as if it was gospel. Mr. Carter, leave us. Edward instructed, hoping his embarrassment did not show in his face. Are you certain that is wise, your grace? I may be able to provide insight. I suggest you rack your mind, for we shall need all the ideas we can gather. Yet, for the time being, I wish to speak with Miss Burney alone. Benedict was prepared to protest once more. On the other hand, one look at the Duke's eye prompted him to reconsider. As if on cue. He nodded once. As you wish, your grace. 
he pivoted and took his exit. Edward returned his eyes to Honora's face and sighed heavily. I will travel to the house to London to collect Sarah. He offered. You must keep your father here as long as possible. Ensure he sees the doctor, show him the clowns. You are clever. Think of a scheme. Collect Sarah? Honora repeated, worry in her tone. Where shall you put her? You must know if there was somewhere safe, I would have brought her there, not my family home. I will think of a place. Edward. She lowered her voice, her eyes darting about, checking if they might be overheard. What is it? She cannot return to Blessington and certainly not to the care of her father. I fear he is the one who has been abusing her. The blade of shock stabbed him throughout his body and he shook his head in denial. It did not fit with the man he had known in his youth. It cannot be. He replied softly, recalling how Abraham had rescued him from his own father's cruelty. He had never shown any propensity for such behavior. He loved Sarah. Yet Edward had to admit that the Abraham Borthwick he had known as a boy and the one who set his barn aflame were hardly the same man. Sarah's pregnancy had affected him in a way no one had expected. Who was to say that Honora's assessment was not true? What other explanation could there be? Did he beat his own daughter so severely that she lost her child and blame me for it all? It makes little sense if he thought his daughter would marry well and be provided for. While it was difficult to reconcile, Edward could not afford to be naive, not any longer. He had spent far too much time forgiving Abraham Borthwick for his anger, nevertheless, matters had escalated too much. Sarah would not have run away if Abraham was treating her well, and everything about the girl suggested she was not being treated properly. Honora is at risk also. Abraham has made no secret that his wrath has no boundaries. If he learns what she has done, Hiding Sarah, Edward shuddered to imagine what would become of Honora. He wondered if William Burney was also to become a target, should his arrival become public knowledge. Nothing will come of Honora, he thought firmly, his brow furrowing in anger. Abraham will not access her, Sarah or Briar Hill again. He will be stopped, today. Edward, what shall we do? Honora urged, mistaking his silence for worry, but he gave her a warm smile. I will do what I should have done from the start. I will stop Abraham's madness once and for all. How, pray tell? Honora sounded exasperated. If he was angry before, he will be livid now. He must realize that we have played some hand in Sarah's disappearance. Edward's head was beginning to swim with the daunting tasks before him. His internal bravery was fine and well but concocting a plan was another matter altogether. You must not fret. He said firmly, his words edged in confidence he did not feel. I will tend to matters. You should never have been caught up in this whirlwind of misfortune. Yet, I am. Honora insisted. I will not permit you to dismiss me going forward. We will work together but my father. She inhaled deeply. Your father needs to rest from his journey. Edward said. Tis your duty to ensure he remains, despite his protests. Edward, perhaps we should tell my father what has happened. His immediate reaction was to shake his head and disagree. Your father is an investor in Briar Hill. He reminded her quietly. He does not require a reminder that the risk he took was great. If he learns about what has transpired in his absence. You do not allow him enough credit. Honora insisted. He is not a judgmental man, and he is worldly. He may have a solution which we have not foreseen previously. If he believes Sarah is in danger, which I am certain is a fact I can prove, he will not sit by idly. Nora, I forbid it. He had not intended to sound harsh. He could hardly envision bringing one more person into the mess which surrounded the duchy, least of all the father of the woman he wished to win over. You forbid it? She echoed, and Edward groaned inwardly, knowing that she had not taken kindly to his tone, but it was too late to retrieve his words. I had not realized I was yours to control. Nora, my concern is for your safety and that of your father's. 
he explained, putting a gentle note to his words. You have been remarkably courageous in your deeds, but you must admit, we are not addressing a sound man in Abraham Borthwick. No matter how reasonable your father may be, Abraham is not utilizing the laws of sanity. The less your father knows on this matter, the better it will be for all. Now, please, enough with this squabbling. It accomplishes nothing and the clock ticks. I must take the coach to London and retrieve Sarah. Nora's lips pressed tightly showed her disapproval but she did not protest further. You must do what you are able to ensure your father remains here. He continued. When I have found a safe haven for Sarah, I will return and see you both to London. And what if Borthwick returns? Benedict will remain at Briar Hill and contend with him. I will arrange for members of the King's Guard to come. It will be hours before any such reinforcements arrive. What if he comes before? Nora. His patience had fizzled entirely. I realize there are flaws to the scheme, but you must know I am planning as we speak. I had not foreseen such an event this evening. Imagine how I felt when a half-mad Sarah Borthwick appeared, seeking sanctuary. Honora replied, sighing. Edward felt a smidgen of sympathy. Gently, he reached forward to take her hand and squeeze the white-gloved fingers softly. You have done more than any woman in your position would do under such circumstances. He told her quietly. She raised her head to stare into his eyes. What position would that be? The question was pointed but sincere. She was attempting to make sense of what was transpiring between them. Why is it that every time we seem to grow closer, something puts a wedge between us? Is that fate conspiring against us or is God testing our strength for one another? It was not something which Edward had time to ponder. I imagine that is a discussion for when I return. He replied lightly. But I believe I have been quite clear about what I feel for you. Have you? He was taken aback by the question. Had he not? It seemed to Edward that his interest in the lovely Honora was obvious to anyone with eyes. Is she being coy? He wondered but was not truly her way. He had never known Honora to act coquettish. Edward finally saw the light, she was genuinely unsure of his feelings. You seem surprised that I ask. Honora said, blinking. Do you believe you have made your intentions toward me clear? He opened his mouth to respond, then he suddenly understood what she was asking. She wishes to know if I sincerely care for her or wish to court her only to unify the duchy. He shook his head and looked away. It pained him to think she would doubt his intentions. Wasn't it obvious that the affection he felt for Honora was unmistakable? Even so, would he have pursued it if not for who her father was? He considered that it did not matter. His feelings for her were true and strong at that moment, even if, as I thought, she remarked. When she pulled her hand from his, Edward realized he had taken too long to respond. Good luck to you. She turned for the stairs before he could stop her, her skirts sweeping by him with finality. Edward was struck by a sense of loss as he watched her ascend the steps, and he missed a great opportunity to explain that his feelings for her surpassed his desire to write the duchy or curry favor with the people. It was too late to gather the proper words, Honora was disappearing from his view, leaving him to stare after her, more void of hope than he had ever known. She may have a valid argument. Benedict offered, standing in the doorway. Edward whirled to glare at his friend. I sent you on your way, not to slink about like some thief in the night. He was embarrassed that Benedict had been there to witness his humiliation. He inhaled sharply. What point would that be? He relented. That I am poor at displaying my feelings? Benedict barked out a quick laugh but shook his head. William Burney may provide us with some insight we have not considered. Moreover, he may agree to allow Sarah to remain in London if we ask. Benedict continued, ignoring Edward's disapproval. The man has only just returned from months abroad to learn of his mother's death. Edward snapped. I will not burden him with this. Suit yourself. Benedict replied, the Duke did not trust his advisor's tone. 
He recalled how the advisor had gone behind his back to ask Honora to speak with Sarah. You will say nothing to William Burney? Edward growled. That is an order. Benedict bowed his head. As you wish. Nor will you have anyone else speak to him about it. Edward elaborated, the feeling of unease punching his gut. Benedict could be sly. Indeed. He agreed. Edward turned away, his head pounding fully with the impending travel and chore ahead. He still had not the foggiest notion what he would do with Sarah when he arrived in London. Chapter 27 Much of the night consisted of Honora pacing the halls, her pulse racing far too wildly to entertain the idea of sleep. Her mind was in a battle with itself as she debated what to do when her father woke. Edward has given me instructions I should not ignore, but how will he contend with this on his own? Sarah is half out of her wits and Abraham will not rest until he finds her. There is danger lurking at every turn. He cannot do this without help and who better than Papa to help him? Honora knew it was terrible to unload such information upon her father when he had only learned about her grandmother's death, but time was of the essence. If she could wait, she would, there was simply no time to waste. In the wee hours of the morning, Benedict found her sitting at the prepping table in the kitchen, drinking yet another cup of hot milk. However, the liquid was doing little to steady her overwrought nerves. Ah, I suspected I might find you roaming about the house. He chuckled, but Honora could not return his smile. Her humor had waned considerably as the hours ticked by. I cannot sleep. She explained although it was very clear. The hour was nearing three. Nor can I. Benedict offered, gesturing at the chair across from her. May I join you? The kitchen was illuminated by only three candles upon the table surface, and Benedict's fair face seemed haunting against the eerie light. She was reminded of the last time he asked to sit with her at a table, and she was instantly on guard. What will he have me do now? She wondered. Something else without Edward's knowledge, undoubtedly. Of course. She sighed. Tis high time we dispensed of formalities, do you not agree, Mr. Carter? You may call me Nora if you please. Benedict shook his head. I do not please. He replied, albeit gently. Tis much easier for a woman of your breeding to accept casualness in court, especially among someone as forgiving as his grace, but I fear it was long ingrained in my fiber to maintain title. A wry smile appeared on Honora's lips, the thought that the rules could not be bent, ridiculous. Do you not find it tiresome? Catering to the whims of the wealthy? This is what your family has done for generations. Do you not wish for something more? Benedict shrugged as he sat. His grace makes my position quite easy. He answered with seeming sincerity. His father and grandfather were insufferable, even cruel men. Honora tensed at the reminder of what Edward had told her. She could only imagine what it would be like to a servant at Briar Hill in those times. He always vowed never to be the same man his father was, and I dare say, he has upheld his vow to the best of his ability. However, life has not been easy for him, as difficult as you may find that to believe, given his royal status. I do not believe that title necessarily affords one a gilded life. Honora replied. I have known princesses who have felt imprisoned and beggars who have known nothing but happiness. Fate deals us all hands which we must play. It is a matter of how we do so which makes us honorable or despicable, not our breeding or title. Benedict's smile was half hidden in the dimness, but Honora saw the sadness it held. You are far wiser than any lady I have ever known. Benedict offered. Tis unsurprising that his grace is so drawn to you. Is he? There was an unmistakable bitterness in her tone and Honora wished she had not spoken. Benedict's head moved up in surprise. You cannot see how he feels about you? He asked. I did not think he was very subtle. Hiding his innermost sentiments was never his strong suit. His sensitivity was something his father tried to flog from him. I dare say the second Duke of Blessington could not bear the reminder that his son was a better man than him, even as a child. Honora could feel heat creeping up her neck, 
and she was thankful that Benedict could not see her fully in the dim light. She rubbed the back of her neck with her free hand and looked up at him. This is hardly an appropriate discussion. She said quickly. He sneered and chuckled dryly. Forgive me for saying, Miss Burney, but I do believe you encouraged the conversation. The red in her cheeks deepened as she realized he was right. I assume there was a reason you were seeking me at this hour, Mr. Carter. She said crisply, determined to steer the exchange in another direction. She was conflicted about what was occurring between her and Edward, and she certainly did not wish to discuss it when she was not sure where her own emotions took her. She wished Benedict had not made conversing so easy. Yes. He agreed. I have sent a messenger to court, demanding guards for protection at Briar Hill. Under what premise? She asked, her eyes widening. Certainly, they will want to know why the urgency. I did not send specific details. Benedict replied. But I have no doubt they will oblige our request. We are not in the habit of sending such demands. Surely the questions will arise sooner or later. Honora muttered but she did not know why she was interrogating Benedict. He was in no better position than she was in many ways, even though the Duke seemed to trust him more than he did her. Or perhaps I am the one being too sensitive. All she was experiencing was so new to Honora, she did not know how to make sense of it all. She reasoned it was best to say nothing at all. I heard the suggestion you made. He continued, to involve your father. She jerked her head up at him, wondering if he, too, was about to reprimand her for her thinking. What of it? I believe you should. The statement hung between them for a long moment as Honora wondered if he tested her loyalty to Edward with the words. She reminded herself again it was Benedict who suggested that she speak with Sarah on the Duke's behalf. His interests are only for Edward, not in disproving my ties. I had made my position well known when I involved myself in these matters. His Grace has forbidden me from speaking to my father about the matter. His Grace is not here. Honora blinked at his boldness. She rubbed the back of her neck and glared at him. He will be furious to know we disobeyed his wishes. She replied slowly. I would not like to add to his mounting unease in the matters around us. I am hoping to alleviate the pressures he experiences by involving your father. Benedict insisted. Surely you agree that we need assistance. We cannot simply hide Sarah Borthwick until the end of days and hope her father will simply forsake the search for her. Tis only a matter of time before he returns, and when he does, with or without the guards present, he will cause more trouble. Think of the scandal which will ensue if it is ever learned that the Duke is hiding the very same woman he is accused of abandoning. It would be a repeat of history. Honora was silent. Her head was beginning to pound. The whispers in town, the stares and awful words, all resurfacing in her mind's eye and ear, but Honora was reluctant still. If her father had not been delivered the tragic news about her grandmother perhaps she would be more apt to agree with Benedict. Furthermore, that issue coupled with Edward's explicit instructions not to involve him, were clouding her desire to do so. I cannot agree to that in the umbra of darkness. She replied slowly. Permit me the night to consider and I will give you my response on the morrow. Of course. Benedict replied, rising. The household sleeps. There is nothing we can do at this moment regardless, and your father does need his rest. Honora stared at him. What is the best outcome we can expect from this? She asked quietly. Even if I should involve my father, what will it do? Benedict studied her face, and she could see that he was as uncertain as she felt. I do not have an answer to that, but it seems that we are doing a poor job of ending this ourselves. It cannot hurt to have fresh eyes on the matter. Your father is a wise and just man. It is the reason His Grace sought him in the beginning. He has brought the duchy good fortune thus far. Perhaps we can extend his luck further. Benedict turned away, but Honora called out to him. Mr. Carter, what will become of Sarah when this is all done? 
she did not know why she asked him, for surely Benedict had no better idea than she did. Perhaps she was seeking reassurance, although she could not say why when she was certain nothing good would become of it all. I cannot say, Miss Burney. I hope for the best, of course, but I fear matters have gone much too far. She nodded, dread filling her stomach, and suddenly she wished desperately she had not permitted Edward to leave for London on his own. Permitted him? He is the Duke. I have no say in what he does or where he goes. You have already pushed your good fortune several times with him. Idly, she considered going after him. He had likely already arrived. If she left then, she would be there by early morning, but what good would her presence do? She would only cause more tension between Edward and Sarah if she were to go. She felt the sudden wave of exhaustion washed over her, and the sleep which had been eluding her touched her at once. She needed her rest and a clear mind to seize the day. Tired thinking would accomplish nothing, and she had promised to give Benedict an answer on the morrow. I must rest now, she thought wearily, rising from the table to make her way up the back stairs and toward her apartment. She stumbled, half asleep through the halls and found herself pausing before her grandmother's abandoned chambers. Honora's heart began to race and unexpected tears filled her eyes. Oh, how she missed the old woman's sharp wit and wise counsel. She would have given anything to hear Marjorie's voice at that moment. What should I do, Grandmama? She called out silently. How do we make this better? She thought she heard a rueful chuckle as if her grandmother had been waiting for such a question. You know what to do, it replied. But you are simply ignoring the sense God gave you. The answer made her gut flutter slightly, and Honora looked about the dark room, wondering if the spirit of her grandmother still lingered about. It would not have shocked Honora to see Marjorie standing aside, clucking her tongue at the servants as they improperly made the beds. The idea made her smile, albeit through her tears. What would Grandmama have done? She wondered, but again, she found she knew the answer. When had Honora ever succumbed to what was demanded of her? Her life had not followed the traditions of other women and until coming to Briar Hill, it had suited her well. Being thrust into a place of titles and status should not dissuade her from following what she knew was the proper path. Her moral compass would not be guided by rules and orders. No matter what Edward believes, he cannot do this alone. I must do something. Honora spun and moved through the halls, her instinct and memory guiding her through the manor house with minimal light until she stood outside a closed wooden door. Inhaling sharply, she raised her hand and knocked loudly before she could change her mind. There was no answer for a long moment, and Honora rapped again, this time with more force and determination. Who is there? What is the meaning of this? William growled. She heard the sound of alarm in his voice and was instantly contrite. Papa, it is me, Nora. The door swung inward and a bleary-eyed, disheveled William Burney stood, his eyes wide with confusion as he stared at his daughter. What in God's name are you doing here at this hour? Is there a fire? Are you ill? She shook her head, but she could not deny the waves of sickness roll in the pit of her stomach. No, Papa but I need your help. He stared at her face with concern. What is it? Are you hurt? Good God, what is happening in this house? No, Papa, may I come inside? She told him quickly. It is not me. I need your help for someone else. He looked through the halls expecting to be overheard, and he nodded. He seemed to sense her nervousness and his face softened instantly. Of course, child, come in. She hurried in after him and closed the door, turning to face him with wide eyes. He peered at her uncomprehendingly, noting her attire. He glanced toward the window as if to gauge the time and she instantly saw how discombobulated he appeared to be. Why are you dressed, Nora? Where are you going? The hour is late. She inhaled and stared at him with apologetic eyes. Papa, I am afraid you must dress too. She replied quietly. We must go to London at once. Nora. He groaned slightly. We are scheduled to leave on the morrow. That is mere hours from now, is it not? It cannot wait that long. She insisted. We must leave now. 
I will explain on the journey, but we haven't a moment to waste, Papa. Please, you must trust in my words. It is of the utmost urgency. William's eyes narrowed, and he exhaled in a slow gust of wind. Oh, Nora. He mumbled, realization coloring his face. What trouble found you in my absence? She shook her head vehemently. Tis not my trouble. She assured him. Tis the Duke's, and if we do not hurry, I fear we are in for more. You must elaborate, daughter. I fear the exhaustion and grief have tainted my mind and I am in no mood for riddles. Papa. She sighed. Sarah Borthwick is hiding at the house in London. The Duke has gone to retrieve her before her father finds her. She is in danger, Papa and so is the Duke. W.H. who? He rubbed his eyes and struck a match to light a candle on the nightstand. The shadowy flames displayed the tired sacks beneath his eyes. He took a heavy breath and stared at her face intently. Who is Sarah Brothborth? He gave up trying to remember the name. You make little sense, daughter. What has happened? Honora inhaled, thinking of the fastest way to explain what had occurred, but the more she thought about it, the more she realized how twisted and confusing the tale had become in the time since he had been gone. It did not stop her from trying. Papa, Sarah Borthwick was the woman who was engaged to the Duke, the one dot well, you have heard the tales. She has fled her home and now she is in the London house. The Duke has gone there before you find her, but I do not think he has another place to put her. Honora knew she was doing a poor job of telling what needed to be said but there was limited time. She continued, her words coming out in a rush of air and she tried to show him the importance of her words. Please, Papa, I can tell you better as we travel, but we must go before he moves her somewhere else. I fear she will not receive the news of being uprooted well and there is truly no reason she cannot stay in London with your blessing. William continued to stare at her as if weighing the truth. So, what I am to glean from this, is that you have hidden this girl from her father in our house. He summarized. Is that what you are saying? Yes, Papa. She replied, relieved that he understood despite her torrent of words. William stared at her for a long moment before nodding curtly and she exhaled. Honora had not realized she had been holding her breath. I will ready myself. He said flatly, and Honora felt a worm of worry slither her spine. He had not spoken with the determination to help that she had expected. Papa? She asked, unsure of his expression. Are you upset? He snorted, an uneasiness crept back inside Honora's body. Suddenly. She wished she had simply returned to her room and rested as her exhausted frame demanded. Upset? He choked. That may be the most understated thing you have ever said, Nora. I sent you here believing that the Duke would protect and care for you and your grandmother while I was gone. I thought him to be a godsend, appearing just as I left for my journey. Instead, I returned to a death and a kidnapping. Needless to say, we shan't return from London once we leave here. Papa, tis not so. Honora gasped, her face paling dramatically as she realized the mistake she had made in telling him. How could she have foreseen that he would take the news in such a fashion? It had never occurred to her. The William Burney she knew fought against injustice and made his own way in life. To think, I had hoped you might find a match in the Duke. Watching his storm blow in the room in her exhausted state was making her dizzy. Please, Papa, tis not his fault. She protested. It is the doing of Abraham Borthwick. He is dash. Silence. I do not need to hear your excuses for the Duke's wayward behavior. I will not hear your justifications for kidnapping a girl from her worried father, particularly not a fallen woman who has given her family enough trouble for one lifetime. Oh dot why did I not listen to Edward? Could he have imagined such a response? Papa, Edward has not done anything but help Sarah, I swear to you. He is a good man and he cares for Sarah a great deal. Whatever you believe you know about him, he is not the same man they say. Edward? William's eyebrows shot up, 
fury coloring his eyes. Has he been inappropriate with you? Have you succumbed to temptation, Nora? Honora was aghast that her father would ever consider such a thing about her or Edward. Certainly not. She choked, her face scarlet with the implication. Never. He scoffed. He did not argue with her but he did not even believe her. Instead, he turned back to the matter at hand, drawing his pants up as Honora thought of something to say which would make him hear her. I have no one to blame but myself for this. He muttered. You and your grandmother warned me about his character, but I did not listen. Now you and your grandmother have suffered as a result. Papa! Papa! No! She protested. Tis not, enough, Nora. It is clear he has you under his spell. I pray he has not dishonored you and you have not dishonored our family. Nora was certain she would faint at the implication. She tried to reason that he was exhausted and not thinking clearly, but the idea that she had given herself to a man freely and without the benefit of marriage. Papa! She howled in frustration, knowing that there was little she could do to alter his mindset. He shook his head, grunting. Come along, Nora. Let us leave this place and deal with the mess that man has made. I will speak to him about getting a return on my investment. She began to back out of the room, her hands up as if to ward off the nightmare she had walked herself into. Honora's head was swimming as she realized the damage of what she had done. It was bad enough that her father was taking her home. Furthermore, he would ruin the duchy if he demanded his money in return. Everything Edward had worked so hard to recover and reclaim would be lost. Edward would be lost. What have I done? She cried silently seeing that there would be no reasoning with her incensed father. She prayed that the journey would still his raging nerves enough for a logical conversation. What are you waiting for, Nora? Pack your things. We leave at once. Papa. She was feeling queasy with the idea that she might never return to Briar Hill. Papa, you must listen to me. You must do as you're told, Nora. He barked back. You will meet me at the entrance in a quarter hour, no more. Her eyes begged for mercy, but he wasn't listening to her. His face contorted into a mask of determination as he finished dressing hastily. She floundered down the hallway trying to keep her focus with a tired body, a dizzy mind, and a queasy stomach. Once inside, she flung herself onto the bed, burying her face in the pillows, her heart pounding with such force, she was certain it would leap from her chest. She thought about finding Benedict and explaining what had happened, but what could the adviser do? He would only be another target of William's ire. How could I have been so foolish? She moaned silently. How did I manage to make matters worse than they were before? She realized then that her anguish had little to do with Sarah Borthwick and all to do with the idea that she had missed her opportunity to pursue a future with Edward. Chapter 28 Edward stared at the butler in disbelief. But Michael did not flinch, his eyes dark and dead as he appeared to look through the Duke. You have the wrong residence. He intoned. Edward stifled a sigh and looked at the lanky coachman. It was the third time he had uttered the same sentence since Edward had arrived as if those were the only words he knew. Asking for Sarah had caused the man to clam up and lose any sense of humor he might have once possessed. You are Michael, are you not? Edward tried forcing a smile on his face. I know your name. You have the wrong residence. He repeated, and Edward ground his teeth together. If he never heard that phrase again, he would die a happy man. Michael, we met at Briar Hill when Mrs. Bernie passed, do you remember? You came to bring them back, and I was forced to send you back to London. You have the wrong dash. Please. Edward snapped, his wits thin. Time was wasting while he stood arguing with a simpleton. You must tell Miss Borthwick that Edward is here. It is a matter of urgency, and she need come with me at once. He opened his mouth to repeat the sentence once more, but before he could, a woman appeared behind him. Michael, what is the negation your grace? Edward exhaled with relief as the housekeeper appeared at the top of the stairwell. 
she clearly recognized him from the brief time he and Benedict had spent at the home before Honora and Marjorie had traveled to Briar Hill. What brings you here? Rachel asked pleasantly, seemingly unperturbed by his arrival. Michael eyed Rachel worriedly as if Honora's instructions to protect Sarah still rang clearly in his mind. Edward admitted, he was moved by the butler's resolve and faithfulness. I must see Miss Borthwick at once. He explained. Mr. Burney has already returned from his trip abroad and will be home promptly. I must find another place for her to stay. Rachel's face registered shock and she gasped, a hand fluttering on her throat. My word! She muttered. I thought he was not due back for a fortnight. I will collect her for you at once. You have the wrong residence. Michael insisted, looking desperately at Rachel. He has the wrong residence. Michael, this is the Duke of Blessington and he is a friend. You need not protect Miss Borthwick from him. Rachel turned apologetically to the Duke, descending the stairs quickly to usher him inside. You must forgive Michael. I fear he is somewhat simple, but his heart is pure. Come and rest by the fire. I will fetch you some tea and collect Miss Borthwick at once. Thank you. Edward replied, relieved that one obstacle was overcome. There was still a matter of where to put Sarah. He had considered convents in the area, but he had a terrible sense of foreboding that Sarah would not easily go for such an idea. She may not have a choice in the matter. Where else can I send her where she will not be easily found and at least until I have formulated a plan to put her somewhere she might start afresh? Edward perched on the settee, noticing for the first time that the temperature had dropped considerably. He had ridden through the night, his mind occupied and barely aware that the summer weather had slipped into the light frosts of autumn seemingly overnight. The fire felt wonderful and despite his churning mind, Edward permitted himself to relax. Rachel reappeared in the salon, a silver tray in her hand. Your Grace. She placed the tray before him and Edward nodded amiably. Rachel. He said as she turned to leave. He remembered the conversation he had with Honora regarding her loyal but not overly keen staff. Your Grace? Rachel asked, hurrying back toward him. You must not mention to Mr. Burney what Miss Burney has done. She meant only to protect my friend in need by bringing Miss Borthwick here. She does not deserve a punishment for such an act. Rachel paused, her eyes moving downward. I will not fib to my employer, your grace. She murmured. He is a good employer and a good man. I do not wish to lose my job. Miss Burney is your employer also? He reminded her, trying to keep the ire from his tone. One who I would wager is much kinder to you. Rachel's cheeks tinged slightly, and she nodded. Agreed, your grace. She left him alone, but he was not filled with confidence when she did. Michael was just as worrisome, particularly because he seemed to lack control of his faculties. I wonder what it will take to ensure she does not speak to William? Perhaps Nora can convince her. I will need to speak with her about it when I return to Blessington. Edward, what on earth are you doing here? He jumped to his feet as Sarah entered the room, and he was taken aback by how much healthier she seemed since the last time he had seen her. She was freshly bathed, her blonde ringlets falling loose at the sides but pinned to the side in a set of simple gold combs. Her dress was too large, clearly one of Honora's, but held together at the waist with a bright pink sash to keep the white material from falling. Still, she was lovely, a slight color reaching her cheeks and he was relieved to see her seeming more coherent than that day he had seen her at Briar Hill. How are you? He asked, hurrying toward her. He could not resist gathering her into a warm hug, and she immediately responded, her frail arms encasing his waist. She was so much lighter than she had ever been, even when they were children. Has Borthwick been starving her too or has she simply refused to eat? There would be time enough to ask questions of Sarah but after she was secured far from her father's desperate clutches. What kind of man keeps his daughter in such a state? What happened to the man I used to know? I cannot believe my eyes. She gasped when they parted. What brings you here? Is Nora all right? 
She seemed to recognize there was an oddity at his presence and her smile faded to a frown. Nora is well, Sarah but we must move you from here. Nora's father has returned early and will be returning within a day. Sarah's face paled, she gaped at him and she stepped back, shaking her head. I thought he was not due home for weeks. That was what Nora said. Twas what we last heard. He assured her quickly. But their plans changed, and he will be back soon. Where is he now? Briar Hill but he wishes to leave this morrow. I have left Nora there to convince him to rest but given this is the resting place of his mother, he will be apt to leave with urgency. Where will I go, Edward? She joked. I cannot return home. I would not send you back home, but I am afraid our options are not many. They stared at each other silently, but he could see she already had an idea in her own mind. You are considering a convent then? She asked finally as if reading his thoughts. How did you know? He asked in surprise. She laughed lightly but there was no mirth in the least. I had considered it for myself. She replied, sighing. In truth, I did not expect that you would hide me, and I certainly could not have imagined that Nora would have gone through such trouble. Sarah smiled, her eyes sparkling but sad. She truly cares for you. She murmured. A great deal. How do you know? How do you not? Any woman who would risk so much for a woman she does not know dot well, it does not take a great deal of wit to imagine why she has done it. Sarah paused, cocking her head to examine his face. You care for her too. It was not a question but a statement filled with certainty. Edward did not alter his gaze and he stared at her firmly. I do. It was the first time he had said so aloud, and Edward felt as though a weight had been lifted off him by confessing his feelings for Honora. Why am I disclosing this to Sarah and not Honora? He wondered. We have been dancing about our intentions with one another. What foolishness. We would rather throw ourselves into danger than discuss our emotions. You should be with her. Sarah told him. You will never find anyone with as much honor as her. She is aptly named. He smiled and for the first time in over a year, he felt as if he was speaking with the Sarah whom he had befriended as a child. She has always been in there. She only needed to escape the hold of her father for me to find her. In time, she will return to being the sweet, kind, loving girl who was my dear friend. Who is still my dear friend. I will help her. Sarah, you came to me. He said, determined to learn the truth of what had happened once and for all. What were you there to tell me that day? She shook her blonde tresses, hanging her head. She inhaled and released a breath shakily. It matters not now. She told him. I am out of Blessington, and I will leave my past behind me, where it belongs. It matters. He insisted. Has your father raised his hand to you? Is that what happened with your baby? Her face waned before his eyes and Edward hoped he had not pushed her too deeply. He knew she was deeply wounded and that speaking of her ordeal was not going to come easily. Please, Edward, you must leave well enough alone. I will leave with you, but you must not ask me any more questions. Sarah, I vowed to help you but how can I when you will not tell me all I need to know? I want to bring your father to justice, not only for the torment he has inflicted upon me but what he has done to you also. Her eyes locked on his and a slight quiver touched her chin. Permit me a moment to collect what I can. She told him, and Edward could see that she would provide him no more information. She disappeared from view, retreating up to the second floor, and Edward sighed heavily. He leaned against the doorframe, suddenly aware just how tired he was. I will take her away and then what will happen? Abraham will never stop. For Honora and I, it will never end. Sarah might escape, but will we? The sound of hooves outside attracted his attention, and Edward moved his head toward the window of the front salon as a simple cart approached. There was something distinctly familiar about it, but before his mind could reconcile who it might be, 
the driver showed himself, leaping from the bench as if he was a condor on the prey. He moved like lightning, flying up the stairs two at a time as the hard, relentless knocks hit the door followed by the booming, unforgiving voice of Abraham Borthwick. How had he found her? There was only one way which Edward could imagine it had happened. Borthwick must have been stalking Briar Hill, waiting for him to leave and therefore following him all the way to London. The man is mad. Sarah. I know you are inside. Show yourself at once. Edward yelled out through the second-floor hallway, unsure of which door was hers. Sarah. You must hide. Do not come out until I find you. He looked through the halls, his feet pounding across the wooden floor as the knocking became violent below. Excuse me. Rachel exclaimed in surprise, and Edward knew that Borthwick had pushed his way inside the house. You cannot come in here, sir. Where is my daughter? Tell me where she is. Sir, you must leave. You have the wrong residence. The housekeeper shrieked, but footfalls told Edward that Abraham was not accepting such an answer. Sarah. Edward hissed, lowering his voice. Sarah, where are you? Suddenly, a door opened at the opposite end of the hall, and his friend stepped forward, her face translucent but expressionless. Come. He gestured wildly as he sprung toward her. We must find a way from here. He followed you. She said, her tone flat. He will not stop. He will not have a choice. Edward whispered firmly. You mustn't give up hope now. Let us go. To his shock, she refused to move, standing in place as if she had sprouted roots. Below, the shouting increased and then there were footsteps on the stairs. Please, Sarah. He begged. You mustn't lose faith. I will protect you. Honora will protect you. We have already shown you that we will. She did not move, as if his words had a profound effect on her and her pale face seemed to soften in defeat. You have sacrificed enough for me, both of you. You need to live your own life now, Eddie. I have stolen too much of your life these past months. You are speaking nonsense. Panic filled his tone as he realized how close they were to being caught but Sarah refused to move. No. She said softly. I am not. I am doing what I should have done long ago. He watched as her eyes widened, but her stoic expression remained in place and Edward realized they had been caught, that her father had found them, rooted in place. You. Abraham spat, the venom in his voice almost lethal in itself. How dare you touch my daughter, steal her from her home. Just because you are duped does not make you exempt from charges. He did not kidnap me, father. Sarah sighed, her eyes traveling back to Edward's face. I left on my own and he has been trying to save me. Save you? Abraham howled, cackling with humorless laughter. Edward, Duke of Blessington is hardly anyone's savior, daughter. Come with me. I will bring you home where you belong. What dress are you wearing? You are a disgrace. Edward thought about how he had last seen her, filthy and in nightclothes. Sarah seemed much happier in a dress too large than a nightgown which had not been washed in weeks. Sarah shook her head mournfully and Edward pivoted to face his arch rival face to face. She is not going anywhere with you. He told him. She has endured enough at your hand. All of us have endured enough at your hand. You are a madman and I will have you locked up if it is the last thing I ever do. Silence. Abraham roared, the insanity in his eyes alarming but Edward stood his ground. The man had stolen enough from him in the past months to warrant Edward's wrath. You are a sick, old fool, Abraham. Edward pressed on. You haven't the foggiest notion of what occurs under your own nose. Can you not see Sarah is a shadow of her former self? Can you not see that she needs care and warmth, not to be locked away and shunned? You dare lecture me on how to treat my daughter? After what you have done? Abraham strode toward them and Edward braced himself for an inevitable tussle but before he could make a move, Sarah screamed out. Stop! Stop it this minute! Edward inhaled sharply, 
sensing the panic in her voice and he eyed Abraham warily, expecting an unexpected punch. I would not put it past him to do such a sneaky thing, he thought, but Abraham seemed just as paralyzed by Sarah's outburst as he had been. You must not worry, Sarah. Edward insisted. I will not permit him to take you. She is my daughter. You have no say, you bastard pig. Fury bristled through Edward and he spun to confront the man, his fists drawn but before either man could react, Sarah spoke again. Father. Sarah sighed as the men glared at one another. Edward was not my baby's father. Chapter 29 Nora was unsure if she wished for the horses to move faster or slower. On one hand, she did not wish to share the same air as her livid father for another moment. Simultaneously, she wanted nothing more than to prolong what would happen when they arrived in London. The confrontation between the Duke and the Merchant was bound to be something of which legends were made but more importantly, what would her father do with Sarah? Would he order her home, or would he help hide her, despite his bitter feelings on the matter? Assuming that Edward has not already flown the roost with Sarah? I pray we are not too late, that perhaps clearer heads will prevail when we are all facing one another. Honora did not have very high hopes. William had said very little, refusing to stop even for a moment and the horses pounded against the ground until finally, they arrived at the house in London. How was I only here a day ago? It feels as if I have not seen the house in weeks. She reasoned the lack of rest had much to do with her skewed perception of time. Is that the Duke's coach? Her father's voice caused her to jump, the unexpectedness of his words jarring her and she leaned forward, apprehension shooting through her body like pellets. Indeed. She mumbled, wondering why they still remained. I should have known he did not have a plan. He was only attempting to put my mind at ease. Honora was unsure if she found the fact endearing or frustrating. It was quite possibly a fusion of the two emotions. The carriage barely stopped, and William disembarked, not waiting for the hired coachman to open the door. Honora tripped down the steps to follow him, her pulse threading through her veins in an erratic rhythm. Whose wagon is that? Honora glanced at where her father pointed, but she could not say, the feeling of dread mounting with each step they took. Gathering her skirts in her gloved hands, she jumped up the steps in an unladylike way, racing her father to the entrance as if she hoped to intercede with what was occurring in the house. Nora, you will wait here. William growled but she ignored him as if she hadn't heard his words and raced through the front door. Instantly, her eyes fell on Michael and Rachel who stood at the base of the stairs, their eyes trained upward. What is happening? Honora demanded, and the servants spun to look at her, gasping as William appeared on her heels. They were saved from answering when a man's voice reverberated down the staircase, contemptuous and disbelieving. You expect me to believe such a lie after all this time? What has he told you? Has he threatened you? A shock of terror flooded on Aura as she recognized the man's tones Abraham Borthwick. No, father. Tis the truth. Sarah mumbled. I swear it. Honora, you will wait outside. William ordered again but she was already moving up the steps toward the commotion on the second floor. I do not believe you. Abraham's tone was filled with anger. It matters not. You will come with me. Tis not the time nor place for such a discussion, not while you succumb to his spell. Honora rounded the corner and froze, watching the trio, too involved in one another to notice her arrival. No. Sarah yelled. I will not. Not until you listen to what I have to say. Sarah, so help me God, I am at my wit's end with you. I did not wish to have you sent to Bedlam but dash. Do it. She screamed. Do it. Do you not think I have not lived in hell for the past months? There is nothing the sanatorium can do to me which does not already exist inside my head. Sarah. Edward murmured. You will not be sent away. I swear it. You have sworn enough oaths to me. You must stop swearing oaths and fend for yourself. And yours. Sarah seemed to notice for the first time that Honora had appeared. 
As if a veil had lifted over her face, she changed, dropping her gaze away. Honora feared she had ruined the moment of truth in her arrival, but Sarah continued to speak, her words guarded. Father, I speak the truth. Edward was never the child's father. He offered to marry me when he learned that I was with child because he is that honorable. Abraham tried to laugh but it escaped his mouth like a guttural bark. No. He grunted. No. There is no man alive who would accept such a blow to his reputation simply to be a gentleman and certainly not a duke. Edward did. When I lost the child, twas I who broke off the engagement. He was still willing to marry me and save the scrap which was left of my virtue, but I refused. Why? Abraham gasped, understanding doused his burnt amber eyes. Why would you do that? Why would you risk the shame, our shame? Why would I commit him to a life of misery in a loveless union, father? I am not mother. I would not suffer in silence until it became too much to bear. She trailed off as if she had said too much in front of too many. Honora realized that Sarah's mother had taken her own life, thus explaining the mystery surrounding the arrival of the Borthwicks in Blessington. Anguish filled Honora's soul as she saw how close Sarah must be to following in the same path. Although, Sarah muttered, more to herself than anyone else. I do not entirely blame her. Sarah. The men cried their faces white. Honora stifled a cry, biting on her lower lip. You must never speak that way. Abraham choked a sob in his voice. But you are strong, so much stronger than your mother ever was. Tis why I called off the engagement. Father, you owe Edward a lifetime of apologies. He tried to save you from shame and you punished him. You continue to punish him and now, he is almost broken. Sarah. Edward said pleadingly. You need not worry about me. I have endured so much worse than the flapping gums of the people. Yes. Sarah sighed. I recall. Do you, father? Do you remember how cruelly the second Duke of Blessington treated his son? Do you remember the whip marks you cleaned and the tears you dried? Honoro saw as the older man visibly swallowed the humiliation on his face painted and unmoving. You treated him like he was your own son because he had no father. Sarah muttered. Not one in the true sense. How could you believe the worst of him, even when I told you that all was not what it seemed? You were eager to smear him, to tarnish the modicum of respect he possessed in this duchy. He was bequeathed a travesty and you made life so much worse for him. You are no better than his own father. How could I have known? Abraham moaned. How could I have known? You did not want to know the real truth, father. Th that is ridiculous. Why? Why would I not? Tis you who hid it. I have no fault in this. Sarah clamped her mouth shut and turned her head away again, her hair falling over a smooth cheek, but Honora could see the tears filling her light eyes. Is this true? You did this? Your Grace? William stepped forward and Honora was startled. She had all but forgotten that her father was on her heels and she cringed at his voice, although it did mean he had heard the conversation. He heard the truth too. The realization elated Honora. It would not matter how much she attempted to plead Edward's case. William would never believe what she had to say. In this way, he had no choice but to accept what he was hearing. It is true. Sarah insisted. Edward held on to my secret for months, endured the worst a nobleman should ever have to endure and never once complained. He is not a nobleman, he is a saint. Edward scoffed and shook his head. I am your friend. He corrected. I would do anything for those I love. Your Grace. Abraham dropped to his knees, reaching his hands toward the Duke. Your Grace. Will you ever forgive me for what I have done? He moaned. I throw myself at your mercy. Get off your knees at once. Edward growled, flushed with embarrassment. Stop that. You believed you were protecting your daughter, no matter how misguided your actions may have been. 
Abraham shook his head and Honora was ashamed for him as he began to grovel. I will spend my life repenting for the sins I have committed against you and your house. I will forever be in your debt. Please, your grace, tell me how I can make amends in your eyes. Abraham. Rise at once. There was no room for protest in Edward's tone of authority booming throughout the second story. Honora flinched although she knew it had nothing to do with her. Reluctantly, he stood, his chin still to his chest. Why did you not tell the truth before, Miss Borthwick? William demanded, still unsure of what he was hearing. If you consider the Duke to be such an honourable man, how could you permit him to suffer in silence for so long? This time it was Sarah who shifted her gaze away. There was a reason, I assure you. The words were barely audible, but Honora heard them. She did not offer more than that and a heavy silence ensued until Edward broke it. It matters not. He declared. The truth is revealed now, and I trust we will put this unpleasantness behind us. Your Grace, you will never see my face again, if you so desire. Abraham mumbled. I will leave Blessington, leave England. Edward grunted in exasperation. I do not entirely fault you, Abraham. He said begrudgingly. But I dare say, you need to control your temper. You could have hurt someone with the fire. You were responsible for rebuilding the barn. Yes, Your Grace. I will work at night, having it restored. The men nodded at one another and another uncomfortable silence followed as if no one knew precisely what to say. Honora was reluctant to breathe, worried that if she did, it would ruin the tentative truce which enveloped them. Who is the louse who left you with child? Again, it was William who spoke, his unabashed question causing Honora to cringe. Papa, I dare say, if Miss Borthwick wished to disclose his name, she would have done so. No, Mr. Bernie is within reason to ask. Abraham insisted. Who is this man? I will have his testes skewered upon our return to Blessington. This is precisely what I meant about your temper, Abraham. Edward commented, sighing. No. Sarah muttered. I will not disclose his name. You will. I will not. Her voice raised an octave and the plaintiveness of her words sent chills through Honora. A thought tickled the corners of her mind as her eyes met Sarah's for the first time since they arrived. Oh, with an abruptness that almost knocked the wind from her body, Honora realized something sickening and awful. She understood the dark secret abruptly and with blinding clarity although she desperately wished she could banish it from her mind forever. We needn't discuss it now. Abraham said hastily as if he sensed his daughter's nearness to having a fit. Now, we return home. No. Honora shouted, and all eyes turned to her in shock. No? Abraham echoed, and Honora shook her honey-brown strands determinedly. No. She said again. Sarah will stay here. With us? With us? Edward repeated. You will stay, too? Nora, this is a family matter now, not one for you to interfere. William told her gruffly, but Honora stood firmly. This is for Sarah to decide. She is disgraced in Blessington but no one here knows of her past. It will be a new start for her. She will remain here if she so chooses. Sarah? The blonde cast her new friend a strange but grateful look. Yes, please. She whispered, and Honora knew her inkling had been right. She steeled herself to keep from screaming aloud and she nodded. Papa, what say you? We certainly have the room. William seemed dazed by the events and he looked hopelessly at Edward and Abraham who were equally perplexed. Sarah, you have nothing to fear at home. I will forsake my vendetta, obviously. Please, come home where I can care for you. Abraham begged. You will be missed. Please, father, permit me to stay with Nora, at least for a short time. Abraham inhaled deeply and cast William a worried look. Will you swear to care for her? 
better than her own home. Honora interrupted grimly, her eyes fixated on Sarah. Very slowly, her terse features seemed to relax as she saw her father was about to concede the arrangement. Very well. Abraham muttered, sensing he had lost his daughter. Write me, please, Sarah. Of course, I will, father and often. Awkwardly, father and daughter embraced, and Abraham turned to hurry down the steps without another word to anyone. Nora, I must have a word with you. William growled, apparently displeased with the arrangements being made without his consent. He rushed after Borthwick attempting to comfort the man, leaving Sarah, Edward and Honora alone. With the older men gone, Sarah seemed to physically lose the wind in her body and Edward caught her as she crumbled sideways. Thank you, Nora. She breathed, her eyes wet with unshed tears. You continue to save me. You are my guardian angel. Both of you. If not for you both, I would have followed my mother Dash. Come along. Honora interrupted quickly, not wishing to think of what Sarah might have done to hurt herself. You should rest. You have been through much, too much. Gratefully, she permitted Honora to lead her back to her room. Shall I wait? Edward called after them, and Honora cast him a look over her shoulder as she shuffled Sarah along. If you wish. She replied, turning her head back to face front. In her heart, she did hope he waited, but she could not be certain he would. He wishes. Sarah murmured, and Honora could not help smiling, despite the bile bubbling in her gut. Chapter 30 Edward was awash with conflicting emotions as he stood in the hall, waiting for Honora to return. Learning that she did not intend to return to Blessington had been a blow he had not expected, but the relief that he was heading home to a truce tried to counterbalance his despair. It was evident that Honora saw something in Sarah which had inspired the invitation to remain at the house in London. What it was, Edward was not certain. Of course, he intended to ask. Perhaps she is concerned that Sarah is apt to hurt herself or maybe she knows more than she has told us. The revelation that Sarah's mother had taken her own life was stunning to him. As close as he and Sarah had been, she had never disclosed such a dark secret from her past. Edward could certainly understand why, having been the subject of scrutiny for longer than he cared to recall. A suicide in the family could only cause rumors and innuendo among the townsfolk. It was a small wonder that the Borthwick brothers had quietly moved Sarah away from their own town to start anew. He heard a door close and Edward looked up as Honora made her way back to where he stood, her dress sweeping at the floors as she walked in small, even steps. Edward caught himself marveling at her movements as he often did. It seemed incredible that she was such a package of all things wonderful. But I will no longer have the luxury of seeing her day after day. I waited too long to tell her how I feel about her and now she is gone. For a moment, he thought he heard Sarah's voice teasing him, urging him to tell her that he wanted to be with her. She fell asleep as her curls touched the pillow. Honora announced. Edward smiled. I hope she will have a full and restful sleep. As you say, she has endured more than most in such a short time. Honora nodded, her eyes searching his face, but she seemed distracted. Edward wondered if she had the same things on her mind as he did on his. There was only one way to know for certain and he intended to ask her. Nora, I dash. At precisely the same moment, Honora spoke. Edward, I feel disloyal negation. They both stopped and laughed nervously. Go ahead. She urged. What have you to say? Firstly, I would like to thank you for everything you have done for Sarah. I have worried about her, but she seemed to have closed herself off in the wake of all that happened. I begrudgingly accept that you and Benedict contrived a good scheme when he asked you to meet with her. She likes you. I rather like her. Honora replied. And you needn't thank me. It is my pleasure and honor to help end this misguided vendetta which Abraham Borthwick had against you. She smiled at him and he returned her beam. Now what were you going to say? He urged, his pulse quickening with hope. Her brow furrowed slightly. That was all you had to say? 
You commenced by saying firstly. I imagine there was another matter you wished to discuss. Fool, Edward cursed himself mind your wording in the future. He cleared his throat nervously, casting his eyes down before speaking again. You will stay in London then? He blurted the question forth before he could stop himself, wishing he had considered his query more carefully. She stared at his face pensively for a long moment before nodding slowly. For the time, yes. Her smile had faded entirely, and Edward wondered if he was broaching the subject with too much vigor. How can it be? He thought with some annoyance. We have been skirting the issue for weeks. She must know how I feel about her. Perhaps she has thought it through and does not feel the same after all. She has been a free-spirited woman for so long, the idea of settling down and marriage, even for the benefit of her business, may be repugnant. He supposed that the idea of marrying for love had not occurred to her in the least and he tried to stifle the regret tugging at him. Edward, we cannot allow Sarah to return to her father's home, not until. She seemed unable to finish her thought and he peered at her, assured that her desire to stay in London had nothing to do with him. Until what? He asked. What do you suspect? Sighing, she stared up at him. Her lips parted as she collected the necessary words to speak. I worried that her father was abusing her. She explained, and Edward tensed, knowing he, too, had shared the same thoughts. You no longer believe that? He asked. She shook her head. No. Sarah insists he does not and you have known the man much longer than I have. You do not believe he is capable of such acts. All he has done has been in defense of his daughter, not to harm her, warped as his reasoning might be. Edward nodded in agreement. Yet you do not believe she should return. Why not? Someone is abusing her. I have seen the marks. Someone beat her severely enough to lose the child she carried. If not her father, there is only one other who has had regular access to her. Edward stared at her his mind spinning as the answer hit him with force. No. He mumbled. You could not mean. Before, it could have been anyone but in the past months, she has been mostly locked away in the cottage. No one has seen nor heard from her, Edward. There is only one other who could do this and do this without Abraham noticing such an atrocity, someone whom Sarah would be afraid to speak of. Oh. The word escaped his mouth like a low, horrified wail and Edward's jaw dropped. He felt a wave of nausea coursed through his body. He thought of Abraham's mild-mannered brother, the voice of reason when the older Borthwick seemed to lose control. It was unfathomable that Walter Borthwick could be capable of what Honora was suggesting but if not him, who else indeed? Why? Why would he treat her like that? And why did Abraham not stop him? Abraham has been so caught up in his ploy for vengeance, I doubt he has noticed much about what is occurring under his nose. The cottage was in shambles when I visited there, the laundry unwashed. I doubt Abraham had eyes for anything when it was all stained red with his rage. I will murder him with my bare hands. Edward promised through clenched teeth. I will make him suffer greater than anything he has ever known in his life. You must not touch him. Honora's voice was firm. He will be brought to justice but not for abusing his niece. Edward stared at Honora with confusion. For what then? He demanded. What else has he done? Honora seemed to grow paler as he stared at her. She eyed him pleadingly. What is it? He asked, his brow furrowing and she looked at the ground, twisting her fingers in nervousness. Whatever she needed to say, she did not wish to say aloud. Nora, what it? With a sigh, she explained her thoughts. Why do you believe Sarah has been so secretive about the father of her child? The question was asked so quietly, Edward was certain he had misunderstood. She did not even disclose his identity to you, the man who was going to save her from her own shame. I believe she called off the engagement because Walter forced her to do it. He did not wish to let her go. He wanted her close where she had always been. No. Edward choked. No. I cannot hear this, Nora. 
It is why she never did tell her father the truth until now, Edward. With everyone looking at you, no one dared question her. She did not want to hurt you, but she knew if anyone found out what Walter was doing, he would hurt her. She was not running from her father. She was running from her uncle. Edward reeled backward, suddenly finding it difficult to breathe. He was certain his heart was failing under the weight of what he had been told. H. How certain are you of this? He choked although as he thought of it, he knew that she was more than likely correct. You did not want to know the real truth, father. Sarah's words echoed in his ears and for a terrible moment, Edward was certain he was going to faint, the information overwhelming him. Abraham was not the only one who was willfully blind. I should have seen it also. I should have protected her. How long has this been occurring? You must not lose control. Honora's voice brought him back to the present and he tried to focus his eyes on her, although there seemed to be a blurry aura around her body. He saw her lips moving and he forced himself to listen to the words carefully. We cannot simply wonder about making accusations without proof of his sin. She continued. That will be difficult to get. Particularly if you are in London. Edward murmured, unable to keep the bitterness from his voice. Honora caught it immediately. Are you concerned that you will not see me again if I am here and you are in Blessington? There was a wry, light lilt in her tone and Edward wondered if she was teasing him. I am not certain I know what to expect of you. He confessed. I feel that every time we grow close, something happens which keeps us apart. Is that fate in action or the work of you holding your distance between us? Honora seemed surprised, her dark green eyes dilating as she considered the question carefully. Do you truly believe that if we are meant to be together, anything will keep us apart? It was Edward's turn to be stunned, a small smile forming on his lips. He had not realized he had stepped closer to her. Suddenly the sensation of her breath against his chin created a prickle across his arms. I did not imagine you for the romantic variety. He told her softly and she chuckled. I did not realize I fell into one particular variety. I would say not. Edward agreed vehemently. Suddenly, Honora was on the tips of her toes, kissing his cheek softly before pulling away quickly. If you are asking me if I foresee a future together, I would say I see us somewhere at some time. Edward snorted but his face was still pink from the unexpected peck. He could feel the aftermath of her soft, supple lips against the scruff which had overtaken his cheekbones. He realized how he must look and he found himself slightly embarrassed. There had been no time for grooming or bathing in the wake of all that had happened, but Honora did not seem troubled by his appearance. It was not precisely the answer I was seeking. He replied. She nodded. I know. It was not the answer I was expecting to give. They stared at one another, light grins on their faces but hers faded away, the matter at hand overtaking her brush of affection. Sarah deserves justice for being so horribly violated. She whispered, hearing footfalls on the stairs. She will live in London, her past unknown and she can try to regain some semblance of a normal life. She is young enough to find a husband if she chooses. No one need know what has happened but you and I? She trailed off as her father appeared on the landing, his eyes narrowing as he noted the closeness between them. Honora stepped back but she did not need to finish her thought. Edward knew what was on her mind. If we can finally put the matter of Sarah to rest, bring Walter to justice and give her some inner peace, perhaps we can find our own also. William cleared his throat purposefully and glared at them both but when he spoke, it was only to his daughter. Nora, I would like a word with you. It was not a request and she nodded, stifling a grin as to not antagonize her father. Yes, Papa. She cast one last look at Edward before following her father down the stairs and out of earshot. Chapter 30 A Micron Knee Two months later They walked arm in arm through the square, Honora holding an umbrella to cover them both. They seemed to be the only ones out, the rain seeming to deter others from taking their constitutions that morning. Such ninnies. Sarah said teasingly as she looked about the empty streets. 
a bit of rain will drive them all indoors. More room for us to roam. Honora chuckled but her heart was not filled with joy, despite her attempts to show happiness. Sarah sensed it immediately and she turned her damp curls toward Honora. You have been melancholy as of late. Have I? You needn't deny it, Nora. I am your friend, and moreover, I have been living in close confines with you for two months. I had not realized the country house was so cramped. I must speak to Papa about that. No need for jesting, Nora. You know I am eternally grateful for all you and your father have done for me. I would never complain about the size of my accommodations. We are happy you are comfortable. Honora replied truthfully and patted her hand comfortingly. You are happy and yet you frown. Sarah insisted. Pray tell, what is on your mind? Honora gritted her teeth. She did not wish to say a word about what truly weighed on her mind and Sarah did not need bad news, not when she had progressed so well during her stay with the Burnies. William had recently embarked on another adventure, this time to the wilds of Africa where mail was unheard of. I haven't a clue how long I will be gone. William told his daughter. But it may be months. I implore you to keep the business afloat while I wander. Perhaps. He stopped speaking as if his own thoughts surprised him, but he eventually surged forth with the idea in his mind. Perhaps you will teach Miss Borthwick how to sell also. We could use the assistance. She seems to be very bright and sensible. Honora had been surprised by the characterization. She could not recall a time when her father had spoken about a woman in such a fashion. As William had suspected, Sarah had proved to be a quick study, relishing in the fabrics and exotic spices William had collected overseas. She had found her niche in London and as Honora had hoped, began to come out of the shell which had encased her for so long. She never brought up Walter's abuse to Sarah, but occasionally, the blonde girl would make mention of her uncle in a rather unflattering light, confirming what Honora had already suspected. Does your father know how he treated you? She asked once, careful not to pry with too much interest. He is my father's only brother. Sarah replied, her tone cooling as if she suspected the question was a trap. My father was more a father to him than an older sibling. What father wants to believe their child is a monster? In Blessington, Edward was having less luck proving such abuse existed although in the letters he sent to Honora, he did claim that Walter had picked up a rather sloppy drinking affection and had been arrested roughing up bawdy house workers on several occasions. Tis only a matter of time before the truth surfaces, Honora thought, but it seemed to be taking a long while, fueling her anger and impatience. You long to return to Blessington, do you not? Sarah pressed. Honora paused, mid-step and splashed into an unseen puddle, soaking them both. Whatever for? She fibbed. The business is here, my home. With Papa gone, I am hardly in a place to travel. Twas not what I asked. Sarah teased, and Honora turned her head away, knowing her blush was apparent. She gently pulled on Sarah's arm, encouraging them both along. You long to be with Edward. I do. The response came without hesitation. There was no use in fibbing. Sarah did truly know her better than anyone had in a long while and her feelings toward the Duke had not diminished in the least over the two months, even though she had not seen him once since his return to Blessington. You may go for a visit. Sarah told her. I am comfortable enough with the business. Honora gaped at her in shock and let out a short laugh, the brazenness and confidence of her words stunning. What would Papa say if he learned I left our house guest to tend to the business? I would never. Honora chuckled. Never leave me alone or never travel to see the man you love? Sarah. I do not know why you are being so stubborn about the issue. He adores you. I have known that from the start. You also care for him but you fight with yourself. Why? I do not fight. You fight now. Honora laughed in exasperation, wishing to change the subject quickly. Tis hardly the time for romance. When the time is right, we will know. 
is this because of my uncle? Again, Honora stopped, eyeing her with suspicion. What of your uncle, Sarah? I know you have uncovered the truth about him, Nora. I'm not a fool. Tis why you insisted I stay here and out of the house on Shady Knoll. Honora lowered her eyes, but she knew she had been caught. I thought you could use a fresh atmosphere. She squeaked weakly. Is London fresh? I dare say the air in Blessington is much purer. Sarah. What do you hope to gather from exploiting his misdeeds, Nora? It will only serve to hurt my father whom, I am certain, likely knows. I cannot imagine that any loving man would permit his own daughter to be harmed. Sarah shrugged and continued ahead, leaving Honora to catch up. He should be hanged for his crimes, Sarah, and he will be if you testify. I would like nothing better. She replied. But it will not happen without proof and that we do not have. It will simply be my word, the fallen woman, against the word of a baron's employee. I have no doubt how that will fare. You must accept that nothing will come of it. You and Edward will drive yourselves to Bedlam if you continue on this path. Honora bit on her lower lip, wondering if she was correct. Sarah was no fool, indeed. She had given her own justice much thought, certainly more than she and Edward had. Of course, she has. She likely thinks of it every night before she goes to sleep if she sleeps at all. Sarah was not finished. But if you continue to use this as a distraction from following your heart, I imagine you have bought yourself years. Honora was insulted by the implication that their quest for justice was merely a method to keep her from addressing Edward's affections. I resent your insinuation. She said shortly. You are mine and Edward's concern at the moment. That is a much more pressing issue. I am happy to hear you say that if the matter were resolved, you would pursue your union. We would. Sarah did not respond but a serene smile formed on her rose petal mouth and inexplicably, it gave Honora a shiver of fear. Why do I feel as if she is plotting something? Look. Sarah called happily. There is not a soul in the gazebo. The autumn rain continued for two days and it seemed to match Honora's mood as she sat at the writing desk, dipping the nib of the pen into the ink absently. Sarah's words had been playing in her mind with some frequency and she realized that the girl was right, her fear of committing was holding her back. How long can I expect Edward to wait for me? She wondered. He is a duke of great charm and appeal. I have never given him a proper answer about our future. Why would he wait? It seemed that she had spent two days attempting to pen a letter, explaining her feelings to him, but it was much more difficult than she had expected, and in the end, Honora merely sat, staring blankly at the pages as if she hoped the words would magically appear. If I were to see him, perhaps the words would flow more easily, she reasoned. When we are together, our connection speaks for us better than anything I could manage in correspondence. Honora lifted her head and sighed, watching as the sun fought weakly through the bearing alder branches and the afternoon faded away. It would be winter soon, the naked trees evidence of the season change. Honora sighed at the reminder. It would grow too cold to travel for long distances and they would remain in London until the thaw. Perhaps a visit to Blessington before the first frosts is in order? A movement in the distance caught her eye and she realized someone was approaching the property line. Sarah? Are you expecting company? She called out, her pulse quickening. They were far enough off the main road that she did not expect a lost carriage in their area. No. Is someone here? Sarah called back. Honora moved from her chair to meet Sarah in the hall and they exchanged a puzzled look. They made their way down the steps, the ruffles of their skirts in hand. At the door, they stood watching a now familiar coach approach and Honora's face erupted into a wide smile. Edward. Both women exclaimed, hurrying toward the coach and six as it stopped in a flurry of snorting horses. John Henry touched his hat in greeting as he moved to open the door for Edward. As the door opened, Honora could not stop herself from rushing toward him, the desire to throw herself into his arms almost insurmountable, but she abruptly stopped when she caught the stoic expression on his face. He did not seem pleased to see her. Edward, what are you doing here? 
she asked, her smile fading slightly as she studied his face. Is all well? He looked at her and then at Sarah who remained on the porch. Honora turned her head slightly and caught a strange smile on the girl's face, but she barely heeded it as she returned her attention back to Edward who had yet to say a word. Why did you not write and say you were coming? She demanded, reaching for his arm to usher him toward the house. Please, say something. We shall speak inside. He said, his eyes again darting toward Sarah. They moved up the steps and into the house as the sun began to set over the dappling trees. Your Grace, welcome. Rachel said, appearing in the foyer. Permit me to take your hat and coat. Honora untangled herself from his arm reluctantly and waited as he removed his outerwear. Some hot tea for his grace, Rachel. At once, Miss Burney. Rachel disappeared to oblige the request and the women waited expectantly for Edward to speak. Edward, it is clear you have come bearing bad news, so please, to get on with it. Sarah finally said when the Duke provided nothing for a silent moment. Is it my father? Has something happened? In part. Edward conceded. Honora's heart jumped into her throat. Tis all Sarah needs, more grim news. Is he ill? Sarah sighed. Injured? He is in jail. Oh, good lord, what has he done? Sarah demanded, but there was something about her question which suggested to Honora she already knew. Has he done something against you, Edward? When was the last time you corresponded with him, Sarah? The Duke asked, purposely avoiding the question, and Honora watched his face carefully, trying to understand why he would have ventured so far to deliver relatively dull news. My father? I believe I sent him a letter a fortnight past. Sarah replied. Edward sighed and looked at her pointedly. You told him what your uncle did to you. Did you not? Honora's back tightened and tensed, and she found it difficult to breathe. Perhaps. Sarah. Honora gasped. Why did you not tell me? It was none of your concern. What did father do? Beat him? Edward hung his head. Yes. Sarah let out a sharp laugh. Well. One beating will hardly make up for the years of abuse I endured at his hand. Edward shook his head. You are wrong. Sarah looked at him, fire in her eyes. Do not tell me you feel compassion for that cretin. For months you and Nora have sought justice for me. I merely moved matters along on with my own hand. I do not feel compassion for him. Edward assured her. Not in the least. What then? She demanded. Why are you looking at me with such disapproval? Edward cast on Nora another look and sighed deeply. Sarah, your father beat your uncle to death. Abraham is awaiting his hanging for the murder of Walter. Honora choked back a sob and stared at Sarah whose face turned ghastly white. Hanging? She echoed. How can he be hanged? Walter he dot he. She could not finish her sentence, the emotion overwhelming her. Instead, she turned and fled up the stairs and away from them, her choking cries following her as she ran. Honora gasped. You cannot let Abraham hang for this. Why was Sarah not called to trial? Abraham did not wish to have her relive her shame. He faults himself for what happened. He did not tell his true reasons for the crime. Edward, you are the Duke. Surely there is something you can do. Something you can say on his behalf. The Duke sighed heavily and shook his head. I have already tried. He confessed. The crime is one of revenge. Even if Sarah had testified before the court, they would have found him guilty. That is why I am here. I wanted to tell her before she learned about Walter's death from anyone else. Abraham is sentenced to hang the day after tomorrow and he has asked to see Sarah one last time. Honora turned around, a hand to her mouth as she stifled a cry of horror. 
she suddenly thought of Edward warning Abraham to check his unruly temper and of Sarah's secret smiles which had troubled Honora so much. Had she predicted her father would do something like this? Is that why she sent him the letter? In her mind's ear, she heard Sarah's voice echoing. You did not want to know the real truth, father. Honora wondered if Sarah did not blame her father as much as she did her uncle for all that had happened. No one could be that wicked and plot such a terrible demise for her only family. Could they? Chapter 32 The execution was scheduled for sundown and the temperature had dropped as Edward stood waiting among the crowd. His breaths escaped in short, streaming puffs of air and Honora stepped closer to him as if to seek his warmth through the heaviness of her dark cloak. Edward. She whispered and although the din was filling his ears as the people chanted for justice, the Duke heard her concern. Are you certain there is nothing you can do to end this madness? A pang of sadness touched his heart and he shook his head, closing the small space between them as the clamoring increased. Upon the stage, Abraham Borthwick was being led to his death, his face still uncovered as he stared into the crowd who hauntingly called out for justice. Murderer. Traitor. Cutthroat. On his other side, Sarah seemed to have floated away, her body in place but her eyes vacant as she watched the scene unfold. You need not witness this. Edward told her urgently. We will return to Briar Hill at once. To his surprise, she shook her loose curls, her eyes dull. He asked me to watch, to witness. He assures me that I am not to blame, that Walter was deserving of his demise. Edward cast on Nora a wary look, concerned that Sarah fell back into the near madness which had consumed her before, but Honora did not meet his gaze. She had been distinctly quiet since receiving word of the arrest and charge. Nora, you certainly need not observe. The Duke insisted, and she finally held his eyes. I will not leave you to endure this alone. If you are determined to see this through, I will not abandon your side. She replied softly. Edward felt his heart fill with gratitude at her words. She could sense his deep regret as if he was personally responsible for all which had occurred. Sarah had seen her father, per his request but whatever it was that was said between child and father would die with Abraham Borthwick. Abraham Borthwick. The executioner cried, shoving the bedraggled secretary forward. You are charged with the crime of fratricide in the death of your own brother. The horde hissed in disapproval and Edward kept his head up, knowing that aside from the display about them, he and Sarah would certainly be under scrutiny from the spectators. Let him hang. Someone screeched from the front. Sinner. Another howled. Sarah. Edward said urgently, a newfound determination strengthening his bones. You must not watch this. The Duke had certainly seen enough executions of his own to know that even without a personal relationship to the guilty, the display left a deep scar on those who watched. The mob was growing impatient, leering outwardly, laughing in some instances. Edward knew it was only a matter of time before someone threw a tomato and the screams began. Have you any final words on the matter? The guard demanded, looping the noose about his throat. Abraham shook his head quickly. I have made my peace with God. Then God shall judge you. Sarah. The urgency in Edward's voice increased but she waved him aside, a strange fascination filling her eyes as she observed. A peculiar feeling filled his gut and Honora nudged him softly, leaning forward to murmur something in his ear. Disturbing as it may seem, she must observe this. The merchant's daughter breathed. She will rest easier to know that her torment lies in the grave tonight. Edward looked at Honora in shock but before indignation could fill him, he realized that he understood Sarah and why she was unable to look away. Did I love my father? In my own way, I had little choice in the matter. He was all I had, despite his tyranny. Yet his death gave me some sense of reprieve also. Edward eyed Honora and nodded slowly, wondering once more how she had become so wise in her young age. I have made my peace with all who require it. Abraham rumbled. The people howled and jeered. As Edward had predicted, food flew to contact his face as the guards scowled. Enough. 
On with the execution. Sarah maintained her gaze on the stage, seemingly unable to tear her eyes away, but Honora could not bring herself to look. Her brown strands covered her face as she looked toward the Duke, eyes filled with regret as their gazes met. A roar of approval filled his ears, but Edward continued to stare at Honora as if her sad eyes gave him courage. "'Tis over now," she whispered. "'May he rest his weary soul. I wish to leave.' Sarah's voice interrupted the moment between them, and Edward turned to her, nodding curtly. He was inexplicably angry with her. She could have stopped the display, and yet, he knew it was unfair to blame the girl. She had been the worst victim in the sordid tale of abuse and horror. Sarah had not deserved the treatment she had received from the family who was accountable for her care and well-being. She could hardly be ridiculed for wanting the matter closed. Of course. Edward said, reaching for her arm as Honora took his other side and the trio fought through the crowd toward their coach. Not another word was exchanged until John Henry closed the door and the horses sped away from the center of town where the mob was still frenzied, and the dangling corpse of Abraham Borthwick hung lifelessly. You think I am without compassion? Sarah told him. Edward's brow furrowed. On the contrary. He replied, shooting Honora a strange look. I have known you since childhood, Sarah. You are kind and compassionate. I agree. Honora conceded. I am glad they are dead. The words wafted between them heavily, but Edward was not surprised. He had already suspected as much. Sarah, you have endured more than anyone should ever have to face in their lifetime. I have known soldiers who had experienced less trauma. Honora insisted. We will return to London and you will begin to heal. I will not return to London, Nora. Sarah, you haven't a home with the Cloverfields. Edward told her gently. You must be aware. She scoffed. I would not submit myself to living in that shack again, working for that pompous lord if he offered me triple the amount he paid my father. No, of course I have no interest in going there either. Edward nodded slowly, understanding. You will stay with me, then? Sarah smiled tiredly and shook her head. No. She said. I will find my own way now. You must not be upset, Nora, but your father has requested I work as his assistant in his upcoming travels. It was something he mentioned before he left for the wilds of Africa and I promised to consider it. Given the circumstances, I believe the change is imperative. Edward turned his head and caught the look of disbelief on Honora's face. It was clear the news came as a stunning blow, but she managed to keep her composure. Did he? Honora managed to choke. How wonderful. Sarah smiled and met her eyes earnestly. You must not fret on the matter. There is good reason for it and, I dare say, you will agree if you would cease being so stubborn. I am certain my father knows what he does. She agreed quickly. You will enjoy your time abroad. Nora, do look at me. Sarah implored, and Edward could see it took every fiber of her being to oblige. Honora knew it was not the place to show her displeasure. Edward tried to smile at her reassuringly but even he could tell that his expression did little to comfort her. William had forbidden her to travel, even after the death of Marjorie and instead, he had offered Sarah the opportunity. Edward did not need to be told how devastated Honora was by the news. Yet, he could not help feeling a spark of hope for himself, despite the shame which accompanied the feeling. I should not be elated over Honora's loss. Sarah leaned forward to clasp Honora's hand with one of her dark gloves and Edward with her other. Have you two not dismissed the obvious for long enough? She asked. What else do you wait for? Wait for? Edward repeated. You are making little sense. He moved to pull his hand back, but Sarah held it firmly in place. Edward, it is obvious to everyone from London to Blessington that you and Nora are smitten with one another. Why do you continue to avoid the inevitable? Sarah, you are processing your grief. Honora said sharply, yanking her hand back as if she had been burned. 
She clasped her hands across the brown of her skirt and shifted her head down, the lip of her black bonnet hiding her expression. Even so, Edward could see the red of her cheeks. You may continue to deny your feelings. Sarah told her, sitting back with a sigh. But all you do is waste time. Even your father can see how you feel for Edward. Sarah, you must not involve yourself in such matters, particularly not at a time like this. Edward mumbled but he could not resist casting on Nora a look through his peripheral vision. Her eyes also shot toward him but when she realized he was staring, she looked away. You will have no excuses. Sarah continued as if they had not spoken. You have used my endless plight as a reason to be apart but now, without me on which to focus your attention, who will you blame? Sarah. Love is rare. She continued as if he had not spoken. Why would you deny it when it stares at you so openly in the face? The carriage slowed and barely stopped as Sarah flew from the interior, leaving the Duke and Honora alone inside. John Henry appeared to help them out, but Edward waved him away. We will be along, John Henry. As you wish, Your Grace. The door closed, and Edward turned to Honora, struggling to find the words he had been practicing for months. The opportunity was then, as Sarah had ensured, despite the grimness of what they had witnessed, despite the darkness which seemed to have plagued them since their first meeting. Sarah speaks the truth. We will always find a reason to prolong speaking of the feelings we share for one another. Life is filled with horrors and sadness, but it is upon us to find the happiness and goodness among the bad. Nora, I, Edward, I they laughed as they spoke in unison. You may speak. Honora said, eyeing him through her peripheral vision. You know what I wish to say. He told her, turning his body fully to stare at her. You have known for a long while how I feel for you. She lifted her head and met his eyes. Have we been as foolish as she claims, using excuses to ignore what is right before us? He chuckled dryly. I dare say, it has been easier to distract ourselves with other people's problems than address the more complex matters of the heart. A smile formed slowly on Honora's lips and she nodded. Indeed. She agreed softly. But if we have learned anything these past months, tis that life is much too fleeting to reject beauty when we find it. Edward studied her face and nodded slowly. Nora, do you regret that your father has offered Sarah the opportunity to travel with him? She shook her head, her eyes shining. No. She replied. Papa wishes for me to be happy and he can plainly see that you provide me with all that I need. Edward felt his heart swell as he stared at her, sensing that she finally had cast aside her initial misgivings about marriage. I will always protect and care for you. He swore. I will never suppress your sense of independence. You have already proven that. She assured him, and they gazed at each other for a quiet moment. I would very much like to kiss you now. Edward told her softly, cautiously reaching up to brush her cheeks with his fingertips. I insist that you do. She murmured, drawing her face closer to his. When their lips met, Edward knew that while it had been a long time coming, he and Honora were precisely where they were meant to be, in each other's arms, never again to be parted. Epilogue The orchestra played a lively waltz and the guests milled about, growing more intoxicated with each sip of champagne. Honora was nearly blinded by the dazzling display of gems and fine colors which swept through Briar Hill as the evening light faded away. This is a smashing success. Benedict commented to Honora as she stood on the staircase, observing the men and women who had come to celebrate. Indeed. Honora murmured, a slight wrinkle on her nose. Is the lady displeased? Benedict asked, and she laughed, shaking her head. How could she be? She had married the man she adored, and the future of her father's business was secure in their union. Honora knew that for his part, Benedict was also elated with the nuptials although the need to save face in the duchy was no longer as pertinent as it had been when she had first arrived. On the contrary, she replied, I was merely thinking of the fickleness of the flock. 
A year ago, these very same people were turning up their noses at the mere mention of the Duke's name. Now, they savor his cheese and consume his wine as if the earthly supply runs dry. Benedict laughed also and shrugged. You will find, Your Grace, that where gossip is available, the people will flock. The same can be said of spirits. She chimed, and they laughed. You are a vision, Your Grace. Benedict told her quietly. The Duke is fortunate to have found such a worthy and lovely companion. Honora was touched by his tone. There was nothing but admiration as he bowed slightly. Thank you, Mr. Carter and I dare say that Miss Starling is a sight to behold. To her amusement, Benedict blushed and lowered his head. I confess that these wedding plans have me considering our future also. There may be another event in the coming months. Did I hear you correctly? Edward appeared behind them on the staircase, his face registering stunned surprise. He had changed from his wedding suit into a more comfortable waistcoat. Honora was overwhelmed by his handsomeness and she hurried to join him on the step above. That is dependent on what you believe you heard. Benedict answered, a sudden defensiveness overtaking him. I thought I heard you speak of an engagement to Clara Starling. We shall see. Benedict mumbled, and Edward laughed, giving Honora a teasing wink. I have not been married very long. The Duke announced. But I can highly recommend it thus far. Below, loud voices caught their attention and they turned to look as William and Lord Cloverfield began a quarrel. Oh, dear Lord. Honora mumbled. Papa has been into the schnapps. Permit me to deal with this. Allow me, my wife. Edward interrupted, sliding a hand along the back of her sashed waist as he slid by. I have long awaited the opportunity to put Cloverfield in his rightful place. He was on the base of the stairs before either Benedict or Honora could offer a protest. Oh dear. Honora muttered but Benedict shook his head. You need not worry about the Duke, Your Grace. You should know by now that he has more decorum than most. I do. She sighed. However, tis Papa who concerns me. There is little reasoning with him when he grows ape. As Edward neared the quarrelling duo, Sarah appeared quite suddenly, stepping between the two men with ease. Honora watched in fascination as she ignored Lord Cloverfield who seemed shocked to see her standing there. He stared at her as if she was an apparition, but Sarah placed her hands on William's chest and leaned in to speak distinctly into his ear. My word. Benedict muttered, echoing Honora's very thoughts. It was no secret that Sarah and her father spent a copious amount of time together, but Honora had seen so little of them since returning to Blessington. Their correspondences spoke of the business and household. It did not speak of this. Her eyes still fixated on her father and Sarah, Honora watched as William relaxed. Whatever she had said instantly disarmed him and he stepped back, smiling sheepishly. Edward, who was also watching the display, turned and caught Honora's gaze. Their shared look needed no words. What do you know of this? Honora asked, her pulse quickening. William held up his cup to toast Cloverfield and whatever their dispute, it was over as quickly as it began. Nothing. Benedict replied. Shall I see what I can learn? No. Edward had returned to them in a stealthy fashion and Honora gaped at him. No? She echoed. Are you not the least bit intrigued by that? Are they dot lovers? She almost choked on the word, but a wry grin formed on Edward's lips. And what if they are? He replied quietly, staring into her eyes. Do they not deserve the same happiness that we have found? Honora's eyes widened. I make no judgment. She insisted. I only need no. Have we not spent enough time wrapped up in the affairs of others? Edward asked softly. Our time is now. We will not get caught up in the comings and goings of Sarah or your father. Excuse me. Benedict muttered, moving away from them as if embarrassed to hear their intimate conversation. 
they barely noticed as he disappeared. How can you be so nonchalant? Honora asked, all filling her voice. It seemed remarkable that he did not seem the least bit concerned about what he had witnessed. Edward peered into her face and shook his head, a gentle beam on his face. Sometimes, when you have retired afore me, I steal into your bedchambers and I sit on the edge of your bed to stare at your face, precisely as I am doing now. Do you? She asked, a tingle rushing through her body. She had not realized he did such a thing. Why? To admire your beauty. He replied. To marvel at my good fortune. To thank God that I did not permit you to slip away, even though you were determined to do so. I was not determined. She protested, and his smile grew. Yet you know what I think of the most when I watch you sleep, your breast rising and falling as you dream hopefully of me? What do you think of? She asked, returning his warm expression, her body relaxing with his sweet words. I think of how much time we expended focusing on others and I regret that I was not more forceful with displaying my feelings toward you. Honora felt a stab of sadness as she nodded slowly. I think the same on occasion. She confessed. But we have our lives ahead of us to regain the time lost. I am ecstatic you agree. Which is why we will permit your father and Sarah to go about their lives however they see fit. If Sarah can find happiness after all she has endured, tis the best we can hope for, is it not? Honora nodded slowly as his words sunk into her heart. Yes. She agreed. Tis precisely what I would hope for her and for Papa. He, too, has suffered great loss in his life. It is not our place to interfere with how they live. Edward concluded, and Honora was sure she had never adored him more than in that moment. You speak the truth. She told him softly. Tis one of the many reasons you married me. Edward jested. Come along, my wife. Our guests demand our presence. Today and every day going forward are for us and only us. Honora took hold of his arm, her wedding gown sweeping against the steps as they descended once more as man and wife. Are you happy? The question was a whisper and Honora laughed, turning to look up at Edward. Of course. She replied. Do I not seem so? He stared at her perplexed. Pardon? It was then she realized it was not him who had posed the query and slowly, she turned to look about, her eyes stealing through the faces both familiar and unfamiliar. Nothing. She replied quickly but as she spoke, her gaze rested on the shadows along the walls. The ghosts of her past stood there, smiling warmly as they watched with pride. Marjorie nodding her wise, white head approvingly, the twinkle in her eye speaking volumes to her thoughts. At her side was a woman whom Honora would have known anywhere, her dark hair swept up in a glorious crown. Mama, she thought, her heart racing as tears filled her eyes. Mama, you are here. Lenora's mouth curved into a smile and as the new bride watched, the older Bernie women raised their hands to wave at her comfortingly before disappearing. Are you well, Honora? Edward asked, realizing that his wife had stopped in her place. You appear as if you have seen a ghost. Not a ghost. She whispered, swallowing the lump in her throat. Two ghosts. They are always here with me, guiding me with their strength. Have you had too much champagne? He asked, concern touching his face. Shall I put you in the study to lie down a while? On my wedding day? She scoffed teasingly, blinking away the tears. After the lecture you gave on seizing the time we share, I would think not. Are you crying, my love? Yes. She replied truthfully, a sheepish smile on her face. Why? Worry clouded his eyes as if he thought she might express regrets for their union. Because I have never been happier in my life than I am at this moment. She replied. Relief touched his expression and he patted her hand lovingly. I assure you, darling, the best is yet to come. The end? Extended epilogue. Two years later.
The heat from the flames was almost too hot but Edward dared not move back. He wanted to relish the warmth in its entirety before he retreated to the tent. It would not take long for the cold to seep back into his bones. He had learned that the previous night and if possible, the trek through the Russian mountains. This was not what I had in mind for a second honeymoon. He grumbled. There was a wave of laughter around the campfire and even the Duke could not resist grinning. He was not as miserable as he claimed to be, after all. No. Honora chuckled. What were you thinking? Italy perhaps. Edward replied, half-joking. I certainly was not anticipating the mounds of snow. We shall be at the marketplace by morning. William promised. Tis worth the trek, I assure you. If we survive it, Edward replied. He caught on Nora's eye and he could see she was rather enjoying the feel of the cold. My love, you have endured much worse than this. She reminded him. What of our journey to the Orient when you fell overboard? We feared you had been eaten by sharks if you recall. William and Sarah whooped at the memory as Edward playfully tossed a handful of snow in his wife's direction. You over-dramatize the event, he told her, embarrassment tinging his cheeks. It had been one of their first trips overseas and Edward had not known what to expect. Certainly, he had not realized that leaning too far over the side of the boat would lead him to the waters below when the vessel lurched suddenly. It remained Honora's favorite tale to regale, despite it having happened two years prior. Leave him be Nora, Sarah chided, snuggling closer to William who comfortingly wrapped his arm around her shoulders to warm her protectively. When we were children, he ripped his pants clear down to his breeches climbing a tree because he wished to be a pirate. Do you remember Edward? The Duke groaned as another round of laughter filled the night sky. My word! He muttered. If I had known that this excursion would have been such teasing, I would have stayed in Britain to mind the business. Oh, come now, darling! Honora insisted, sliding her blanket closer to him and resting her head on his shoulder to stare into his twinkling eyes. If you had done that, who would we mock relentlessly? Hear, hear. William agreed, raising his tin cup in a toast before downing a sloshing sip. Charmed. Edward sighed but he was not nearly as forlorn as he pretended to be. He enjoyed the family journeys to the exotic places which William and Honora knew so well. Edward was unable to join them as often as he would have liked, duchy affairs keeping him quite busy. Yet when he was able, the merchant included him freely, apparently joyous to have a son to share in his experiences. We should retire soon, Sarah said, adjusting the blanket about her shoulders. We have quite a trek on the morrow. Not yet. William held up his hand, casting the blonde a warm look which she returned sweetly. Edward felt himself stirred as he watched the unlikely pair, a feeling of happiness passing through him. Much had changed with Sarah in the past two years, all for the better. She had remained in London, living in the Burney home and tending to the merchant's business as he travelled. Edward had wondered if Honora would be consumed with resentment feeling replaced perhaps, but the women were as close as they had ever been, as if they were sisters from another life. Whatever romance had apparently blossomed between William and Sarah was kept respectable in the public eye. Yet Edward and Honora were close enough to recognize there was a relationship evolving between them. Does it bother you? Edward dared ask his wife once. Why should it? She replied. I have never seen Sarah so about her wits and papa, he smiles with ease. How could I possibly be troubled by such a thing? And the age? Love is ageless, Honora replied firmly. Do not tell me you feel it is odd. No, Edward replied. I feel precisely as you do. They seem to accept one another with grace. I wonder if they will announce their intentions to the world. Perhaps they are keeping their intentions to themselves, Honora replied. They do not need the approval of others to feel happiness. Edward was left wondering how he had ended up with the most sound-minded woman in all of England. We cannot retire yet. Honora echoed, pressing a heavily mitted hand to her mouth as if to stifle a yawn. 
I fear I can barely keep my eyes open, Papa. Please try for one more moment. William insisted, struggling to rise to his feet. He was a bear of a man under normal circumstances but cramped beneath the blankets and partially into his cups, moving seemed a grand chore. Edward managed to keep his smile hidden and he could see Honora was just as amused by the display. Raise your cups. William insisted, and they obliged although both their drinks were empty. What is it, Papa? Honora asked as if she sensed something important was to follow. Have you news? Indeed. William replied. Sarah and I have decided to marry. Edward heard his wife gasp and they gaped at the couple in unison. Have you? Edward demanded, stunned. I, why I? He looked helplessly at Honora who seemed equally shocked by the news but as quickly as the expression crossed her face, it disappeared and she, too, was on her feet. Oh, how wonderful! She squealed, running to hug Sarah. I am so happy for you both. Sarah appeared relieved and she cast Edward a look over Honora's shoulder as if she expected an outburst from him. Indeed. Edward called also rising and extending his hand to his father-in-law in congratulations. We wish you all the best. The newly betrothed couple accepted the warmth, and both appeared to relax in unison. You are not dismayed by this? Sarah asked nervously, her eyes fixated on Honora. You do not find this unsettling in the least. Are you happy? Honora asked quietly, and Sarah nodded, tears glimmering in her eyes. Happier than I have ever been, she whispered. William has shown me a kindness like no other. She looked sharply at Edward. I did not mean. I know what you meant, Sarah. Edward chuckled. Tis hardly the same kindness when you were in love. Why would I find your happiness unsettling in any way? Honora asked. She is a remarkable woman, my wife. I do owe Benedict a great deal for ensuring our introduction. If not for his hair-brained idea turned genius plan to invite William Burney into the duchy as an investment, I told you there would be no ill feelings, Sarah. William boomed, taking a sip of his drink. However, Honora interrupted, holding up her hand. Do not expect me to call you mother. All laughed, and Honora slid back toward her husband. We shall retire now and permit you to bask in your betrothal joy. Honora told them, gently tugging on Edward's arm. Indeed. Good night. He called. Congratulations. They trudged through the snow, their boots sinking into the white with definitive crunches until they found themselves before the entrance to their tent. Are you certain we cannot bring fire into the tent? Edward asked, looking longingly toward the warmth they had left behind. Not unless you deign to die terribly. Honora chuckled, sliding into the burlap structure. Hurry along and we will huddle together for heat. I do enjoy the sound of this. They sat in the dark, moving the covers about to ensure maximum coziness before sinking into each other's arms softly. How do you truly feel about Sarah marrying your father? As I said, she replied, sounding surprised by the question. Did I seem insincere? Not in the least. You did seem distracted, however. Did I? I imagine the news did quite take me aback at first, but I assure you, I could not be happier for them. Edward felt her shift slightly and he tried to make out the lines of her face in the darkness, attempting to gauge her expression. Have we not made a pact to concern ourselves less with the matters of others and more with our own? She asked. We have. He agreed. And duly noted. We shall only discuss ourselves, selfishly and without apology. Honora giggled. I, for one, believe that we are much more interesting than some others, do you not agree? Indeed, my love, I do. Moreover, our news is much more exciting than theirs. Edward was confused. Generally speaking, I would say so but tis difficult to outdo a wedding announcement, you must confess. Difficult, yes, but not impossible. 
Edward wondered if the cold left him less able to understand simple conversations but he did not comprehend what his wife spoke of. He said nothing but pulled her closer to him, savoring the feel of her frame against his. Despite the cold, a hazy sleepiness began to overcome him like a gently rolling fog off the coast and he sighed, closing his eyes. Anywhere with Honora was precisely where he wished to be. Edward. Yes, my love. I have news too. Have you? Her voice seemed far away as if she had floated away into dreamland without him and he was struggling to find her. Yes. Hmm. Higher, he seemed to float until Honora's next words sent him crashing back into the frozen tundra with a lightning jolt to his heart. You are going to be a father, Edward. He bolted up, the heat they had accumulated between them escaping into the frigid air but the rush of blood to his face more than spiced his blood. You are with child. He cried but Honora yanked him back down among their blankets, shushing him with laughter in her voice. You must keep your tones low. We cannot tell them when they have only just announced their engagement. I do not care. He hissed but he kept his words a whisper. His excitement was palpable, and he feared his head would explode with the realization. Oh, Honora. He murmured, pulling her into a hug of affection. You have made me the most joyful, blessed man in the world. I will be the best father to our child, our children, I swear it. Unbidden, an image of his own father and grandfather popped into his mind and he froze at the thought. You are not your father or his father. You have spent too many years attempting to escape their shadows but now you are free. You have proven that you are good and pure. You will be a good father, she replied softly. Just as you have always been a good husband, a good duke and a good man. Our son will be blessed to call you papa. Edward was grateful that the darkness hid his face because the emotion which flooded his heart filled his eyes with tears. I will make you proud, he promised, his voice hoarse as the words caught in his throat. You already have, my love. You already have. The End If you like our channel, please subscribe and make sure to click on the bell icon, so that you won't miss any future audiobooks we'll upload for free each week on YouTube.